Chapter 16 "'Ladies and gentlemen,' said Mr Hayes, who had been pushed, much against his will, before the curtain of the Theatre Royal Bristol to make the following statement. "'I am sorry to inform you that in consequence of indisposition, that is to say the accidental spraining of her ankle, Miss Leslie will not be able to appear to-night. Your kind indulgence is therefore requested for Miss Darcy, who has, on the shortest notice, consented to play the part of Sir Paulette. Hmm. "'Did you ever hear of anyone spraining an ankle on purpose?' asked the scene-shifter. "'Hush!' said the gasman. "'He'll hear you.' Amid murmurs of applause, Mr Hayes backed into the wings. "'Well, was it all right?' he asked Dick. Oh, "'Right, my boy, I should think it was. There was a touch of gladstone in your accidentally sprained ankle.' "'What do you mean?' said the discomfited acting manager. "'Oh, I haven't time to tell you now. Uh, now then, girls, are you ready?' he said, rushing on to the stage and hurriedly changing the places of the choristers. Putting his hand on a girl's shoulder, he moved her to the right or left as his taste dictated, and then, retiring abruptly, he cried, "'Now then, up you go!' And immediately after, thirty voices in one sonority sang, "'In Corneville's wide market places, "'sweet servant girls with rosy faces, "'wait here, wait here.' "'Now then, come on, you make your entrance from the top left.' "'Oh, I don't think I shall ever be able to do that run-in.' "'Don't begin to think about anything. "'If you don't like the run, I'll tell you how to do it,' said Dick, "'his face lighting up with a sudden inspiration. "'Do it with a cheeky swagger, walking very slowly, like this, "'and then, when you get a quarter of the way down the stage, "'stop for a moment and sing, "'Who speaks ill of Sir Paulette? Do you see?' "'Yes, yes, that'll suit me better. I understand.' Then, standing under the sloping wing, they both listened anxiously for the cue. "'She loves Grenichur. "'There's your cue. On you go. Give me a shawl.' The footlights dazzled her. A burst of applause rather frightened than reassured her, and a prey to a sort of dull dream, she sang her first lines. She was a little behind the beat. Montgomery brought down his stick furiously. The replique of the girls buffeted her ears like palms of hands, and it was not until she was halfway through the gossiping couplets and saw Montgomery's arm swing peacefully to and fro over the bent profiles of the musicians that she fairly recovered her presence of mind. Then came the little scene in which she runs away from her Uncle Gaspard and hides behind the bailey, and she dodged the old man with such sprightliness from one side of the stage to the other that a murmur of admiration floated over the pit, and arising in echoes was prolonged almost until she stepped down to the footlights to sing the legend of Sir Paulette. The quaintly tripping cadences of the tune, and the humour of the words, which demanded to be rather said than sung, were rendered to perfection. It was impossible not to like her when she said, I know not much of my relations, I never saw my mother's face, and of preceding generations I never found a single trace. I may have fallen from the sky, or blossomed in a rosebud sweet, but all I know is this, that I was found by Gaspard in his wheat. A smile of delight filled the theatre, and Kate felt the chilling sense of separation which exists between the public and a debutante being gradually filled in by a delicious but almost incomprehensible notion of contact, a sensation more delicate than the touch of a lover's breath on your face. This reached a climax when she sang the third verse, and had not etiquette forbade, she would have had an encore for it alone. I often think that perhaps I may the heiress to a kingdom be, but as I wore no clothes that day, I brought no papers out with me. These words, that had often seemed coarse in Leslie's mouth, in Kate's seemed adorably simple. 
So winning was the smile, and so coquettishly conscious did she seem of the compromising nature of the statement she was making, that the entire theatre was actuated by the impulse of one thought. Oh, what a little dear you must have been, lying in the wheat field! The personality of the actress disappeared in the rosy thighs and chubby arms of the foundling, and notwithstanding the length of the song, she had to sing it twice over. Then there was an exit for her, and she rushed into the wings. Several of the girls spoke to her, but it was impossible for her to reply to them. Everything swam in and out of sight like shapes in a mist, and she could only distinguish the burly form of her lover. He wrapped a shawl about her, and a murmur of amiable words followed her, and with her thoughts fizzing like champagne, she tried to listen to his praises. Then followed moments in which she anxiously waited for her cues. She was nervously afraid of missing her entrance, and she dreaded spoiling her success by some mistake. But it was not until the end of the act, when she stepped out of the crowd of servant girls to sing the famous coquetting song, that she reached the summit of her triumph. Kate was about the medium height, a shade over five feet five. When she swung her little dress as she strutted on the stage, she reminded you immediately of a pigeon. In her apparent thinness, from time to time was revealed a surprising plumpness. For instance, her bosom, in a walking dress no more than an indication, in a low body assumed the roundness of a bird's and the white lines of her falling shoulders floated in long undulations into the blue masses of her hair. The nervous sensibility of her profession had awakened her face, and now the brown eyes laughed with the spiritual maliciousness with which we willingly endow the features of a good fairy. The hips were womanly, the ankle was only a touch of stocking, and the whole house rose to a man, and roared when coquettishly lifting the skirt, she sang, Look at me here, look at me there, criticise me everywhere, from head to feet I am most sweet, and most perfect and complete. The audience, principally composed of sailors, men home from months of watery weariness, nights of toil and darkness, maddened by the irritating charm of the music and the delicious modernity of kate's figure and dress looked as if they were going to precipitate themselves from the galleries was she not the living reality of the figures posted over the hammocks in oil-smelling cabins the prototype of the short-skirted damsels that decorated the empty match-boxes which they preserved and gazed at under the light of the stars her success was enormous and she was forced to sing Look at me here five times before her friends would allow the piece to proceed. At the end of the act she received an ovation. Two reporters of the local newspapers obtained permission to come behind to see her. London engagements were spoken of, and in the general enthusiasm someone talked about grand opera. Even her fellow artists forgot their jealousies, and in the nervous excitement of the moment complimented her highly. Beaumont, anxious to kick down her rival, declared that, to say the least of it, was a better rendering of the part than Leslie's. And on hearing this, Brett, whose forte was not repartee, moved away. Mortimer, in his least artificial manner, said that it was not bad for a beginning and that she'd get on if she worked at it. Dubois strutted and spoke learnedly of how the part had been played in France and he was pleased to trace by an analysis which was difficult to follow a resemblance between kate and madame judic the second act went equally well and after seeing the ghosts she got a bouquet thrown to her so cheekily did she sing the refrain for a regiment of soldiers wouldn't make me afraid she had therefore now only to maintain her prestige to the end and when she had got her encore for the cider song, and had been recalled before the curtain at the end of the third act, with unstrung nerves she wandered to her dressing-room, thinking of what Dick would say when they got home. But the pleasures of the evening were not over yet. There was the supper, and as she came down from her dressing-room, she whispered to Montgomery in the wings that they hoped to see him at their place later on. He thanked her, 
and said he would be very glad to come in a little later on, but he had some music to copy now and must away. And feeling a little disappointed that he had to leave, she walked up and down the rough boards, stepping out of the way of the scene shifters. By your leave, ma'am, they cried, going by her with the long swinging wings. She was glad now that Montgomery had left her, for alone she could relive distinctly every moment of the performance. As the chorus girls crossed the stage, they stopped to compliment her with a few mechanical words and a hard smile. Kate thanked them, and returned to her dream all aglow and absorbed in remembrances of her success. The word success returned in her thoughts like the refrain of a song. Yes, she had succeeded. Wherever she went she would be admired. There was something to live for at last. The tea-light flared, and she stopped and began to wonder at the invention, so absurd did it seem. And then, feeling that such thoughts were a waste of time, she took up the thread of her memories, and had just begun to enjoy again a certain round of applause, when Beaumont and Dolly Goddard awoke her with the question, had she seen Dick? Kate tried to remember. A scene-shifter going by said that he had seen Mr. Lennox leave the theatre some twenty minutes ago. Oh, "'I suppose he'll come back for me,' Kate said. "'Or oh, perhaps I'd better go on. Are you coming my way?' Beaumont and Dolly said they were, and proposed they should pop into a pub before closing time. Kate hesitated to accept the invitation, but Beaumont insisted— and, as it was a question of drinking to the night's success, she consented to accompany them. Mm, "'No, not here,' said Beaumont, shoving the swing doors an inch or so apart. "'It's too full. I'll show you the way round by the side entrance.' And giggling, the girls slipped into the private apartment. "'What will you have, dear?' asked Beaumont in an apologetic whisper. "'I think I'll have a whisky. "'You'll have the same, Dolly?' Mm, "'Scotch or Irish?' asked the barman. The girls consulted a moment and decided in favour of Irish. With nods and glances, the health of Sir Paulette was drunk, and then, fearing to look as if she were sponging, Kate insisted on likewise standing treat. Fortunately, when the second round had been drunk, closing time was announced by the man in the shirt-sleeves, and bidding her friends good-bye, Kate stood in the street, trying to think if she ought to return to the theatre to look after Dick, or go home and find him there. She decided on the latter alternative, and walked slowly along the street. A chill wind blew up from the sea, and the sudden transition from the hot atmosphere of the bar brought the fumes of the whisky to her head, and she felt a little giddy. An idea of drunkenness suggested itself, it annoyed her, and repulsing it vehemently, her thoughts somewhat savagely fastened on to Dick as the culprit. Where had he gone? she asked, at first curiously, but at each repetition she put the question more sullenly to herself. If he had come back to fetch her, she wouldn't have been led into going into the public house with Beaumont. And, irritated that any shadow should have fallen on the happiness of the evening, she walked sturdily along, until a sudden turn brought her face to face with her lover. "'Oh,' he said, starting, "'is that you, Kate? I was just cutting back to the theatre to fetch you.' "'Yes, a nice time you've kept me waiting,' she answered. But as she spoke, she recognised the street they were in as the one in which Leslie lived. The blood rushed to her face, and tearing the while the paper fringe of her bouquet, she said, "'I know very well where you've been to. I want no telling. You've been round spending your time with Leslie.' "'Well,' said Dick, embarrassed by the directness with which she divined his errand, "'I don't see what harm there was in that. I really thought that I ought to run and see how she was.' Struck by the reasonableness of this answer, Kate for the moment remained silent, but a sudden remembrance forced the anger that was latent in her to her head, and facing him again she said, "'How dare you tell me such a lie! You know very well you went to see her because you like her, because you love her!' Dick looked at her, surprised. "'I assure you you're mistaken,' he said. 
but at that moment Brett passed them in the street, hurrying towards Leslie's. The meeting was an unfortunate one, and it sent a deeper pang of jealousy to Kate's heart. There, she said, haven't I proof of your baseness? What do you say to that? To what? Don't pretend innocence. Didn't you see Brett passing? You choose your time nicely to pay visits, just when he should be out. Oh, said Dick, surprised at the ingenuity of the deduction. I give you my word that such an idea never occurred to me. But before he could get any further with his explanation, Kate again cut him short, and in passionate words told him he was a monster and a villain. So taken aback was he by this sudden manifestation of temper on the part of one in whom he did not suspect its existence, that he stopped to assure himself that she was not joking. A glance sufficed to convince him, and making frequent little halts between the lamp-posts to argue the different points more definitely, they proceeded home quarrelling. But on arriving at the door, Kate experienced a moment of revolt that surprised herself. The palms of her hands itched, and consumed with a childish desire to scratch and beat this big man, she beat her little feet against the pavement. Dick fumbled at the lock. The delay still further irritated her, and it seemed impossible that she could enter the house that night. "'Aren't you coming in?' he said at last. "'No, not I. You go back to Miss Leslie. I'm sure she wants you to attend to her ankle.' This was too absurd, and Dick expostulated gently, but nothing he could say was of the slightest avail, and she refused to move from the doorstep. Then began a long argument, and in brief phrases, amid frequent interruptions, all sorts of things were discussed. The wind blew very cold. Kate did not seem to notice it, but Dick shivered in his fat and, noticing his trembling, she taunted him with it, and insultingly advised him to go to bed. Not knowing what answer to give to this, he walked into the sitting-room and sat down by the fire. How long would she remain on the doorstep, he asked himself humbly, until his reflections were interrupted by the sound of steps. It was Montgomery, and chuckling, Dick listened to him reasoning with Kate. The cold was so intense that the discussion could not be continued for long, and when the two friends entered, Dick was prepared for a reconciliation. But in this he was disappointed. She merely consented to sit in the armchair, glaring at her lover. Montgomery tried to argue with her, but he could scarcely succeed in getting her to answer him, and it was not until he began to question Dick on the reason of the quarrel that she consented to speak and then her utterances were rather passionate denials of her lover's statements than any distinct explanation. There were also long silences, during which she sat savagely picking at the paper of the bouquet, which she still retained. At last Montgomery, noticing the supper that no one cared to touch, said, "'Well, all I know is that it's very unfortunate you should have chosen this night of all others.' the night of her success, to have a row. I expected a pleasant evening. Success indeed, said Kate, starting to her feet. Was it for such a success as this that he took me away from my home? Oh, what a fool I was! Success! A lot I care for the success when he's been spending the evening with Leslie and, unable to contain herself any longer, she tore a handful of flowers out of her bouquet and threw them in Dick's face. Handful succeeded handful, each being accompanied by a shower of vehement words. The two men waited in wonderment, and when passionate reproaches and spring flowers were alike exhausted, a flood of tears and a rush into the next room ended the scene. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 As soon as it was announced that Miss Leslie suffered so much with her ankle that she would be unable to travel, the whole company called to see the poor invalid. The chorus left their names, the principals went up to sit by the sofa side, and all brought her something. Beaumont, a basket of fruit, Dolly Goddard, a bouquet of flowers, Dubois, an interesting novel, 
Mortimer a fresh stock of anecdotes. Around her sofa, sprains were discussed. Dubois had known a premier danseuse at the Opera House in Paris, but the handing round of cigarettes prevented his story from being heard, and Beaumont related instead how Lord Shoreham, in youth, had broken his legs out hunting. The relation might not have come to an end that evening if Leslie had not asked Brett to change her position on the sofa, and when he and Dick went out of the room, a look of inquiry was passed round. Oh, you needn't be uneasy. I wouldn't let Brett stop for anything. I shall be very comfortable here. My landlady is as kind as she can be, and the rooms are very nice. A murmur of approval followed these words, and continuing, Miss Leslie said, laying her hand on Kate's, And my friend here will play my parts until I come back. You must begin tonight, my dear, and try to work up Claret. If you're a quick study, you may be able to play it on Wednesday night. This was too much. The tears stood in Kate's eyes. She had in her pocket a little gold porte bonheur which she had bought that morning to make a present of to her once hated rival. But she waited until they were alone to slip it on the good-natured prima donna's wrist. The parting between the two women was very touching, and being in a melting mood, Kate made a full confession of her quarrel with Dick, and abandoning herself, she sought for consolation. Leslie smiled curiously, and after a long pause said, "'I know what you mean, dear. I've been jealous myself. But you'll get over it and learn to take things easily, as I do. Men aren't worth it.' The last phrase seemed to have slipped from her inadvertently, and seeing how she had shocked Kate, she hastened to add, oh, "'Dick is a very good fellow, and will look after you. But take my advice. Avoid a row. We women don't gain anything by it.' The words dwelt long in Kate's mind, but she found it hard to keep her temper. Her temper surprised even herself. It seemed to be giving way, and she trembled with rage at things that before wouldn't have stirred an unquiet thought in her mind. Remembrances of the passions that used to convulse her when a child returned to her. As is generally the case, there was right on both sides. Her life, it must be confessed, was woven about with temptations. Dick's character easily engendered suspicion, and when the study of the part of Clarette was over, the iron of distrust began again to force its way into her heart. The slightest thing sufficed to arouse her. On one occasion, when travelling from Bath to Wolverhampton, she couldn't help thinking, judging from the expression of the girl's face, that Dick was squeezing Dolly's foot under the rug. Without a word, she moved to the other end of the carriage and remained looking out of the window for the rest of the journey. Another time she was seized with a fit of mad rage at seeing Dick dancing with Beaumont at the end of the second act of Madame Angot. There were floods of tears and a distinct refusal to dress with that woman. Dick was in despair. What could he do? There was no spare room, and unless she went to dress with the chorus he didn't know what she'd do. My God, he exclaimed to Mortimer as he rushed across the stage after the damned property man, never have your woman playing in the same theatre as yourself. It's awful. For the last couple of weeks, everything he did seemed to be wrong. Success, instead of satisfying Kate, seemed to render her more irritable, and instead of contenting herself with the plaudits that were nightly showered upon her, her constant occupation was to find out either where Dick was, or what he had been doing or saying. If he went up to make a change without telling her, she would invent some excuse for sending to inquire after him. If he were giving some directions to the girls at one of the top entrances, she would walk from the wing where she was waiting for her cue to ask him what he was saying. This watchfulness caused a great deal of merriment in the theatre, and in the dressing-rooms Mortimer's imitation of the catechism the manager was put to at night was considered very amusing. "'My dear, I assure you you're mistaken. I only smoked two cigarettes after lunch, and then I had a glass of beer. I swear I'm concealing nothing from you.' And this is scarcely a parody of the strict surveillance under which Dick lived— 
but from a mixture of lassitude and good nature it didn't seem to annoy him too much and he appeared to be most troubled when kate murmured that she was tired that she hated the profession and would like to go and live in the country for now she complained of fatigue and weariness the society of those who formed her life no longer interested her and she took violent and unreasoning antipathies it was not infrequent for mortimer and montgomery to make an arrangement to grub with the lennoxes whenever a landlady could be discovered who would undertake so much cooking but without being able to explain why kate declared she could not abide sitting face to face with the heavy lead she saw and heard quite enough of him at the theatre without being bothered by him in the daytime dick made no objection he confessed and willingly that he was a bit tired of disconnected remarks and the wit of irrelevances and mortimer he said fell to sulking if you didn't laugh at his jokes montgomery continued to board with them the young man very uncertain always whether he would be as unhappy away from her as he was with her he often dreamed of sending in his resignation but he couldn't leave the company having begun to look upon himself as her guardian angel and without consulting dick they arranged deftly that dubois should be asked to take mortimer's place dick approved when the project was unfolded to him the natty appearance of the little foreigner was a welcome change after mortimer's draggled show of genius he could do everything better than anybody else but that didn't matter for he was amusing in his relations whether you spoke of balzac's position in modern fiction or the rolling of cigarettes you were certain to be interrupted with i assure you my dear fellow you're mistaken uttered in a stentorian voice on the subject of his bass voice a child could draw him out and under the pretext of instituting a comparison between him and one of the bass choristers montgomery never failed to induce him to give the company an idea of his register at first to see the little man settling the double chin into his chest in his efforts to get at the low d used to convulse kate with laughter but after a time even this grew monotonous and wearily she begged montgomery to leave him alone nothing seems to amuse you now he would say with a mingled look of affection and regret a shrug of the shoulder she considered a sufficient answer for him and she would sink back as if pursuing to its furthest consequences the train of some far-reaching ideas and in wonder these men watched the progress of kate's malady without ever suspecting what was really the matter with her she was homesick but not for the house in hanley and the dressmaking of yore she had come to look upon hanley ralph mrs ede the apprentices and hender as a bygone dream to which she couldn't return and didn't wish to return her homesickness was not to go back to the point from which she had started but to settle down in a house for a while oh, not for long dick she said a month even a fortnight would make all the difference we spent a fortnight at blackpool but we've never stayed a fortnight at the same place since i know what's the matter with you kate he answered you want a holiday so do i we all want a holiday one of these days we shall get one when the tour comes to an end it did not seem to kate that the tour would ever come to an end she would always be going round like a wheel dick begged her to have patience and she resolved to have patience but one saturday night in the middle of her packing the vision of the long railway journey that awaited her on the morrow rose up suddenly in her mind and she could not do else than spring to her feet and standing over the half-filled trunk she said dick i cannot i cannot don't ask me ask you what he said to go to bath with you to-morrow morning she answered you won't come to bath he cried but who will play claret i will of course i don't understand kate dick replied i only want one day off 
why shouldn't i spend the sunday in leamington and go to church i want a little rest i can't help it dick well i never you seem to get more and more capricious every day then you won't let me said kate with a flush flowing through her olive cheeks won't let you why shouldn't you stay if it pleases you dear montgomery is staying too he wants to see an aunt of his who lives in the town dick's unaffected kindness so touched kate's sensibilities that the tears welled up into her eyes and she flung herself into his arms sobbing hysterically for the moment she was very happy and she looked into the dream of the long day she was going to spend with montgomery afraid lest some untoward incident might rob her of her happiness but nothing fell out to blot her hopes everything seemed to be happening just as she had foreseen it and trembling with pleasurable excitement the twain hurried through the town inquiring out the way to the wesleyan church at last it was found in a distant suburb and her emotion almost from the moment she entered into the peace of the building became so uncontrollable that to hide the tears upon her cheeks she was forced to bury her face in her hands and in the soft snoring of the organ recollections of her life frothed up but as the psalm proceeded her excitement abated until at last it subsided into a state of languid ecstasy nor was it till the congregation knelt down with one accord for the extempore prayer that she asked pardon for her sins oh, but how could god forgive her her sins if she persevered in them she asked herself how could she leave dick and return to hanley her husband wouldn't receive her her life had got into a tangle and might never get straight again but all is in the hands of god and thinking of the woman that had been and the woman that was she prayed god to consider her mercifully god will understand she said how it all came about i cannot montgomery was kneeling in the pew beside her and he wondered at seeing her so absorbed in prayer he didn't know that she was so pious and thought that such piety as hers was not in accord with the life she had taken up and the company with which they were touring but perhaps it was a mere passing emotion a sudden recrudescence of her past life which would fade away and never return again he hoped that this was the case for he believed in her talent and that a london success awaited her he kept his eyes averted from her knowing that his observation would distress her and after church she said she would like to go for a walk and he suggested the river in the shade of spreading trees they watched the boats passing and in the course of the afternoon talked of many things and of many people and it pleased and surprised them to find that their ideas coincided and in the pauses of the conversation they wondered why they had never spoken to each other like this before he was often tempted to hold out prospects of a london success with a view to cheering her but he felt that this was not the moment to do so but she being a little less tactful spoke to him of his music with a view to pleasing him but he couldn't detach his thoughts from her and could only tell her that he heard her voice in the music as he composed it the afternoon is passing he said it's time to begin thinking of tea whereupon they rose to their feet and walked a long way into the country in search of an inn and finding one they had tea in a garden and afterwards they dined in a sanded parlour and enjoyed the cold beef although they could not disguise from themselves the fact that it was a little tough but what matter the food it was the close intimacy and atmosphere of the day that mattered to them and they returned to leamington thinking of the day that had gone by a day unique in their experience one that might never return to them the ways were filled with sunday strollers mothers leading a tired child moved steadily forward a drunken man staggered over a heap of stones sweethearts chased each other occasionally a girl kissed from behind as she stretched to reach a honeysuckle rent the airless evening with a scream kate had not spoken for a long while and montgomery's apprehensions were awakened of what could she be thinking something was on her mind he said to himself 
something's been on her mind all day he continued and he began to ask himself if he should put his arm around her and beg of her to confide in him he would have done so if the striking of a clock had not reminded him that they had little time before them if they wished to catch the train so instead of asking her to confide in him he asked her to try to walk a little faster she was tired he offered her his arm we just time to get to the station and no more it's lucky we have our tickets the guard on the platform begged them to hasten and to get in anywhere they could a moment afterwards they jumped into the carriage and the train rolled with a slight oscillating motion out of the station into the open country dim masses of trees interrupted by spires and roofs were painted upon a huge orange sky that somehow reminded them of an opera bouffe what are you crying for montgomery asked bending forward oh i don't know nothing exclaimed kate sobbing oh, but i'm very unhappy i know i've been very wicked and i'm sure to be punished for it nonsense nonsense god'll punish me and i know he will i felt it all day to-day in church i'm done for i'm done for you've made a success on the stage i never saw any one get on so well in so short a time and you're loved he added with a certain bitterness as much as any woman could be <laughs> that's what you think but i know better i see him flirting every day with different girls you imagine those things dick couldn't speak roughly to any one if he tried but he doesn't care for any woman but you oh, of course you say so you're his friend i assure you upon my word of honour i wouldn't tell you so if it weren't true you're my friend as much as he aren't you and then as if afraid that she should read his thoughts he added i'm sure he hasn't kissed any one since he knew you i can't put it plainer than that can i well, i'm glad to hear you say so i don't think you'd tell me a lie it'd be too cruel wouldn't it for you know what a position i'm in if dick were to desert me to-morrow what should i do you're in a mournful humour why should dick desert you and even if he did i don't see that it would be such an awful fate startled kate raised her eyes suddenly and looked him straight in the face what do you mean she said the abruptness of her question made him hesitate in a swift instant he regretted having risked himself so far and reproached himself for being false to his friend but the temptation was irresistible and overcome by the tenderness of the day and irritated by the memory of years of vain longing he said even if he did desert you you might or you would find somebody better somebody who'd marry you kate did not answer and they sat listening to the rattle of the train at last she said i could never marry any one but dick oh why do you love him so much oh yes i love him better than anything in the world but even if i didn't there are reasons which would prevent my marrying any one but him what reasons a desire that some one should know of her troubles smothered all other considerations and after another attempt to speak she again dropped into silence montgomery tried to rouse her tell me he said tell me why you couldn't marry any one but dick the sound of his voice startled her and then in a moment of sudden naturalness she answered because i'm in the family way then there's nothing else for him to do but to marry you she knew he was at that moment his own proper executioner but the intensity of her own feelings didn't leave her time for pity why after all shouldn't she marry dick why hadn't she asked for this reparation before i dare say you're right she said when i tell him what haven't you told him yet montgomery cried no kate answered timidly i was afraid he wouldn't care to hear it then you must do so at once montgomery said and the poor vagrant musician whom nobody had ever loved said i will speak to him about it the first time i get a chance it would be wicked of him not to 
he couldn't refuse even if he didn't love you which he does the last streak of yellow had died out of the sky telling of the day that had gone by and in a deep tranquillity of mind kate inhaled the sweetness of her luck as a convalescent might a bunch of freshly culled violets end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen it never rains but it pours she was called before the curtain after every act in madame angot and les cloches de conville and dick told her that she would cut out all the london prima donnas giving them the go-by and establish herself one of the great metropolitan favourites if he could get a new work over from france why a new work she asked and he told her that to draw the attention of the critics and the public upon her she must appear in a new title role and sitting in his armchair when they came home from the theatre at night he brooded many projects the principal one of which was to obtain a new work from france but which of the three illustrious composers herve offenbach and le Croc, should he choose to write the music the book of words would have to be written before the music was composed and so far as he knew the only french composer who could set english words was herve it seemed to kate that he would never cease to draw forth a cigarette case or to cross and uncross his legs did this man never wish to go to bed she hated stopping up after one o'clock in the morning but anxious to be a serviceable companion to him on all occasions she strove against her sleepiness and listened to him while he considered whether her voice was heard to most advantage in offenbach or in herve she had not yet played the grande duchesse and there were parts in that opera that would suit her very well he would like to see her in la belle Hélène and the princess of trebizond but the last-named opera was never a success in england and he was not certain about the power of la perichole to draw audiences in the provinces it was pleasant to kate to hear her talent discussed and analysed set forth in the works of great men but her thought had now turned from her artistic career to her domestic she wanted to be married it had always been vaguely understood that they were to be married that is to say it had been taken for granted that when a fitting occasion presented itself they would render their cohabitation legal this understanding had satisfied her till now in the first months in the first year after the escape from hanley her happiness had been so great that she had not had a thought of pressing matters further she had feared to do anything lest she might destroy her happiness by doing so and dick who let everything slide until necessity forced him to take steps had not troubled himself about his marriage although quite convinced that he would end by marrying kate he had treated his marriage exactly as he did his theatrical speculations there is no hurry he answered her and proposed that they should be married in london but why in london he spoke of his relations and his friends he would like kate to know his old mother oh but dick dear why not at once we're living in a life of sin and at times the thought of the sin makes me miserable out of his animal repose dick smiled at the religious argument and being on the watch always for a sneer the blood rushed to her face instantly and she exclaimed if you did seduce me if you did drag me away from my peaceful home if you did make a travelling actress of me you might at least refrain from insulting my religion dick looked up surprised kate had put down her knife and fork and was pouring herself out a large glass of sherry she was evidently going to work herself up into one of her rages i assure you my dear i never intended to insult your religion and i wish you wouldn't drink all that wine it only excites you excites me what does it matter to you if i excite myself or not my dear kate this is very foolish of you i don't see why if you'll only listen to reason listen to reason she said spilling the sherry over the table oh it would have been better if i'd never listened to you you really mustn't drink any more wine i can't allow it 
said Dick, passing his arm across her and trying to take away the decanter. This was the climax, and her pretty face curiously twisted, she screamed as she struggled away from him. "'Leave me go, will you? Leave me go! Oh, I hate you!' Then, clenching her teeth and more savagely, "'No, I'll not be touched! No, 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 I will not!' Dick was so astonished at this burst of passion that he loosed for a moment the arms he was holding, and profiting by the opportunity, Kate seized him by the frizzly hair with one hand and dragged the nails of the other down his face. At this moment Montgomery entered. He stood aghast, and Kate, whose anger had now expended itself, burst into a violent fit of weeping. "'What does this mean?' Montgomery said, speaking very slowly. Neither answered. The man sought for words, the woman walked about the room swinging herself, and as she passed before him Montgomery stopped her and begged for an explanation. She gave him a swift look of grief, and breaking away from him shut herself in the bedroom. "'What does this mean?' Dick looked round vaguely, astonished at the authoritative way the question was put, but without inquiring he answered, "'That's what I want to know. I never saw anything like it in my life.' We were speaking of being married, when suddenly Kate accused me of insulting her religion, and then, well, I don't remember any more. She fell into such a passion. Well, you saw it yourself. Did you say you wouldn't marry her? No, on the contrary. I can't make it out. For the last month her caprices, fancies and jealousies have been something awful. Montgomery made a movement as if he were going to reply, but, checking himself, he remained silent. His face then assumed the settled appearance of one who is inwardly examining the different sides of a complex question. At last, he said, "'Let's come out for a walk, Dick, and we'll talk the matter over.' "'Do you think I can leave her?' "'It's the best thing you can do. Leave her to have her cry out.' And adopting the suggestion, Dick picked up his hat, and without further words the men went out of the house, walking slowly, arm in arm. "'I cannot understand what is the matter with Kate. When I knew her first, she hadn't a bad temper.' To this Montgomery made no answer. He was thinking. After a pause, Dick continued, as if speaking to himself. "'And the way she does badger me with her confounded jealousies. I'm afraid now to tell a girl to move higher up on the stage. There are explanations about everything, and I can't think what it's all about. She has everything she requires. She hasn't been a year on the stage, and she's playing leading parts, and scoring successes too. Perhaps she has reasons you don't know of. Reasons I don't know of? What do you mean? Well, you haven't told me yet what the row was about. Tell you? <laughs> That's just what I want to know myself. What were you speaking about when it began? asked Montgomery, who was still feeling his way. About our marriage. Well, what did you say? What did I say? Oh, I really don't remember. The row has put it all out of my head. Let me think. I was saying, I mean, she was asking me when we should be married. And what did you say to that? Did you fix a day? Fix a day? said Dick, looking in astonishment at his friend. How could I fix a day? I think if I loved a woman and she loved me, I could manage somehow to fix a day. These words were spoken with an earnestness that attracted Dick's attention, and he looked inquiringly at the young man. "'So you think I ought to marry her?' "'Think you ought to marry her?' exclaimed Montgomery indignantly. "'Really, Dick, I didn't think you were... Just remember what she's given up for you. You owe it to her. Good heavens!' "'Well, you needn't get into a passion.' I've had enough of passions for one day. The impetuousness of the youth had struck through the fat nonchalance of the man, and he said after a pause, Yes, I suppose I do owe it to her. 
the apologetic easy-going air with which this phrase was spoken maddened montgomery he could have struck his friend full in the face but for the sake of the woman he was obliged to keep his temper putting aside the question of what you owe and what you don't owe i'd like to ask you where you could find a nicer wife she's the prettiest woman in the company she's making now five pounds a week and she loves you as well as ever a woman loved a man i should like to know what more you want this was very agreeable to hear and after a moment's reflection dick said that's quite true my boy and i like her better than any other woman i don't think i could get anything better if it weren't for that infernal jealousy of hers really her temper is no joke her temper is all right she was as quiet as a mouse when you knew her first take my word for it there are excellent reasons for her being a bit put out what do you mean oh can't you guess the two men stopped and looked each other full in the face and then resuming his walk montgomery said yes it's so she told me in the train coming up from leamington tears glittered in dick's eyes and he became in that moment all pity kindness and good nature oh the poor dear why didn't she tell me that before oh and i'd scolded her for ill temper his humanity was as large as his fat and although he had never thought of the joys of paternity now in the warmth of his sentiments he melted into one feeling of rapture after a pause he said i think i'd better go back and see her yes i think you'd better fix a day for your marriage oh of course nothing further was said each absorbed in different thoughts the two men retraced their steps and when they arrived at the door montgomery said i think i'd better wish you good-bye oh no come in old man she'd like to see you and as if anxious to torture himself to the last montgomery entered kate was still locked in the bedroom but there was such an unmistakable accent of trepidation and anxiety in dick's fingers and voice that she opened immediately her beautiful black hair was undone and fell in rich masses about her dick took her in his arms and held her sobbing on his shoulder all he could say was oh my darling i'm so sorry you will forgive me won't you End of ch chapter nineteen well what are you going to give her do you see anything you like here do you think the paper cutter would do oh you can't give anything more suitable ma'am then there are these card cases nobody could fail to like them what are you going to give annie oh i'm going to give her the pair of earrings we saw yesterday but if i were you i wouldn't spend more than half a sovereign it's quite enough i should think so indeed a third of a week's screw whispered dolly but she ain't a bad one and dick will like it and may give me a line or so in olivet how do you think she'll do in the part oh, we'll talk about that another time are you going to buy the paper cutter casting her eyes in despair around the walls of the fancy goods shop to see if she could find anything she liked better dolly decided in favour of the paper cutter and paid the money after a feeble attempt at bargaining in the street they saw mortimer who had now allowed his hair to grow in long snake-like curls completely over his shoulders oh for goodness sake come away cried beaumont i do hate speaking to him in the street everybody stares so the girls turned to fly but the heavy lead was upon them and in his most nasal tones said well my dear young ladies engaged in the charming occupation of buying nuptial gifts oh how very sharp you are mr mortimer answered dolly in her pertest manner and what are you going to give we should so much like to know after a moment's hesitation he said throwing up his chin after the manner of a model sitting for a head of christ my dear young lady you must not exhibit your curiosity in that way it's not modest oh but do tell us mr mortimer you're a person of such good taste 
The comic tragedian considered for a moment what he could say most ill-natured, and so get himself out of his difficulty. "'I tell you, young lady, I am not decided, but I think that a copy of Wesley's hymns bound up with the book of the Grand Duchess might not be inappropriate.' "'Oh, but how do you think she'll play the Countess?' asked Beaumont. "'Oh, we mustn't speak of that now she's going to be married.' And thinking he could not better this last remark, Mortimer bade the ladies good-bye, and went off with curls and coat-tails alike swinging in the breeze. Farther up the street, Beaumont and Dolly were joined by Leslie, Brett and Dubois, and the same topics were again discussed. "'What are you going to give? Have you bought your present? Have you seen mine? Do you know who's going to be at the wedding breakfast? They can't ask more than a dozen or so. Have you heard that the chorus have clubbed together to buy Dick a chain? It's very good of them, but they'll feel hurt at not being asked to the breakfast. What will the Lennoxes do?' These and a hundred other questions of a similar sort had been asked in the dressing-rooms, in the wings, in the streets, at every available moment, since Morton and Cox's Opera Bouffe Company had arrived in Liverpool. Everybody professed to consider the event the happiest and most fortunate that could have happened, but Mortimer's words, "'There's many a slip between the ring and the finger,' recurred to them whenever the conversation came to a pause, and they hoped the marriage might yet be averted, even when they stood one bright summer morning assembled on the stage, awaiting the arrival of bride and bridegroom. The name of the church had been kept a secret, and all that was known was that Leslie, who had joined another company in Liverpool, Brett, Montgomery and Beaumont, had gone to attend as witnesses, and that they would be back at the theatre at twelve to run through the third act of Olivet before producing it that night. Many false alarms were given, but when at last the bridal party walked from the wings on to the stage, Dick's appearance provoked a little good-natured laughter. So respectable did he look, in a spick-and-span new frock-coat and his tall hat. Kate never looked prettier. Mortimer said her own husband wouldn't know her. She wore a dark green silk pleated down the front, from underneath which a patent leather boot peeped as she walked. A short jacket showed the drawing of her shoulders, the delicacy of her waist, and the graceful fall of the hips. She carried in her hand a bouquet of yellow and pink roses, a present from Montgomery. "'Now, ladies and gentlemen, I won't detain you long, but do let us run through the third act, so as to have it right for the night. Montgomery, will you oblige me by playing over the sailor chorus?' Dick took the girls in sections and placed them in the positions he desired them to hold. "'Now then, enter the Countess. Uh, who's in love with the Countess?' "'Well, if you don't know, I don't know who does,' said Mortimer. "'I hear you've been swearing all the morning till death us do part.' A good deal of laughter greeted this pleasantry, and Dick himself could not refrain from joining in. At last he said, now, Kate, dear, do leave off laughing and run through your song. Oh, I can't, I can't. You're too funny. <laughs> oh, we shall never get through this act, said Dick, who had just caught Miss Leslie walking off with Brett into the green room. Now, Miss Leslie, can't you wait until this rehearsal is over? Oh, they'll be late for church today. They may as well wait. Another roar of laughter followed this remark, and Kate said, "'You'd better give it up, Dick, dear. It'll be all right at night. I assure you I shall be perfect in my music and words.' "'I must go through the act. The principals are responsible for themselves, but I must look to the chorus. Where's that damn property master?' On the subject of rehearsals, Dick was always firm and seeing that it could not be shirked, the chorus pulled themselves together, and the act was run through somehow. Then a few more invitations were whispered in the corners on the sly, and the party, in couples and groups, repaired to the Lennox's lodgings. Mortimer, Beaumont, Dick and Kate walked together, talking of the night show. Dubois crushed his bishop's hat over his eyes, straddled his ostler-like legs, and discussed Wagner's position in music with Montgomery and Dolly Goddard. 
a baronet's grandson a chorus singer told how his ancestor had won the goodwood cup half a century ago to three ladies in the same position in the theatre as himself brett and leslie followed very slowly apparently more than ever enchanted with each other for the wedding breakfast the obliging landlady had given up her own rooms on the ground floor the table extended from the fireplace to the cabinet the panels of which mortimer was respectfully requested not to break when he was invited to take the foot of the table and help the cold salmon the bride and bridegroom took the head and the soup was placed before them for this was not as dick explained a breakfast served by gunter but a dinner suitable to people who had been engaged for some time back at this joke no one knew if they should laugh or not and mortimer slyly attracted the attention of the company to brett and leslie who were examining the cake then all spoke at once of the presents they were of all sorts and had come from different parts of the country mr cox had given a large diamond ring leslie had presented kate with a handsome inkstand brett had bought her a small gold bracelet dubois whose fancies were light offered a fan beaumont a pair of earrings hayes a cigarette case dolly goddard a paper knife montgomery a brooch which must have cost him at least a month's salary mortimer exclaimed that his wife had been behaving rather badly lately and that in consequence he had been unable to obtain from her what he had not been able to obtain dick did not stop to listen to at that moment the gold chain the present from the chorus caught his eye the kindness of the girls seemed to affect him deeply and interrupting kate who was thanking her friends for all their tokens of good will he said i must really thank the ladies of the chorus for the very handsome present they made me how sorry i am that they are not all here to receive my thanks i cannot say but those who are here will i hope explain to their comrades how we were pressed for space one would think you were refusing a free admission snarled mortimer oh what a bore that fellow is whispered dick to mr cox the proprietor of the company who had come down from london to arrange some business with his manager i'm sure mr lennox we were only too glad to be able to give you something to show you how much we appreciate your kindness said a tall girl speaking in the name of the chorus oh, we must have some fizz after the show to-night on the stage what do you think cox said dick and then i shall be able to express my thanks to every one and we must have a dance cried leslie my foot is all right now chairs had to be fetched in from the bedroom and even from the kitchen to seat the fifteen people who had been invited the ladies did not like sitting together and the supply of gentlemen was not sufficient drawbacks that were forgotten when the first spoonfuls of soup had been eaten and the sherry tasted the women examined mr cox with looks of deep inquiry but his face told them nothing it was grave and commercial and he spoke little to anyone except kate and her husband the baronet's son sat in the middle of the table with the three chorus girls whom he continued to pester with calculations as to how much he would be worth but for his ancestor's ambition to win the derby with scotch coast leslie and brett were on the other side of the wedding cake and they leant towards each other with a thousand little amorous movements beaumont spoke of the evening's performance putting questions to montgomery with a view to attracting mr cox's attention do you think mr montgomery that to take an encore for my song will interfere with the piece i never heard of a lady putting the piece before herself said montgomery with a loud laugh for he too was anxious to attract mr cox's attention and availing himself of miss beaumont's question as a lead-up he said i hope when my opera is produced i shall find artists who will look as carefully after my interests but when will you have your opera ready kate asked my opera he said as soon as she averted the brown eyes that burnt into his soul it's all finished it's ready to put on the stage when dick likes the ruse proved successful for mr cox bending forward said in an interested voice may i ask what is the subject of your opera mr montgomery this was charming and the musician at once proceeded to enter into a complicated explanation 
in which frequent allusion was made to a king a band of conspirators a neighbouring prince a beautiful daughter unfortunately in love with a shepherd and a treacherous minister beaumont listened wearily and seeing that no mention she could make of her singing would avail her she commenced to fidget abstractedly with one of her big diamond earrings in the meanwhile montgomery's difficulties were increasing to follow successfully the somewhat intricate story of king conspirators and amorous shepherd a sustained effort of attention was necessary and this dick kate and mr cox found it difficult to grant for in the middle of a somewhat involved bit in which it was not quite clear whether the king or the minister had entered disguised the landlady would beg to be excused if they could just make a little way so that she might remove the soup this lady in her sunday cap assisted by the maid of all work from whose canvas grained hands soap and water had not been able to extract the dirt strove to lift large dishes of food over the heads of the company there was a sirloin of beef that had to be placed before mortimer then came two pairs of chickens the carving of which dick had taken upon himself a piece of bacon with cabbage and a pigeon pie adorned the sides of the table the cutlets were handed round and for some time conversation gave way to the more necessary occupation of eating even brett and leslie left off billing and cooing the grandson of the baronet forgetful of his family's misfortunes on the turf dug vigorously into the pigeon pie and liberally distributed it the clattering of knives and forks swelled into a sustained sound which was only broken by observations such as oh thanks mr lennox anything that's handy a leg if you please uh, may i ask you montgomery for a slice of bacon uh, no cabbage thank you uh, mr mortimer a little more and some gravy oh that'll do nicely it was not until the first helping had been put away and eyes began to wander in search of what would be best to go on with that conversation was resumed to mortimer who had had a good deal of trouble with the beef dick said i hope you are satisfied with your part mortimer and that we shall have some good roars the piece ought to go with a scream i think i shall knock em this time old boy said the comic man drawling his words slowly through his nose it pretty well killed me when i read it over to myself so i don't know what it'll be when i spit it out at them this was deemed unnecessarily coarse and for a moment it was feared that mortimer was as drunk as mr hayes whose eyes were now beginning to blink pathetically he awoke up however with a start and a smile when the first champagne cork went off and holding out his glass said shall be very glad to drink your health a wedding only comes once in a lifetime mortimer tried to turn the embarrassing pause that followed this remark to his profit the beef having kept him silent during the early part of the dinner he resolved now to prove what a humorist he was and by raising his voice he strove to attract the attention of the company to himself this however was not easily done dubois had begun to pinch the back side of the canvas-handed maid who was lifting a plate of custards over his head but these frivolities did not prevent him from discussing carlyle's place in english literature with the baronet's son on his left and arguing from time to time with montgomery on his right against certain effects employed by wagner in his orchestration kate laid down her spoon and stared vaguely into space and again laid her hand on dick's the past seemed now to be completely blotted out what more could she desire she would go on acting and dick would continue to love her by some special interposition of providence all the hazards of existence over which she might have fallen had been swept aside what broader road could a woman hope to walk in than the one that lay before her in all its clear and bland serenity god had been good to her and he was going to be good to her what a tie the child would be what an influence what a source of future happiness they would work for their child a boy or girl which would it not give them courage to work would it not give them strength to live it would be something to hope for oh how good god had been to her and how wicked she had been to him her heart filled with a fervour of faith she had never felt before and facing the gracious future which a child and husband promised her 
she offered up thanksgiving for her happiness which she accepted as eternal so inherent did it seem in herself oh just look at him said kate waking up with a start from her reveries how can he make such a beast of himself oh, don't take any notice of him dear that's the best way but mortimer who had been vainly struggling for the last five minutes to draw beaumont from the memory of a lord dubois from his wagnerian argument and brett and leslie from their flirtation now seized on poor hayes's drunkenness as a net wherein he could capture everybody raising his voice so as to ensure silence he said addressing himself to mr cox at the other end of the table oh how very affecting he is how severely natural the innocence of a young girl in her teens is not to my mind nearly so touching as that of a boozer in his cups have you ever heard how he fancied the waiter was calling him in the morning when the policeman was hauling him off to the station mr cox had not heard and the whole story of how they bumped in the hotel door at derby had to be gone through having thus got the company by the ear mortimer showed for a long time no signs of letting them go he went straight through his whole repertoire he told of a man who wanted to post a letter but not being able to find the letter-box he applied to a policeman the bobby showed him something red in the distance and explained that that was the post keep the red in your eye my boy said the drunkard and this he did until he found himself in a public-house trying to force his letter down a soldier's collar he had mistaken the red coat for a pillar this was followed by the story of a man who apologised to the trees in st james's park and explained to them that he had come from a little bachelor's party until he at last sat down saying this is no good i must wait till the bloody procession has passed a heavy digestive indifference to everything was written on each countenance and in the slanting rays of the setting sun the curling smoke vapours assumed the bluest tints odours of spirits trailed along the tablecloth disconnected fragments of conversation heard against the uninterrupted murmur of mortimer's story-telling struck the ear the baronet's son was now explaining to his three ladies that no woman could expect to get on in life unless she were very immoral or very rich dubois argued across the table with leslie and brett concerning the production of the voice beaumont cast luminous and provoking glances at mr cox and tried to engage him in conversation regarding the inartistic methods of most stage managers in arranging the processions dick dear the cake hasn't yet been cut oh no more it hasn't dick answered and when the white sugared emblem of love and fidelity was distributed the wedding party awoke to a burst of enthusiasm every one suggested something and much whisky and water was spilt on the tablecloth but matters although they were advanced a stage did not seem to be much expedited the bride's health had to be drunk and dick had to return thanks he didn't say very much but his remark concerning olivette suggested a good deal of comment mortimer took a different view of the question and dubois explained at length how the piece had been done in france leslie insisted that brett should say something and once on his legs to the surprise of everybody the silent tenor became surprisingly garrulous it was kate however who first guessed the reason of montgomery's despondency and in pity for him she made a sign to the ladies and the room was left to the flat chests and tweed coats montgomery prayed that this after-dinner interval would not prove a long one for he dreaded the smutty stories the baronet's son sprang off with a clear lead watched by mortimer and dubois in the way of anecdotes these two would have been rivals had it not been for the latter's fancy for more serious discussions still in the invention and collection of the most atrocious they both employed the energy and patience of the entomologist a chance word out of which a racy story might be extracted was pursued like a rare moth or a butterfly dubois were more subtle but mortimer's being more to the point were more generally effective they waited eagerly for the baronet's son to conclude and he had hardly pronounced the last phrase when mortimer coming with a rush took the lead with that reminds me of uh, dubois looked discomfited and settled himself down to waiting for another chance 
this however did not come just at once mortimer told six stories each nastier than the last everybody was in roars except montgomery and dubois whilst one thought of his opera the other searched his memory for something that would out mortimer mortimer this was difficult but when his turn came he surprised the company mr cox leaned over the table with a glass of whisky and water in his hand declaring that he had never spent so pleasant a day in his life and thus encouraged dubois was just beginning to launch out into the intricacies of a fresh tale when montgomery beside himself with despair said to dick it was arranged that i should play the music of my new opera over to mr cox if you don't put a stop to this it'll go on for ever oh yes my boy it is getting a bit long isn't it just let dubois finish and we'll go upstairs the story proved a weary one but like a long railway journey it at last drew to an end and they went upstairs there they found the ladies yawning and looking at the presents kate ran to dick to ask him to arrange about the music but beaumont had been a little before her and had taken mr cox out on to the balcony brett was not in the room leslie didn't know the music and in the face of so many difficulties dick's attention soon began to wander and kate was left to console the disappointed musician once or twice she attempted to renew the subject but was told that they were all going down to the theatre in half an hour and that it had better be put off until another time montgomery made no answer but he could not cast off the bitter and malignant thought that haunted him i'm as unfortunate in art as in love chapter twenty the ebb of the company's prosperity dated from kate's marriage somehow things did not seem to go well after in the first place the production of olivette was not a success mortimer was drunk didn't know his words and went fluffing all over the shop kate excited with champagne and compliments sang the wrong music on one occasion and to complete their misfortunes the liverpool public did not in the least tumble to miss beaumont's rendering of the part of the heroine the gallery thought she was too fat the papers said she was not sprightly enough and on wednesday night the old cloche had to be put up by this failure the management sustained a heavy loss they had laid out a lot of money on dresses property and scenery all of which were now useless to them and the other two operas were beginning to droop and lose their drawing power having been on the road for the last three years the country too was suffering from a great commercial crisis and no one cared to go to the theatre in many of the towns they visited strikes were on and the people were convulsed with discussions projects for resistance and hopes of bettering their condition great social problems the tyranny of capital and such like occupied the minds of men and there was naturally little taste for the laughing nonchalance of la fille de madame Angot or the fooling of the bailey in the cloche as forty thousand men had struck work our band of travelling actors rolled out of Leeds, and they left it bearing with them only a reminiscence of empty benches and street corners crowded with idling, sullen-faced men. At Newcastle they were not more fortunate, at Wigan they fared even worse, and at Hull it was equally bad. Gaiety seemed to have fled out of the north, the public house and the platform drew away the pit and the gallery. The frequenters of the boxes and dress circle remained at home to talk around their firesides of their jeopardised fortunes. When the workers grow weary of work, a hard time sets in for the sellers of amusement, and the fate of Morton and Cox's operatic company proved no exception to the rule. Money was made nowhere, and every Friday night a cheque for five and twenty pounds had to be sent down from London to make up the deficit in the salary list nevertheless for two months matters went on very smoothly the remembrance of large profits made in preceding years was still fresh in the minds of messrs morton and cox and they had not yet begun to grumble but an unintermittent drain of twenty-five to forty pounds a week keeps a man from his sleep at night and after a big failure in the city in which mr cox was muleted to the extent of a couple of thousand pounds he wrote to dick suggesting that he had better look out for another opera 
this was welcome news to montgomery but no sooner had dick raised him to the seventh heaven of bliss than he had to knock him down to earth again a letter arrived from mr cox saying that no opera was to be put up that it would be useless to try anything new in such bad times they had better try to reduce expenses instead reduce expenses how are we to reduce expenses except by cutting down the salaries i'm sure i don't know said montgomery the expense of mounting my piece would be very slight without attempting to discuss so vain a question dick said i must speak to hayes but hayes only pulled his silky whiskers blinked his chinese eyes and drank three glasses of whisky and changed the position of his black bag several times and the matter was scarcely alluded to again until the following fortnight when dick found himself forced to write to mr cox demanding a cheque for thirty-five pounds to meet saturday's treasury and the current expenses of the following week the cheque arrived but the letter that came with it read very ominously indeed it read as follows dear mr lennox i enclose you the required amount but of course you will understand that this cannot go on i intend running down to see you on tuesday evening will you have the company assemble to meet me at the theatre as i have an important explanation to make to them dick had too much experience in theatrical speculations not to know that this must mean either a reduction of salaries or a break-up of the tour but as two whole days still stood between him and the evil hour it didn't occur to him to give the matter another thought and it was not until they returned home after the theatre to prepare for the sunday journey that he spoke to kate of the letter he had received their portmanteaus were spread out before them and kate was counting her petticoats when dick said i'll tell you what kate i shouldn't be surprised if the company broke up shortly and we all found ourselves obliged to look for new berths what do you mean she said with a startled look on her face well only that i think that morton and cox are beginning to get tired of losing money as you know we've been doing very bad business lately and i think they'll give us all the sack give us all the sack kate repeated yes said dick pursuing his own reflections i'm afraid it's so it seduced bore for we were very pleasant together oh but i don't think i showed you the letter i got this morning what's the matter dear pale as the petticoat at her feet kate stood with raised eyebrows and hands that twitched at the folds of her dress oh dick what shall we do we shall starve we shan't have any place to go to starve said dick in astonishment oh, not if i know it we shall easily find something else to do besides i don't care if he does break up the tour i believe there's a good bit of coin to be made out of the pier theatre at blackpool i've been thinking of it for some time with a good entertainment you know and then there's the drama harding did for me a version of wilkie collins story the yellow mask devilish good it is too i was reading it the other day we might take a company out with it let me see whom could we get to play in it and sitting over his portmanteau the actor proceeded to cast the piece commenting as he went along on the qualifications of the artists and giving verbal sketches of the characters in the play beaumont would play virginie first-rate you know a strong determined wicked woman who stops at nothing i'd like to play the father mortimer would be very funny as the uncle we'll have to write in something for you you couldn't take the sympathetic little girl yet you haven't had enough experience the expenses of scenery properties and posting were gone into and while listening to the different estimates kate looked at her husband vaguely and plunged in a sort of painful wonderment asking herself how standing on the brink of ruin he could calmly make plans for the future but to the actor whose life had never run for a year without getting entangled in some difficult knot or other the present hitch did not give the slightest uneasiness a strange town to face and half a crown in his pocket might cause him some temporary embarrassment 
but a hundred pounds at the bank and the notoriety of having been for two years the manager of a travelling company was to dick an exceptionally brilliant start in life and it did not occur to him to doubt that he would hop into another shop as good as the one he had left but as the woman had been engaged in none of these anxious battles for existence the news of a threatened break-up of her world fell with a cruel shock upon her and she experienced in an aggravated form the same dull nervous terror from which she had suffered in the early days when she had first joined the company but then the full tide of love and prosperity bore their bark along and quieted her fears but now in the first puff of the first squall she saw herself like one wrecked and floating on a spar in a wide and unknown sea of trouble sitting on the bed where she would never sleep again she watched dick counting on his fingers and looking dreamily into the spaces of some impossible future and asked herself what was to become of them for the twentieth time since she had donned them the robes of the bohemian fell from her and she became again in instincts and tastes a middle-class woman longing for a home a fixed and tangible fireside where she might sit in the evening by her husband's side mending his shirts after the work of the day a bitter detestation of her wandering life rose to her head and she longed to beg of her husband to give up theatricals and try to find some other employment and the next day it appeared to her more than usually sinful to drive to the station as the church bells were chiming spending the hours that should have been passed in praying in playing nap smoking cigarettes and talking of wigs make-ups choruses and such like but apparently there was no help for it and on monday night in her excitement increased by the arrival of mr cox she could not help getting out of bed to beseech god to be merciful to them her husband's heavy breathing often interrupted her but it told her that he was her husband and that was her only consolation it astonished her that he could sleep as he did having in front of him the terrible to-morrow when perhaps mr cox would cast them adrift and she trembled in every fibre when she stood on the stairs leading to the manager's room there was a great crowd the chorus girls wedged themselves into a solid mass and murmured good mornings to each other mortimer told a long story from the top step dubois tried to talk of balzac to montgomery who listened puzzled and interested fancying it was the question of a libretto whilst brett till now silent as the dead suddenly woke up to the conclusion that it would probably all end in a reduction of salaries at last dick appeared and called them into the presence of mr cox whisky and water was on the table and with the silky whiskers plunged in the black bag, Mr. Hayes fumbled aimlessly with many papers. The boss looked very grave and twitched at a heavy moustache, and when they were all grouped about him, in his deepest and most earnest tones, he explained his misfortunes. For the last four months he had been forced to send down a weekly cheque of not less than five and twenty pounds, sometimes indeed the amount had run up to forty pounds this of course could not go on for ever he had not the bank of england behind him but talking of banks although there was no reason why he should inflict on them an account of his bad luck he could not refrain from saying that had it not been for a certain bank he should be forced to ask them to accept half salaries the words brought a flush of indignation to beaumont's cheeks she made a slight movement as if she were going to repudiate the suggestion violently but the silence of those around calmed her and she contented herself with murmuring to dolly this is an old dodge i will leave you now said mr cox to consult among yourselves as to whether you will accept my proposal or if you would prefer me to break up the tour at the end of the week and pay you your fares back to london as mr cox left the room there was a murmur of inquiry from the chorus ladies and one or two voices were heard above the rest saying that they didn't know how they could manage on less than five and twenty shillings a week these objections were soon silenced by dick who in a persuasive little speech explained that the reduction of salaries applied to the principals only 
then why derange these ladies and gentlemen by asking them to attend at this meeting said mortimer to this question dick made answer by telling the ladies and gentlemen of the chorus that they might withdraw and the discussion was resumed by those whom it concerned beaumont objected to everything brett spoke of going back to liverpool dubois explained his opinions on the management of theatres in general until dick summoned him back to the point were they or were they not going to accept half salaries at length the matter was decided by mortimer getting up on a chair and shouting through his nose as through a pipe i don't know if you're all fond of hot weather but if you are you'll find it to your taste in london all the theatres are closed and the cats are baking on the tiles this brought the argument to a pause during which beaumont remembered that grouse was shot in august and settling her diamonds in her ears she agreed that the tour was to be continued a few more remarks were made and then the party adjourned to a neighbouring pub to talk of opera bouffe and bad business the next places they visited were huddersfield and bradford but the houses they played to were so poor that mr cox summoned a general meeting on the sunday morning and told them frankly that he could not go on losing money any longer he would however lend them the dresses and they might start a commonwealth if they liked after much discussion it was decided to accept his offer and the afternoon was spent in striving to decide how the business was to be carried on a committee was at last formed consisting of dick mortimer dubois montgomery brett and mr hayes and they settled as they went on to halifax by an evening train that the chorus was hit or miss to be paid in full and the takings then divided among the principals proportionately to the salary previously received in the face of the bad times it was a risky experiment and williams the agent in advance was anxiously looked out for at the station what did he think was there a chance of their doing a bit of business in the town were their bills up in all the public houses williams did not at first understand this unusual display of eagerness but when the commonwealth was explained to him his face assumed as grey an expression as the pimples would allow it he shoved his dust-eaten pot-hat on one side scratched his thin hair and after some pressing admitted that he didn't think that they would do much good in the place as far as he could see everybody's ideas were on striking and politics the general election especially was playing the devil with managers at least that was what the company that had just left had said this was chilling news and alas each subsequent evening proved only the correctness of mr williams's anticipations seven pound houses were the rule on friday and saturday they had two very fair pits but this couldn't compensate for previous losses and in the end when all expenses were paid only five and thirty shillings remained to be divided among the principals their next try was at oldham but matters grew worse instead of better and on saturday night five and twenty shillings were sorrowfully portioned out in equal shares it did not amount to much more than half a crown apiece rochdale however was not far distant and still hoping that times would mend morton and cox's band of travelling actors sped on their way dreaming of how they could infuse new life into their mumming and whip up the jaded pleasure tastes of the miners but for the moment comic songs proved weak implements in the search for ore and the committee sitting in the green room used likewise as a dressing-room by the two ladies counted out a miserable four and ninepence as the result of a week's hard labour beaumont fumed before the small glass arranging her earrings as if she anticipated losing them kate trembled and clung to her husband's arm montgomery cast sentimental glances of admiration at her and mortimer tried to think of something funny while dubois came to the point by asking well what are you going to do with that four and ninepence it isn't worth dividing i suppose we'd better drink it at the mention of drinks mr hayes blinked and shifted the black bag from the chair to the ground yes that's easily arranged said dick but what about the tour i for one am not going on at four and ninepence a week spendish in drinks stuttered mr hayes awakening to a partial sense of the situation 
Everybody laughed, but in the pause that ensued, each returned to the idea that there was no use going on at four and ninepence a week. "'For we can't live on drink, although Beaumont can on love,' said Mortimer, determined to say something. But the joke amused no one, and for some time only short and irrelevant sentences broke the long silences. At last Dick said, "'Well, then, I suppose we'd better break up the tour.' To this proposal no one made much objection. Murmurs came from different sides that it was a great pity they should have to part company in this way after having been so long together. Montgomery and Dubois contributed largely to this part of the conversation, and through an atmosphere of whisky and soap suds arose a soft penetrating poetry concerning the delights of friendship. It was very charming to think and speak in this way but all hoped, with perhaps the exception of Montgomery, that no one would insist too strongly on this point, for in the minds of all new thoughts and schemes had already begun to germinate. Mortimer remembered a letter he had received from a London manager. Dubois saw himself hobnobbing again with the old pals in the Strand. Brett silently dreamed of Miss Leslie's dyed hair and blue eyes, and of his chances of getting into the same company. "'Then, if it's decided to break up the tour, we must make a subscription to send the chorus back to London,' said Dick, after a long silence. Nobody till now had thought of these unfortunate people and their twenty-five shillings a week, but, always ready to help a lame dog over a stile, Dick planked down two quid and called on the others to do what they could in the same way. Mr. Hayes strewed the table instantly with the money he had in his pocket— Mortimer spoke about his wife, and mentioned details of an intimate nature to show how hard up he was. He nevertheless stumped up a thinnen. Beaumont, rampant at the idea of parting, contributed the same. Indignant looks were levelled at her, and Dick continued to exhort his friends to be generous. "'The poor girls,' he declared, "'must be got home. It would never do to leave them starving in Lancashire.' Kate gave a sovereign of her savings, and in this way something over ten pounds was made up. With that, Dick said he thought he could manage. The trouble he took to manage everything was touching. On Sunday, when Kate was at church, he was down at the railway station, trying to find out what were the best arrangements he could make, and on Monday morning, when they were all assembled on the platform to bid good-bye to their fellow workers, it was curious to see this huge man, who at first impression could be taken for a mere mass of sensuality, rushing about putting buns and sandwiches in paper bags for his poor chorus girls, encouraging them with kind words, and when the train began to move, waving them large and unctuous farewells with his big hat. Since the first shock of the threatened break-up of the tour, Kate had gradually grown accustomed to the idea, and now wept in silence. Without precisely suffering from any pangs of fear for the future, an immense sadness seemed to ache within her very bones. All things were passing away. The flock of girls in whose midst she had lived was gone. A later train would take Mortimer to London. Brett was bidding them good-bye. Beaumont was consulting a Bradshaw. How sad it seemed! The theatre and artists were vanishing into darkness like a dream. Not a day, nor an hour, could she see in front of her. "'What shall we do now?' she whispered to Dick, as she trotted along by his side. "'Well, I haven't quite made up my mind. I was thinking last night that it wouldn't be a bad idea to make up a little entertainment, of four or five of us, and see what we could do in the manufacturing towns.' "'Lancashire is, you know, honeycombed with them. "'Our travelling expenses would amount to a mere nothing. "'We must have someone to operate on the piano. "'I wonder if Montgomery would care about coming with us.' "'Kate thought that he would, "'and as she happened at that moment to catch sight of the long tails "'of the new market coat at the other side of the station, "'she begged Dick to call to the erratic musician.' No sooner was the proposition put forward than it was accepted, and in five minutes they were at luncheon in a pub, arranging the details of the entertainment. "'We shall want an agent in advance, a bill-poster or something of that kind,' said Montgomery. 
"'I've thought of that,' replied Dick. "'Williams is our man. He'll see to all that. "'And I don't know if you know, but he can sing a good song on his own account.' "'Oh, can he? Well, then, we can't have any one better. "'And what shall we take out?' "'Well, we must have a little operetta, "'and I don't think we can do better than Offenbach's Breaking the Spell.' "'Right you are,' said Montgomery, pulling out his pocket-book. "'Breaking the Spell. So far, so good. "'Now, we must have a song or a character sketch to follow, "'and I don't think it would be a bad idea if we rehearsed a comedietta. "'What do you say to the happy pair?' "'Right you are. Pencil it down. Can't do better.' It always goes well. And then I can sing between the men of Harleck. Montgomery looked a little awry at the idea of having to listen to the men of Harleck sung by Dick, but in the discussion that followed as to what Kate was to do, the men of Harleck was forgotten. As Dick anticipated, Williams declared himself delighted to accompany them in the double capacity of bill poster and occasional singer, and after a fortnight's rehearsal at Rochdale, the Constellation Company started on its wanderings. Many drinks had been consumed in seeking for the name, and it was not until Dick began to draw lines on a piece of paper, affixing names to the end of each, that the word suggested itself. What joy! What rapture! A rush was made to the printers, and in a few hours the following bill was produced. The Constellation Company Miss Kate Darcy, Mr. R. Lennox, Mr. P. Montgomery, Mr. B. Williams. Chapter 21 As the Constellation Company drove to the station, Kate noticed that Rochdale and Hanley were not unalike, and the likeness between the two towns set her thinking how strange it was. Here was the same red town, narrow streets, built of a brick that under a dull sky glared to a rich geranium hue. The purplish tints of Hanley alone were wanting, but the heavy smoke clouds and the tall stems of the chimneys were as numerous in Rochdale as in her native place. And coincidence still more marvellous, nature had apparently aided and abetted what man's hand had contrived, for in either town a line of hills swept around the sky. The only difference was that the characteristics of Rochdale were not so marked as those of Hanley. The hills were not so high, nor were they in such close array as those of the Staffordshire town, and the Lancashire valley was not so deep and trench-like as the one that engirdles the potteries. It may be that as much smoke hung over it, but the smoke did not seem so black and poisonous, at least not to Kate's eyes and as the train sped along a high embankment, a group of factory chimneys emerged from a fold in the hills, and comparing the two landscapes, it seemed to her there were more fields in the Lancashire Valley, watercourses, trees and hedges, stunted hedges, it is true, but she didn't remember any hedges about Hanley. At one moment she was minded to turn to Dick and to call his attention to the likeness in the country they were travelling through to the country she had come from, had she been alone with him she might have asked him, but he was now busy talking of the comic songs and sketches in which they were to act. The Mulligan's Guards was one of the items on their programme, and she and Dick were going to sing it together. This would be the first time they had ever sung together. Dick had very little voice, but he was a good actor, and she thought they would be able to make a success of it. He called her attention and the attention of the other members of the Constellation Company to the scattered towns and villages they were passing through. The very country for our kind of entertainment, he said, and all the mummers rose from their seats and gazed at the wolds and factories. Under the green waste of a wold a chimney had been run up, sheds and labourers' cottages had followed, and in five years, if the factory prospered, this beginning would swell into a village. In twenty, it would possess twenty thousand inhabitants. For, just as in old times the towns followed the castles, so do they now follow in the wake of the factories. 
the mummers gaped and wondered at the arsenic green sides of the walls striped with rough stone walls or blackened with an occasional coal pit the ridges fringed with trees blown thin by sea breezes in the distance within the folds of the hills tall chimneys clustered and great clouds of smoke hung listless in the still autumn air cold rays of sunlight strayed for a moment on the dead green of the fields pale as invalids enjoying the air for the last time before a winter seclusion and later on when the light mists of evening descended and bore away the landscape the phantom shapes of the wolds took on a strange appearance producing in kate a sensation of mobility which to escape from for it frightened her she turned to dick and asked how far they were from bacup he told her they would be there in about half an hour and half an hour afterwards williams who had gone on in front met them at the station and began at once the tale of his industry saying that he had been in every public house and had stood at the corners of all the principal streets distributing bills i think we shall do pretty well he said my only bit of bad news is that i haven't been able to find any lodgings for you there's but one hotel and all the rooms are taken dick who on such occasion always took time by the forelock insisted on starting at once on their search and up and down the murky streets of the manufacturing town they walked until it was time for them to repair to the mechanics hall where they were going to play and get ready for the entertainment the mulligan's guards proved a great success as did also the operetta breaking the spell kate's pretty face and figure won the hearts of the factory hands and she was applauded whenever she appeared on the stage and so frequent were the encores that it was half-past ten before they'd finished their programme and close on eleven o'clock before they got out of the hall into the street then the search for lodgings had to begin again montgomery and williams being single men obtained beds but kate and dick were not so easily satisfied and they found themselves standing under a porch with the lights going out on all sides and the prospect of spending a wet night in the street before them at last dick bethought himself of the police station but on applying to a policeman he was directed to the back door of a public house he was pretty sure whispered the boy in blue to get put up there the door was opened with precaution and they were allowed in the place was full of people it took them a long time to get served and they were at length told that in the way of a room nothing could be done for them every bed in the house was occupied kate raised her eyes to dick but her look of misery was anticipated by a rough-faced carter who stood at the counter you bear up little woman he said abruptly don't you look so frightened you shall both come up to my place if you will it isn't up to much but i'll do best i can for you there was no mistaking the kindness with which the offer was made though the idea of going to sleep at this rough man's house for the moment staggered even the mummer but as it was now clear that they would either have to accept their new friend's hospitality or spend the night on the doorstep it did not take them long to decide on the former alternative their only reason for hesitating was their inability to understand what were his motives for asking them to come to his place then as if divining the reason of their uncertainty he said i know you well though you don't know me i was up at the hall to-night and you did make me so laugh that i wouldn't see you in the streets for nothing now let it be yea or nay master for answer dick put out his hand and when he had thanked the hospitably inclined carter put some questions to him about the entertainment soon the two began to pal and after another drink they all went off together after wading down a few sloppy streets he stopped before a low doorway and ushered them into what looked like an immense kitchen they saw rafters overhead and an open staircase ascending to the upper rooms as a ladder might through a series of lofts and when a candle had been obtained the first thing their host did was to pull his wife out of bed and insist on his guests getting into it a request which the woman joined in as heartily as her husband as soon as the reason for this unceremonious awakening had been explained to her and so wearied out were kate and dick and so tempting did any place of rest look to them 
that they could offer no opposition to the kind intentions of their host and hostess, and they slept heavily until roused next morning by a loud trampling of feet passing through their room. It was the family coming down from the lofts above, and as they descended the staircase they wished their guests a broad Lancashire good morning, and when Kate and Dick had recovered from their astonishment they dressed and went out to buy some provisions which they hoped to be allowed to cook in the rough kitchen. But when they returned with their purchases they found the carter's daughter standing before an elaborately prepared breakfast consisting of a huge beefsteak and a high pile of cakes. "'Oh, ma'am, why do you buy those things?' said the girl, disappointed. Oh, "'Well,' said Kate, "'we couldn't think of trespassing on you in that fashion. "'You must, oh, you will, I hope, let us prepare our own breakfast.' "'Oh, father will never hear of it, I know,' said the girl. "'And immediately after, the carter, with his brawny arms, "'pushed Kate and Dick down into two seats at the big table.' Both cake and meat were delicious, and Dick's appetite showed such signs of outdoing the carters that Kate, in the hope of diverting attention, commenced an interesting conversation with the buxom maiden by her side, and so successful were her efforts that a friendship was soon established between the women, and when the morning's work was done, Mary, of her own accord, sought out Kate, and as she knitted the thick woollen stocking, was easily led into telling the inevitable love story. We change the surroundings, but a heart bleeds under all social variations, and in this grim manufacturing town, when the bridal dress was taken out of its lavender and darkness, it seemed to possess a gleam of poetic whiteness that it could not have had even if set off by the pleasant verdure of a Devonshire lane. Oh, but you'll keep it for another. Another will be sure to come by very soon, said Kate, trying to console. "'Nay, nay, I'll have no other,' said the girl. "'I'll just keep the dress by, but I'll have no other.' Then the talk hesitated, and fell at last into a long narrative concerning tender hopes and illusions, to which Kate listened, as all women do, to the story of heartaches and deceptions. And in after years, when all other remembrances of the black country were swept away, the remembrance of this white dress remained." From Bacup they went to Whitworth, a town in such immediate neighbourhood that it might be called a suburb of the former place, and there they played in the cooperative hall, to an audience consisting of a factory man, two children, and a postman who came in on the free list. This was not encouraging, but they nevertheless resolved to try the place again, and next day at dinner-time, as the hands were leaving the factories, they distributed some hundreds of bills. Dick said he should never forget it, to watch Pimply Face cutting about, shoving his bills into the women's aprons, was the funniest thing he'd ever seen in his life. But their efforts were all in vain. It rained, and not a soul came to see them. And in addition to their other troubles, they found Whitworth was an awkward place to stop at. Dick and his wife had a room in a pub, but Montgomery and Williams had to walk over each evening to sleep at Bacup. One day their landlady spoke of Clayton Lemours, where she said a fair was being held, and she advised the Constellation Company to try their entertainment there. This was considered as a sensible suggestion, and the four mummers started for the fair on the top of an omnibus, with their wigs and dresses and make-ups stuck under their legs. The weather at least was in their favour. The sunlight rolled over the great white sides of the booths, Aunt Sally's were being shied at, the pubs were all open, and a huge rollicking population, fetid with the fermenting sweat of the factories, was disporting on whisky and fresh air. Never were the spirits of dejected strolling players buoyed up with a fairer prospect of a harvest. The next thing to do was to distribute the handbills, and find a place where they could set up their show, and to conduct their search more thoroughly they separated, after having decided on a tryst. In this way the town was thoroughly ransacked, but it was not until Kate, who had gone off on her own accord, learnt from the landlord of a public house where she had entered to get a drink that he had a large concert room overhead, that there seemed to be the slightest chance of the Constellation Company being able to turn the joviality of the factory hands at the fair to any account. 
matters now seemed to be looking up, and a very neat little arrangement was entered into with the proprietor of the pub. Four entertainments of ten minutes each were to be given every hour, for each of which the sum of threepence ahead was to be charged, tuppence to go to the artist, a penny to the landlord, who would of course make his bit also out of the drink supplied. And what a success they had that day! Not only did the factory hands come in, but they paid their threepence over and over again. They never seemed to grow tired of hearing Dick and Kate sing the Mulligan Guards, and when she called out, Caw! and he touched his cap, they broke into a dance. The delight of the workpeople knew no bounds, and they often stopped the entertainment to hand up their mugs of beer to the mummers with a other soap man. From twelve o'clock in the day until eleven at night, the affair was kept going. Kate, Dick and Williams dancing and singing in turn, and Montgomery all the while spanking away at the dominoes. It was heavy work, but the coin they took was considerable, and it came in handy, for in the next three towns they did very badly. But at Paddyham, a curious accident turned out in the end very luckily for them. There were but five people in the house, one of whom was drunk. This fellow, very humorously in the middle of the entertainment, declared that he was going to sing a song. He even wanted to appropriate Williams's wig, and when Dick, who was always chucker out on such occasions, attempted to eject him, he climbed out of reach and lodged himself in one of the windows. From there he proceeded to call to the people in the street, and with such excellent results that they made eighteen pounds in the hall during the evening. This, and similar slices of good fortune, kept the Constellation Company rolling from one adventure to another. Sometimes a wet day came to their assistance, sometimes a dispute between some factory hands and the masters brought them a little money. Their wants were simple. A bed in a pub and a steak for dinner was all they asked for. But at last, as winter wore on, ill fortune commenced to follow them very closely and persistently. They had been to four different towns and had not made a ten-pound note to divide between the lot of them. In the face of such adversity it was not worth while keeping on. Besides, Kate's expected confinement rendered it impossible to prolong their little tour much further. For these reasons, one November morning, the Constellation Company, hoping they would soon meet again under more auspicious circumstances, bade each other good-bye at the railway station. Williams and Montgomery went to Liverpool, Kate and Dick to make a stay at Rochdale, where they heard that many companies were coming. The companies came, it is true, but they were unfortunately filled up, and Lennox and his wife couldn't get an engagement in any of them. The little money saved out of their tour enabled them to keep body and soul together for about a month, but in the fifth week they were telling the landlady lies and going through all the classic excuses, expecting a letter every day, oh, by Monday at the very latest, etc. In the face of Kate's approaching confinement, this was a state of things that made even Dick begin to look anxiously round and fear for the safety of the future. Kate, on the contrary, although fretted and wearied, took matters more easily than might have been expected, and the changing of their last ten shillings frightened her less than had the first announcement of the possible breaking up of Morton and Cox's operatic company. Bohemianism had achieved in her its last victory, and having lately seen so many of the difficulties of life solving themselves in ways that were inexplicable to her, she had unconsciously come to think that there was no knot that chance, luck or fate would not untie. Besides, her big dick's resources were apparently unlimited. The present weakness of her condition tended to induce her to rely more than ever upon his protection, and in the lassitude of weak hopes she contented herself with praying occasionally that all would yet come right. But her lover, although he told her nothing of his fears, was not so satisfied. Never before had he been quite so hard-pressed. They now owed a week's rent, besides other small debts, all of which they were unable to pay unless they pawned the remainder of their clothes. 
he said it would be far better for them to go to manchester leaving their things to be redeemed some day as a security with the landlady that is to say if they failed to get out of the house without being perceived by her they still had half a crown which would pay kate's railway fare and as regards himself dick proposed that he should do the journey on foot he would be able to walk the distance easily in three hours and at eleven o'clock would join his wife at an address which he gave her with many injunctions as to the story that was to be told to the landlady so as the clock was striking seven one cold winter's morning they stole quietly downstairs dick carrying a small portmanteau on the table of their room a letter was left explaining that a telegram received overnight called them to manchester but they hoped to be back again in a few days a week at the latest this assurance dick considered would amply satisfy the old dame and holding the portmanteau on his shoulder with one arm and supporting kate with the other he made his way to the station the day had not yet begun to break a heavy sluggish night hung over the town the streets were filled with puddles and flowing mud and kate was frequently obliged to stop and rest against the lamp-posts she complained of feeling very ill and she walked with difficulty in the straggling light of the gas dick looked at her pale pretty features accentuated by suffering he felt that he had never known before how dearly he loved her and the pity for her that filled his heart choked him when he attempted to speak and his eyes misted with tears and he could not bring his mind to leave her he thought of the old dodge of travelling on the luggage but fearing that a woman to whose house they were going would not let them in unless they had at least one portmanteau to show he determined to adhere to the original plan of sending kate on in front and although tortured by many fears he hid them assuring her that their troubles would be over once they set foot in manchester all he had to do was to go down to the theatre royal to get an engagement and he spoke so kindly that his kindness seemed to repay her for her sufferings for some days past she had been subject to violent nauseas and acute pains and as she bade him good-bye out of the railway carriage window she had to bend and press herself against it and feeling he must encourage her he ran along the platform till the train began to leave him behind and he stopped out of breath with a cloud of melancholy upon his cheeks generally so restful in a happy animalism yet the fat hand lifted the big brimmed black felt hat the frizzly curls blew in the cold wind the train oscillated and then rolled and disappeared around a bend in the line that was all what had been done was over as completely as the splash made by a stone dropped into a well and the actor awoke to a feeling that something new had again to be begun after descending the steps of the station he asked to be directed and for a long time his way lay through a street made by red brick houses with stucco porches but at length these commenced to divide into cottages and after many inquiries he was shown into what he was told was an old roman road called going over tyndall the wind blew bitterly and against a murky sky the fretted trees on the higher ridges were like veils of grey lace walking was not dick's forte and leaning against a farm gate his eyes embraced the wild black scenery and remembrances of the hanley hills drifted through his thoughts there were the same rolling wastes and like the pieces on a chessboard the factory chimneys appeared at irregular intervals but these topographical similarities attracted dick only so far as they filled his mind with old memories and associations and his thoughts flowed from the time he had stood with his wife at the top of market street to the present hour he neither praised nor blamed himself he accepted things as they were without criticism and they appeared to him like a turgid dream swollen and bleak as the confused expanse of distance before him the stupor into which he occasionally fell endured until a quick thought would strike through the mental gloom that oppressed him and relinquishing the farm gate he would moodily resume his walk through the heavy slosh of the wet roads as he did so the vision of kate's pain-stricken face haunted him and at every step 
his horror of the danger she ran of being taken ill before arriving in Manchester grew darker, and he toiled up hill after hill, yearning to be near her, desiring only the power to relieve and to help. Often the intensity of his longing would force him into a run, and then the farm labourers would turn from their work to gaze on this huge creature who stood on a hilltop wearily wiping his forehead. And then he grew sick of the long, staring, rolling landscape with its thousand sinuosities, its single trees, its detailed foreground of scrub, hedges and brooks spanned by small brick bridges, the melting distance, the murky sky, the belching chimneys. He asked himself if it would never end, if it would never define itself into the streets of Manchester and as he descended each incline his eyes searched for the indication of a town, until at last he saw lines of smoke, factories and masses of brick on his left, and he hastened. All the markings of the way were looked forward to, the outlying street seemed endless, and so great was his hurry that before he discovered he was in Oldham he had walked into the middle of the town. His disappointment was bitter indeed almost unbearable, and for the moment he felt that he could go no farther. His courage was exhausted. It was impossible he could face that bleak, mocking landscape again. Besides, he was fainting for want of food. Had he possessed a few pence to treat himself to a glass of beer and a bit of bread and cheese, he thought he would be able to pull himself together and make another effort. But he was destitute. Still, he was forced to try again. The thought of Kate burned in his brain, and after having inquired the way, with weary and aching feet he once more trudged manfully on. A fretful suspicion now haunted him, that she might not find the landlady as agreeable as would under the circumstances be desirable, and he reasoned with himself as he crossed into the open country, until anxiety became absorbed by fatigue. Of every passer-by did he ask the way, and as he passed the stately villas, Dick felt that had there been much farther to walk, he would have had to beg a lift from one of the wagoners who passed him constantly driving their heavy teams. But he was now in Manchester, and wondering if he had taken longer to walk than he had expected, he looked into the shop windows in search of a clock and when he rang at the door of the lodging-house, his heart beat as rapidly as the jangling bell that pealed through the house. The maid who answered the door told him that she knew of no such person, and was about to shut the door in his face, but Dick's good-natured smile compelled her into parley, and she admitted that, having been out on an errand, she had not seen the missus since ten o'clock. A lady might have called, but she wasn't in the house now. They were as full as they could hold. "'And are you certain that a lady might have called about ten or half-past without your having seen her?' Oh, "'I was out on an errand at that time, so I'm sure she might, for Mrs. wouldn't mind to tell me if I wasn't to get rooms ready for her.' "'And what would your mistress do in the case of not being able to supply a lady with rooms?' "'Oh, I should think she'd send round to Mrs. Oh, well, oh, I don't remember right the name. "'Do you know the address?' Oh, I know it's behind the station, one of those streets where... Oh, nay, but I don't think I could direct you right. Then what shall I do? Missus'll be in shortly. If you'll take a seat in the hall, I can't ask you into any other room. They're all occupied. There was nothing to do but to accept, and after having asked when the landlady might be expected in, and receiving the inevitable, really couldn't say for certain, sir, but I don't think she'll be long... He sat down in a chair, weary and footsore. There were times when, struck by a sudden thought, he would make a movement as if to start from his seat, but instantly remembering his own powerlessness, he would slip back into his attitude of heavy fatigue. In the dining-room the clock ticked, and he listened to the passing of the minutes, tortured by the idea that his wife was suffering, dying, and that he was not near to help, to assist, to assuage. He forgot that they were penniless and homeless, all was lost in a boundless pity, and he listened to the footsteps growing sharper as they approached, and duller as they went. 
At last the sound of the latch key was heard in the lock, and Dick started to his feet. It was the landlady. "'Have you seen my wife?' "'Oh, yes, sir,' exclaimed the astonished woman. "'She was here this morning. All our rooms are let, so I couldn't... Uh, "'Where has she gone to? Do you know?' "'Well, sir, I was going to say. She asked me if I could recommend her to some quiet place, and I sent her to Mrs. Hurley.' "'And will you give me Mrs. Hurley's address?' "'Yes, sir, certainly. But if I may make so bold, you're looking very tired. May I offer you a glass of beer? And Mrs. Lennox is looking very bad, too. She is.' "'I'm much obliged, but I've no time. If you'd give me the address.' No sooner were the words spoken than, forgetful of his aching feet, Dick rushed away, and dodging the passers-by, he ran until he laid hands on the knocker and bell in question. "'Is Mrs. Lennox staying here?' he asked of the lady who opened the door. "'There was a lady of that name who inquired for rooms here this morning.' "'And isn't she here? Why didn't she take the rooms?' "'Well, sir, she said she was expecting to be confined, "'and I didn't care to have illness in my house.' "'You don't mean to tell me you turned her out? "'Oh, you atrocious! If you were a man!' "'Overpowered with rage, he stopped for words, "'and the woman, fearing he would strike her, strove to shut the door. "'But Dick, with his thick leg, prevented her, "'and at this moment they were joined by the maid, "'who screamed over her mistress's shoulder.' "'The lady said she'd come round here in a couple of hours' time to ask for you. "'Oh, and I advised her to try for rooms at number 28 in this street. "'You'll find her there.' "'This was enough for Dick, and loosing his hold on the door he made off. "'Streets, carriages, passers-by whirled before his eyes. "'Is Mrs. Lennox here?' he asked so roughly when the door was opened "'that the maid regretted having said yes as soon as the word had passed her lips. "'On what floor?' "'The first, sir. But you'd better let me go up first. Mrs. Lennox isn't very well. She's expecting her husband.' "'I'm her husband.' And on that Dick rushed at the staircase. A few strides brought him on to the first landing, but a sudden disappointment seized him. The sitting-room was empty. Thinking instantly of the bedroom, he flung open the door, and there he saw Kate, sitting on the edge of the bed, rocking herself to and fro. She rose to her feet, and the expression of weary pain was changed to one of joy as she fell into Dick's arms. Oh, I thought you'd never come, and they would take me in nowhere. Yes, my darling, I know all about it. I know all. He laid kisses on the rich black-blue hair and the pale, tired face. He felt light hands resting on him. She felt strong arms clasped about her and each soul seemed to be but the reflection of the other, just as the sky and the sea are when the sun is at its meridian. Then, at this brief but ineffable moment of spiritual unison, faded words returned to them, and Kate spoke of all she had suffered. She whispered the story she had told the landlady, and how she had ordered a big dinner and everything of the best, so that they might not be suspected of being hard up. Dick approved of these arrangements, but just as he smacked his lips, a foretaste of the leg of mutton in his mouth, Kate uttered a sort of low cry, and turning pale, pressed her hands to her side. A sharp pain had suddenly run through her, and as quickly died away, but a few minutes after this was succeeded by another, which lasted longer and gripped her more acutely. Supporting her tenderly, he helped her across the room and laid her on the bed. There she seemed to experience some relief, but very soon she was again seized by the most acute pangs. It seemed to her that she was bound about with a buckler of iron, and frightened Dick rang for the landlady. The worthy woman saw at a glance what was happening, and sent him off, weary as he was, to fetch a doctor and the needful assistance. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 the doctor and nurse arrived almost simultaneously and passed into the sick room, bidding Dick, who came running upstairs a moment after, be of good cheer. 
The mummer took his hat from his head and stood for a moment, staring vacantly at the bedroom door, as if striving to read there the secrets of life, birth and death. Then he remembered how tired he was, and with a large movement of fatigue he sat down on the sofa. A gloomy yellow sky filled the room with an oppressive and mournful twilight, and to relieve his aching feet Dick had kicked off his shoes, and with his folded arms pressed against his stomach he sat, hour after hour, too hungry to sleep, listening to the low moaning that came through the chinks of the door. He appeared to be totally forgotten. Voices whispered on the staircase, people passed hurriedly through the sitting-room, but none asked him if he wanted anything. No one even noticed him. And when the landlady lighted the gas, she uttered a cry of astonishment, as if she discovered an intruder in the room. "'Oh, lots, Mr. Lennox, we'd forgotten all about you, and you sitting there so quiet. Oh, but your wife is getting on nice. She's just had a cup of beef tea. In about another couple of hours it'll be all over.' Is she suffering much? Well, yes, sir. I wouldn't consider it an easy confinement, but I think it'll be all right. You'll see your wife and child alive and well tomorrow morning. Dick could not help doubting the truth of the woman's statement unless she came to his assistance with food. Although almost starving, he was afraid to call for dinner lest she should ask him for some money in advance. But at that moment a cramp seized him, and turning pale he had to lean over the table to suppress the moan which rose to his lips. Oh, "'What's the matter, sir? You look quite ill,' the woman asked. "'Oh, twas only a, a sudden pain,' Dick said, making an effort to recover himself. "'I've eaten nothing all day. I've had no time, you know.' "'Oh, then we shall have you laid up as well as your wife, "'and there's the leg of mutton she ordered stewing away all these hours. "'I'm afraid you won't be able to eat it.' "'Absurd as the question appeared to him, Dick answered adroitly, "'Oh, it'll do very well. "'If you'll bring it up as soon as you can, I may have to go out.' "'This was intended as a ruse to deceive the landlady.' For so tired was he, that had it been to save Kate's life, he didn't think he would have walked downstairs. He could think of nothing but putting something into his stomach, and hard and dry as the mutton was, it seemed to him the most delicious thing he had ever tasted. His pain melted away with the first mouthful, and the glass of beer ran through and warmed his entire system. Down the great throat the victuals disappeared as if by magic, and the unceasing cry that seemed now to fill the entire house passed almost unheeded. For a moment he would listen pityingly, and then, like an animal, return to his food. He cut slice after slice from the joint, and as his hunger seemed to grow upon him, he thought he could finish it, and even longed to take the bone in his hand and pick it with his teeth. But he reasoned with himself. It would not do to let the landlady suspect they had no money and as he gazed at the last potato, which he was afraid to eat, he considered what he should say in apology for his appetite. But as he sought for a nice phrase, something pleasantly facetious, he remembered that he would have to find money, and at once. He must have some no later than tomorrow. There were a thousand things that would have to be paid for. The baby's clothes, the cradle, the... He tried to think of what was generally wanted under such circumstances, but the cries in the next room, which had gradually swelled into shrieks, appalled him, and involuntarily the thought struck him that there might be a funeral to pay for as well as a birth. At that moment the bell tinkled, and the maid came running up. She carried a jug of hot water and flannels in her hand, and pushing past him she declared that she hadn't a moment. The door of the bedroom was ajar, a fire burned, candles flared on the mantelpiece, a basin stood on the floor, and at times nothing was heard but a long moan, mingling with the murmuring voices of the doctor and nurse. The room seemed like a sanctuary in which some mysterious rite was being performed. But suddenly the silence was broken by shrieks so passionate and acute that all the earlier ones were only remembered as feeble lamentations. 
Dick raised his big face from his hands. The movement threw back the mass of frizzly hair, and in the intensity of this emotion he looked like a lion. Was this life, he asked himself, or death? And by whose order was a human creature tortured thus cruelly? But the idea of God did not arrest his attention, and his thoughts fixing themselves on the child, he asked himself, what was this new life to him? Oh, I never will again. Oh, how I hate him. I could kill him. I'll never love him. Never no more. The cry touched the fat mamma through all the years of gross sensuality, through the indigestion of his big dinner, and, struck by the sense of her words, he shuddered, remembering that it was he who was the cause of this outrageous suffering, and not the innocent child. Was it possible, he asked himself, that she would never love him again? He didn't know. Was it possible that he was culpable? Strange notions respecting the origin, the scheme, the design of the universe flashed in dim chiaroscuro through his thoughts, and for a full hour Dick pondered, philosopher-like, on the remote causes and the distant finalities of men and things. An hour full of moans and cries of suffering, then a great silence came and the whole house seemed to sigh with a sense of relief. "'The baby must be born,' he said, and immediately after a thin little cry was heard, and in his heart it was prolonged like a note of gladness, and his thoughts became paternal. He wondered if it were a girl or a boy. He fancied he'd like a girl best. If she were pretty and had a bit of a voice, he'd be able to push her to the front, whereas with a boy it would be more difficult. Relinquishing his dreams at this point, Dick listened to the silence. He did not dare to knock at the door, but the murmur of satisfied voices assured him that all was right. Still, it was very odd that they didn't come out and announce the result to him. Did he count for nobody? Did they fancy that it was nothing to him if his wife and child were dead or alive? The idea of being thus completely unconsidered in an affair of such deep concern irritated him, and he walked towards the sofa to brood over his wrongs. Should he or should he not knock at the door? At last he decided that he should, and after a timid rap tried the handle. He was immediately confronted by the nurse. "'It's all right, sir. You shall come in in a moment when the baby is washed.' "'Yes, I, but I want to know how my wife is.' "'She's doing very well, sir. You shall see her presently.' The door was then gently but firmly closed, and Dick was kept waiting, and almost collapsing he staggered into the room when the nurse called for him to come in. Kate lay amid the sheets, pale and inert, her beautiful black hair making an ink stain on the pillows. She stretched an exhausted hand to him, and looked at him earnestly and affectionately. To both of them their lives seemed completed. "'Oh, my darling, my darling,' he murmured, and his heart melted with happiness at the faint pressure of fingers which he held within his. The nurse standing by him held something red wrapped up in the flannels. He scarcely noticed it until he heard Kate say, "'It's a little girl.' "'Kiss it, dear!' He awkwardly touched with his lips the tiny, whining mass of flesh the nurse held forward, feeling, without knowing why, ashamed of himself. "'Hearing that Madam was taken all unexpected, I brought these flannels with me,' said the large woman with the long-tailed cap. "'But tomorrow I can recommend you, if you like, sir, to a shop where you can get everything required.' This speech brought Dick with a cruel jerk to the brink of the atrocious situation in which he had so unexpectedly found himself. Tomorrow he would have to find money, and a great deal too. How he was going to do it he did not know, but money would have to be found. Oh, yes, yes, I'll see to all that tomorrow, he said, awakening from his lethargy like a jaded horse touched in some new place by the spur. Oh, but now I'm so tired I can scarcely speak. That's so, said the landlady. These walking tours is dreadful. He's been over from Rochdale today, not counting the running about he did after his wife. You know they refuse to take her in at number fifteen. Oh, 
but sir i don't well know how we shall manage i don't see how i'm to offer you a bed the best i can do for you is to make you up something on the sofa in the parlour oh the sofa will do very well i think i could sleep on the tiles so good-night dear he said as he leaned over and kissed his wife i'm sorry to leave you so soon it isn't a bit too soon said the doctor she must lie still and not talk on this dick was led away the nurse and doctor consulted by the bed where the woman would lie for days too weak even to dream while the man went off into the manchester crowd to search for food beyond the bare idea of going down to see what they were doing at the theatre he had no plans the scavenger dog that prowls about the gutter in search of offal could not have less but he felt sure that something would turn up he was certain to meet someone to whom he could sell a piano or for whom he could build a theatre he never made plans there was no use in making plans they were always upset by an accident far better he thought to trust to the inspiration of the moment and when he awoke in the morning heavy with sleep he felt no trepidation no fear beyond that of how he should get his sore feet into his shoes it was only with a series of groans and curses that he succeeded in doing this and the limps by which he proceeded down the street were painful to watch at the stage door of the theatre royal a conciliatory tone of voice was mechanically assumed as he asked the porter if mr jackson was in but before the official could answer dick caught sight of mr jackson coming along the passage how do you do old man haven't seen you for a long time what you dick in manchester oh come and have a drink old man very glad to see you stopping here long well i'm not quite decided my wife was confined you know last night what you a father dick mr jackson leered poked him in the ribs and commenced a list of anecdotes to these dick had to listen and in the hopes of catching his friend in an unwary moment of good humour he laughed heartily at all the best points but digressive as conversation is in which women are concerned sooner or later a reference is made to the cost and the worth and at last mr jackson was incautious enough to say very expensive those affairs are to be sure this was the chance that dick was waiting for and immediately buttonholing his friend he said you're quite right they are and to tell you the truth old man i'm in the most devilish awkward position i ever was in my life you heard about the breaking up of morton and cox's company well that left me stranded at the first words gaiety disappeared from mr jackson's face and during dick's narrative of the tour in lancashire he made many ineffectual wriggles to get away dick judged from these well-known indications that to borrow money might be attended with failure and after a pathetic description of his poverty he concluded with so now my dear fellow you must find something for me to do it doesn't matter what something temporary until i can find something better you know it was difficult to resist this appeal and after a moment's reflection mr jackson said well you know we're all made up here there's a small part in the new drama to be produced next week i wouldn't like to offer it as it is but i might get the author to write it up oh it'll do first rate i'm sure to be able to make something of it uh, what's the screw that's just the point we can't afford to pay much for it our salary list is too big as it is what did you intend giving for it well we meant to give it to a super but for you i can have it written up what do you say to two ten dick thought it would be judicious to pause and after a short silence he said um, i've had as you know bigger things to do but i'm awfully obliged to you old pal you're doing me a good turn that i shan't forget we can consider the matter as settled this was a stroke of luck and dick congratulated himself warmly until he remembered that two pounds ten shillings at the end of next week didn't put a farthing into his present pocket 
money he would have to find that day how he didn't know he called upon everybody he had ever heard of he visited all the theatres and ballrooms drank interminable drinks listened to endless stories and when questioned as to what he was doing himself grew delightfully mendacious and upon the slight basis of his engagement for the new drama at the royal constructed a fabulous scheme for the production of new pieces in this way the afternoon went by and he was beginning to give up hopes of turning over any money that day when he met a dramatic author after the usual salutations how do you do old boy how's business etc had been exchanged the young man said had a bit of luck just sold my piece you know the drama i read you the one in which the mother saves her child from the burning house um, how much did you get seventy-five pounds down and two pounds a night at the idea of so much money dick's eyes glistened and he immediately proceeded to unfold a scheme he'd been meditating for some time back for the building of a new theatre the author listened attentively and after having dangled about the lamp-post for half an hour they mutually agreed to eat a bit of dinner together and afterwards go home and read another new piece that was so said the fortunate author a clinker no better excuse than his wife's confinement could be found for fixing the meeting hour at the young man's lodging and in the enthusiasm which the reading of the acts engendered it was easy for dick to ask for and difficult for his friend to refuse a cheque for fifteen pounds chapter twenty three in about a week kate was sufficiently restored to sit up in bed her very weakness and lassitude were a source of happiness for after long months of turmoil and racket it was pleasant to lie in the coverture's and suffer her thoughts to rise out of unconsciousness or sink back into it without an effort and these twilight trances flowed imperceptibly into another period when with coming strength a feverish love awoke in her for the little baby girl who lay sleeping by her side and for hours in the reposing obscurity of the drawn curtains mother and child would remain hushed in one long warm embrace to see to feel this little life moving against her side was enough she didn't look into the future nor did she think of what fate the years held in store for her daughter but content lost in emotive contemplation she watched the blind movements of hands and the vague staring of blue eyes this puling pulp that was more intimately and intensely herself than herself developed strange yearnings in her and she often trembled with pride in being the instrument through which so much mystery was worked to talk to herself of the dark dawn of creation and of the day sweet with maternal love that lay beyond was a great source of joy to hear the large hobbling woman tell of the different babies she had successfully started that year on their worldly pilgrimage never seemed to weary her she interested herself in each special case and when the nurse told her she must talk no more she lay back to dream of the great boy with the black eyes who had so nearly been the death of his little flaxen-haired mother she felt great interest in this infant who if he went on growing at the present rate it was prophesied would be in twenty years time the biggest man in manchester but the nurse admitted that all the children were not so strong and healthy indeed it was only last week that a little baby she had brought into the world perfectly safely had died within a few days of its birth for no cause that any one could discover it had wilted and passed away like a flower the tears rolled down kate's cheeks as she listened and she pressed her own against her breast and insisted on suckling her infant although expressly forbidden to do so by the doctor these days were the best of her life she felt more at peace with the world she placed more confidence in her husband than she had ever done before and when he came in of an afternoon and sat by her side and talked of herself and of their little baby softened in all the intimate fibres of her sex she laid her hand in his and sighed for sheer joy the purpose of her life seemed now to show a definite sign of accomplishment the only drawback to their happiness was their poverty 
the fifteen pounds of borrowed money had gone through their hands like water, and God knows what would have become of them if Dick hadn't been fortunate to make another tenor by looking after a piece given at a morning performance. What with the doctor's bills, the nurse's wages, the baby's clothes, they were forever breaking into their last sovereign. Dick spoke of their difficulties with reluctance, not wishing to distress her, but he felt he must rouse her out of the apathy into which she had fallen, and he begged of her to take the next engagement he could find for her. It seemed to him that she was now quite well, but when he pressed for a promise the first time, she answered, "'Yes, Dick, I, I should like to get to work again.' But when he came to her with a proposal of work, she was quick to find excuses. The baby was foremost among them. She didn't like to put the child out to nurse. "'If the child were to die, I should never forgive myself,' she would say. "'Don't ask me, Dick, don't ask me.' "'But, Kate, we cannot go on living here on nothing. "'We owe the landlady for three weeks.' "'At these words, Kate would burst into tears, "'and when he succeeded in consoling her, "'she would remind him that if she went back to work "'before she was quite well, she might be laid up for a long time, "'which would be much worse than the loss of a miserable three or four pounds a week.' To convince Dick completely, she would remind him that as she had been playing leading parts, it would not be wise to accept the first thing she could get. If one lets oneself down, Dick, in the profession, it's difficult to get up again. Well, dear, Dick would answer, I must try and find something to do myself. You shall not be asked again to go back to work until you feel like it. When you come to tell me that you're tired of staying at home... "'Don't speak like that, Dick, for it seems as if you're laying blame upon me, and I'm not to blame. You'll be able to judge for yourself when I'm fit to go back to work, and one of these days you'll come with the news of a leading part.' Accompanying him to the door, she said she'd like to return to the stage in a leading part, but not in any of the parts she'd already played in, but in something new. These objections and excuses brought a cloud into Dick's face which she did not notice, but when he had gone she would begin to think of his kindness towards her and of what she could do to reward him. His shirts wanted mending, and as soon as they were mended she made hoods and shoes for the baby. In many little ways the old life that she thought she had left behind in Handley began to reappear, and when Dick came into the room and found her reading a novel by the fire, she reminded him of Ralph's wife rather than his own. While she was touring in the country, she had given up reading without being aware that she had done so. She had once bought a copy of the Family Herald, hoping that it would help away the time on the long railway journey, but having herself come into a life of passion, energy and infinite variety, she could not follow with any interest the story of three young ladies in reduced circumstances who had started a dressmaking business and who were destined clearly to marry the men they loved and who loved them and who would continue to love them long after the silver threads had appeared among the gold but now in the long lonely days spent with her baby in the lodging dick went away early in the morning and sometimes didn't return until twelve o'clock at night a story in a copy of the Family Herald lent to her by the landlady, on the whole a very kind and patient soul, took hold of Kate's imagination, and when she raised her eyes a tear of joy fell upon the page, and in the effusion of these sensations she would take her little girl and press it almost wildly to her breast. Before leaving the nurse had given Kate many directions. The baby was to have its bath in the morning, to be kept thoroughly clean, and to be given the bottle at certain times during the day and night. Kate was devoted to her child, but the attention she gave it was unsustained, a desultory attention. Sometimes she put too much water in the milk, sometimes too little. The christening had awakened in her many forgotten emotions, and now that she was an honest married woman, she didn't see why she should not resume her old church-going ways. The story she was reading was full of allusions to the vanity of this world and the durability of the next, and her feet on the fender penetrated with the dreamy warmth of the fire. She abandoned herself to the seduction of her reveries. Everything conspired against her. 
being still very weak, the doctor had ordered her to keep up her strength with stimulants. A tablespoonful of brandy and water taken now and then was what was required. This was the ordinance, but the drinks in the dressing rooms had taught her the comforts of such medicines, and during the day several glasses were consumed. Without getting absolutely drunk, she rapidly sank into sensations of numbness in which all distinctions were blurred and thoughts trickled and slipped away like the soothing singing of a brook. It was like an amorous tickling, and as her dreams balanced between a tender declaration of love and the austere language of the testament, the crying of the sick child was unheeded. Once, Kate did not hear it for hours, she didn't know she had forgotten to warm its milk and that the poor little thing was shivering with cold pain. And when at last she awoke and went over to the cot trying to collect her drink-laden thoughts, the little legs were drawn up, the face was like ivory, and a long thin wail issued from the colourless lips. Alarmed, Kate called for the landlady who, after feeling the bottle, advised that the milk should be warmed. When this was done, the child took a little and appeared relieved. Shortly after, a bell was heard ringing, and the landlady said, "'I think it's your husband, ma'am.' It was usual for Dick, when he came in at night, to tell what Kate termed the news. It amused her to hear what had been done at the theatre, what fresh companies had come to town. On this occasion... It surprised him that she took so little interest in the conversation, and after hazarding a few remarks, he said, "'But what's the matter, dear? Aren't you well?' "'Oh, yes, I'm quite well,' Kate answered stolidly. "'Well, what's the matter? You don't speak.' "'I'm tired, that's all.' "'And how's the baby?' "'I think she's asleep. Don't wake her.' But Dick went over and holding a candle in one hand, he looked long and anxiously at his child. "'I'm afraid the little thing is not well. She's fidgeting and is as restless as possible. I wish you'd leave her alone. If she awakes, it's I who'll have the trouble of her, not you. It's very unkind of you.' Dick looked at his wife and said nothing, but as she continued to speak, the evidences of drink became so unmistakable that he said, trying not to offend her, "'I am afraid you've been drinking a little too much of the brandy the doctor ordered you.' At this accusation, Kate drew herself up and angrily denied having touched a drop of anything that day. "'How dare you accuse me of being drunk? You ought to respect me more.' "'Drunk, Kate? I never said you were drunk.' "'But I thought you might have taken an overdose. "'I suppose you'll believe me when I tell you "'that I've not had a teaspoonful of anything.' "'Of course I believe you, dear,' said Dick, "'who did not like to think that Kate was telling him a deliberate lie, "'and to avoid further discussion he suggested bed. "'Kate did not answer him, and he heard her trying to get undressed.' And wondering at her clumsiness, he asked himself if he should propose to unlace her stays for her. But he was afraid of irritating her, and thought it would be better to leave her alone to undo the knot as best she could. She tugged at the laces furiously, and thinking she might break them and accuse him of unwillingness to come to her assistance, he said, "'Shall I?' But she cut him short. "'Let me alone! Let me alone!' she cried and Dick kicked off his shoes. "'How can you be so unkind? Or is it that you've no thought for that poor sick child?' she said. And Dick answered, "'I assure you, my dear, it couldn't be helped. The shoe slipped off unexpectedly.' And as if the world had set its face against her, Kate burst into tears. At first Dick tried to console her, but seeing that this was hopeless, he turned his face to the wall and went to sleep. She had not drawn the curtains of the window, and the outlines of the room showing through the blue dusk frightened her, so ghost-like did they appear. The cradle stood under the window, the child's face just visible on the pallor of the pillow. "'Baby's asleep,' she said. "'That's a good sign,' and watched the cradle, trying to remember how long it was since Baby had had her bottle, and while wondering if she could trust herself to wake when the baby cried, 
she began to notice that the room was becoming lighter. It cannot be the dawn, she thought. The dawn is hours away. We're in December. Besides, the dawn is grey and the light is green. A sort of pantomime light, she said. It seemed to her very like a fairy tale. The giant snoring and her baby stirring in her cradle with the limelight upon her. Oh, was she dreaming? It might be a dream out of which she couldn't rouse herself. But the noise she heard was Dick's breathing, and she wished that Ralph would breathe more easily. Ralph? Ralph! No, she was with Dick. Dick, not Ralph, was her husband. It was with a great effort that she roused herself. It was only a dream, she murmured. Oh, but baby's crying. Oh, her cry is so faint, she said. And slinging her legs over the side of the bed, she tried to find her dressing gown, but couldn't remember where she'd laid it. Baby wants a bottle, she said, and sought for the matches, vainly at first, but at last she found them and lighted a spirit lamp. One must get the water warmed. Cold milk would kill her. And while the water was heating, she walked up and down the room, rocking her baby, talking to her, striving to quiet her. And when she thought the water was warm, she tried to prepare baby's milk as the doctor had ordered it. Her hope was that she'd succeeded in mixing the milk and water in right proportions. For the last time she'd given baby a bottle, she was afraid the water was not warm enough. Perhaps that was why baby was crying. Or it might be merely a little wind that was troubling her. She held the baby upright, hoping that the pain would pass away with a change of position. And she walked up and down the room, rocking the child in her arms and crooning to her for fully half an hour. At last the child ceased to wail, and she laid her in her cradle and sat watching, thinking that if she were to lose her baby she must go mad. She had lost Dick's love, and if the baby were taken away there'd be nothing left for her to live for. Nothing left for me to live for, she repeated again and again, till the cold winter's night striking through her nightgown reminded her that she was risking her life, which she had no right to do, for baby needed her. Oh, who would look after poor baby if I were taken away, she asked and shaking with cold, was about to crawl into bed. But on laying her knee on the bedside, she remembered that a little spirit often saved a human life, and going to the chest of drawers, she took out the bottle she had hidden from Dick, and filled a glass. The spirit diffused a grateful warmth through her, and she drank a second glass slowly, thinking of her child and husband, and how good she intended to be to both of them until ideas became broken, and she tumbled into bed, awaking Dick, who was soon asleep again, with Kate by his side, watching a rim of light rising above a dark chimney stack, and wondering what new shows must be preparing. Already the rim of light had become a crescent, and before her eyes closed in sleep, the full moon looked down through the window into the cradle, waking the sleeping child. But her cries were too weak. Her mother lay in sleep, beyond the reach of her wails, heart-breaking though they were. The little blankets were cast aside, and the struggle between life and death began. Soft roundnesses fell into distortions, chubby knees were wrenched to and fro, muscles seemed to be torn. And a few minutes later, little Kate, who had known of this world but a ray of moonlight, died. A glimpse of the moon was all that had been granted to her. After watching for an hour or more, the moon moved up the skies. And in Kate's dream, the moon was the great yellow witch in the pantomime, who before striding her broomstick cries back, Thou art mine only, for ever and for ever. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 the passing of a funeral in our English streets is so common a sight that hearses and plumes and mutes and carriages filled with relatives garbed in crepe have almost ceased to remind us that our dust too is on the way to the graveyard. And it is not until we catch sight of a man walking in the carriageway carrying a brown box under his arm 
that we start like someone suddenly stung and remember the mystery of life and death. Even Dick remembered it and wondered as he plodded after little Kate's coffin why it was that she should have been called out of the void and called back into the void so quickly. Whether our term be but a month or ninety years, life and death beckon us but once, he said. And he fell to envying Kate her tears, tears seeming to him more comforting than thoughts, and he would gladly have shed a few to help the journey away. Not a long one, however, for the Lennoxes lived in an unfrequented part of the town by the cemetery. We shall soon be there, he whispered, and Kate, raising her weeping face, looked round. All the shops were filled with funeral emblems, wreaths of everlasting flowers, headstones with dates in indelible ink, crosses of consolation and kneeling angels. Oh, if we only had money, Kate cried, to buy a monument to put on her grave. And she called upon Dick to admire a kneeling angel. It's very beautiful, Dick said. I wish we had the money to buy it. Poor little Kate. It's a pity she didn't live. She was very like you, dear. He had been offered an engagement for Kate to play the part of the Countess in Olivet, and had accepted it hoping in the meanwhile to be able to persuade her to take it. It was rather hard to ask her to play the day after the funeral, but there was no help for it. The company would arrive in town tomorrow, and Dick thought it would be a pity to let the chance slip. But her grief was so great that he had not dared to speak to her about it. "'Did you ever see so many graves?' she asked. "'We shall never be able to find her when we come to seek the grave out.' an angel a headstone at least would be a help oh dick she continued to think they'll put her down into the ground and that we shall perhaps never even see her grave again we may be a hundred miles away from here to-morrow or after dick who had taken credit of the undertaker looked around uneasily but seeing that kate had not been overheard he said oh, poor little thing it's sad to lose her isn't it i should have liked to have seen her grow up the coffin was first deposited in the middle of the church and dick twisted the brim of his big hat nervously troubled by the service the parson in a white flowing surplice read from the reading desk kate on the contrary appeared much consoled and prayed silently and the parson mumbled so many prayers that Dick began to consider the time it would take to learn a part of equal length. And all this while the little brown box remained like a piece of lost luggage, lonely in the greyness of this station-house-looking church. And when the mutes came to claim it, Kate again burst into tears. Her tears reminded the parson that he was here to console, and in soft and unctuous words he assured the weeping mother that her child had only been removed to a better and brighter world, and that we must all submit to the will of God. But in the porch his attention was drawn from the weeping mother to the weather. Oh, a little more of this, he thought, and others will be doing for me what I am now doing for others. But there being no help for it, he followed the procession through the tombstones, his white surplice blowing dick wondering how the little grave had been found among so many but the sexton knew the parson sprinkled earth upon the coffin and the sound of the withdrawn ropes cut the mother's heart even more than the rattle of the earth and stones on the coffin lid kate threw some flowers into the grave and it seemed to dick certain that if she didn't pull herself together she would not be able to play the countess in olivet on the morrow she was so fearfully haggard and worn that he doubted if any amount of rouge would make her look the part. He would have done anything in the world for his little girl while she was alive, but now that she was dead, besides, after all, she was only a baby. For some time past this idea had occurred to him as an excellent argument to convince Kate that there was really no reason why she should not go to rehearsal on the following morning. If he had not yet spoken in this way, it was only because he was afraid that she would round on him and call him a heartless beast, and he would do anything to evade a sulky look. And now, when the funeral was over, 
and they were walking home, wet, sorrowful and tired. It was curious to watch how he gave his arm to Kate, and the timidity with which he introduced the subject. At first he only spoke of himself, and his hopes of being able to obtain a better part and a higher salary in the new drama. But mention to a mummer who is lying on his deathbed that a new piece is going to be produced, and he will not be able to resist asking a question or two about it. And Kate, weary as she was, at once pricked up her ears and said, Oh, they're going to do a new piece? You didn't tell me that before. Oh, it was only decided last night, replied Dick. The spell was now broken, and when they reached home and had dinner, the conversation was resumed in a strain that might be considered as being almost jovial after the mournful tones of the last few days. Dick felt as if a big weight had been lifted from his mind, and the thought again occurred to him that there was no use in making such a fuss over a baby that was only three weeks old. Kate, too, seemed to be awakening to the conviction that there was no use in grieving for ever. The state of torpor she had been living in, for to stifle remorse she had been drinking heavily on the quiet, now began to wear off, and her brain to uncloud itself, and Dick, surprised at the transformation, could not help exclaiming, "'That's right, Kate. Cheer up, old girl!' A baby three weeks old isn't the same as a grown person. Oh, I know it isn't, but if you only knew, I'm afraid I neglected the poor little thing. Oh, nonsense, replied Dick, for having an eye constantly on the main chance, he wished to avoid any fresh outburst of grief. You looked after it very well indeed. Besides, you'll have another, he added with a smile. "'I want no other,' replied Kate, vexed at being misunderstood, and yet afraid to explain herself more thoroughly. At last Dick said, "'I wish there was a part for you in the new piece.' Oh, "'Yes, so do I. I haven't been doing anything for a long while now.' And thus encouraged, he told her that in the so-and-so company the part of the Countess might be had for the asking. "'Only they play to-morrow night.' "'Oh, to-morrow night? "'Oh, it would be dreadful to act so soon after my poor baby's death, wouldn't it?' Well, "'I can't see why. "'We shall be as sorry for it in a week's time as now, "'and yet one must get to work some time or other.' "'Dick considered this a very telling argument, "'and not wishing to spoil its effect, he remained silent.' so as to give Kate time to digest the truth of what he had said. He waited for her to ask him when he would take her to see the manager, but she said nothing, and he was at last obliged to admit that he had made an appointment for tomorrow. She whined a bit, but accompanied him to the theatre. The manager was delighted with her appearance. He told her that the photo that Dick had forwarded did not do her justice, and handing her the script, he said, "'Now, you must make your entrance from this side. Oh, and what's the cue? Here it is. I think I shall now be to retreat in the direction of home. Oh, I see. And striving to decipher the manuscript, Kate walked towards the middle of the stage. I haven't seen the Duke for twenty-four hours, and that means misery. Oh, you'll get a laugh for that if you turn up your eyes a bit, said Dick and then, turning to the manager, he murmured, "'I wish you'd seen her as Claret. The notices were immense. But I must be off now to my own show.' This engagement relieved the Lennoxes for the time being of their embarrassments. At four they dined, at six bade each other good-bye, and repaired to their respective theatres. Dick was playing in drama, Kate in opera bouffe and something before a quarter to eleven she expected him to meet her at the stage door of the prince's. On this point she was very particular. If he were a few moments late she questioned him minutely as to where he'd been, what he'd been doing, and little by little the jealousies and suspicions which her marriage had appeased returned, and tortured her night and day. At first the approach of pain was manifested by a nervous anxiety for her husband's presence, 
she seemed dissatisfied and restless when he was not with her and after breakfast in the mornings when he took up his hat to go out she would beg of him to stay and find fault with him for leaving her he reasoned with her very softly assuring her that he had the most important engagements on one occasion it was a man who had given him an appointment in order to speak with him concerning a new theatre of which he was to have the entire management another time it was a man who was writing a drama and wanted a collaborator to put the stage construction right and as these seances of collaboration occupied both morning and afternoon kate was thrown entirely on her own resources until four o'clock the first two or three novels she had read during her convalescence had amused her but now one seemed so much like the other that they ended up by boring her and too excited to be able to fix her attention she often read without understanding what she was reading on one side the memory of her baby's death preyed upon her she still could not help thinking that it was owing to her neglect that it had died on the other the thought that her husband was playing her false goaded her to madness sometimes she attempted to follow him but this only resulted in failure and she returned home after a fruitless chase more dejected than ever oh if the baby had not died there would have been something to live for she murmured to herself a thousand times during the day until at last her burden of remorse grew quite unbearable and she thought of the brandy the doctor had ordered her since her engagement to play the countess she had forgotten it but now a strange desire seized her suddenly as if she'd been stung by a snake there was only a little left in the bottle but that little cheered and restored her even more than she had expected her thoughts came to her more fluently she ate a better dinner and acted joyously that night at the theatre oh, there's no doubt she said to herself the doctor was right what i want is a little stimulant of the truth of this she was more than ever convinced when next morning she found herself again suffering from the usual melancholy and dullness of spirits the very sight of breakfast disgusted her and when dick left she wandered about the room unable to interest herself in anything with a yearning in her throat for the tingling sensation that brandy would bring and she longed for yesterday's lightness of conscience but there was neither brandy nor whisky in the house not even a glass of sherry what was to be done she didn't like to ask the landlady to go round to the public house such people were always ready to put a wrong interpretation upon everything but mrs clark knew that the doctor had ordered her to take a little brandy when she felt weak all the same she determined to wait until dinner time half an hour of misery passed and then excited till she could bear with the craving for drink no longer she remembered that it would be very foolish to risk her health for the sake of a prejudice to obey the doctor's orders was her first duty a consoling reflection that relieved her mind of much uncertainty and ringing the bell she prepared her little speech oh mrs clark i'm sorry to trouble you but i'm feeling so weak this morning and if you remember the doctor ordered me to take a little brandy when i felt i wanted it do you happen to have any in the house oh no ma'am i haven't but i can send out for it in a minute and you do look as if you wanted something to pick you up oh yes said kate throwing as much weakness as she could into her voice somehow i've never felt the same since my confinement oh i know well how it pulls one down if you only knew how i suffered with my third baby oh i can well imagine it the conversation then came to a pause and mrs clark not seeing her way to any further family confidences said uh, what shall i send for ma'am half a pint the grocer round the corner keeps some very nice brandy oh yes that will do said kate seeing an unending perspective of drinks in half a pint uh, shall i put that down in the bill or will you give me the money now ma'am this was very awkward for kate suddenly remembered that she had given over her salary to dick this week without keeping anything out of it 
there was no help for it now, and putting as bold a face on it as she could, she told Mrs. Clark to book it. What did it matter whether Dick saw it or not? Had not the doctor told her she required a little stimulant? Henceforth, brandy drinking became an established part of Kate's morning hours. Even before Dick was out of bed, she would invent a pretext for stealing into the next room so that she might have a nip on the sly before breakfast. The bottle and a packet of sweet stuff to take the smell off her mouth were kept behind a large oleograph representing Swiss scenery. The fear that Dick might pop out upon her at any moment often nearly caused her to spill the liquor over the place, but existence was impossible without brandy, and she felt she was bound to get rid of the miserable moods of mind to which she woke. Before eleven o'clock Dick was out of the house, and this left Kate four hours of lonely idleness staring her blankly in the face. Sometimes she practised a little music, but it wearied her. She had courage for nothing now, and brandy and water was the only thing that killed the dreariness that ached in heart and head. Many half-pint bottles had succeeded the first, and ashamed to admit her secret drinking, she now paid the landlady regularly out of her own money. When funds were low, a little bill was run up, and this was produced and talked over when the two women were having a glass together of a morning. To pay these debts, Kate had to resort to lying. All kinds of lies had to be concocted. Her first idea was to tell Dick she intended to continue her music lessons. He would never, she was sure, ask her a question on the subject. But Dick, who was still hard-pressed for money, begged of her to wait until they were better off before incurring new expenses. And annoyed, she fell back on the subject of clothes, and when he asked her if she could not manage to go on with what she had for a bit, it astonished him to see the mad rage into which she fell instantly. Was it not her own money? Had she not earned it? And was he going to rob her of it? Did he only keep her to work for him? If so, she'd very soon put that to rights by chucking up her engagement. Then he'd be forced to keep her. She wasn't going to be bullied. In his usual kind way, Dick tried to calm her, explaining to her their position, telling her of his projects. But the fear of discovery was a fixed thought in her mind, and she refused to listen to reason until he put his hand in his pocket and gave her two pounds ten. This was just the sum required to pay what she owed at the heir arms. And seeing her difficulties removed, her better nature asserted itself. She begged of Dick to forgive her, pleading that she had lost her temper and didn't know what she was saying. For an instant she thought of confessing the truth. Then the idea died in a resolution to amend. It was not worth speaking of. She was getting stronger and would soon need no more stimulants. For two days Kate kept to her promise. Instead of sitting at home, she called on one of the ladies of the theatre and passed a pleasant morning with her. She paid visits to other members of the company and went out shopping with them. But when three or four met at a corner of the street, after a few introductory remarks, a drink was generally proposed. Not as men would propose it, but slyly and with much affectation, and skirting furtively along the streets, a quiet bar would be selected, and then, "'What will you have, dear?' would be whispered softly. "'Oh, a drop of gin, dear.' On one of these occasions, Kate only just escaped getting drunk. As luck would have it, Dick did not return home to dinner, and a good sleep and a bottle of soda water pulled her together, so that she was able to go down to the theatre and play her part without exciting observation." and this decided her not to trust herself again to the temptation of her girlfriends. She asked Dick to allow her to accompany him sometimes. He made a wry face at this proposal, hesitated, and explained that his collaborator suffered no one to interrupt their séances. He was a timid man and couldn't work in the presence of a third person. Kate only sighed, but although she did not attempt to dispute the veracity of this statement, she felt that it was cruel that she should be left alone, hour after hour. But she deceived herself with resolutions and hopes that she would require no more brandy. In her heart of hearts, she knew that she would not be able to resist. 
and docile as the sheep under the butcher's hand, she recognised her fate and accepted it. A fresh bill was run up at the grocer's, and the mornings were passed in a state of torpor. Without getting absolutely drunk, she drank sufficiently to confuse her thoughts, to reduce them to a sort of nebulae, enough to blend and soften the lines of a too hard reality to a long sensation of tickling, in which no idea was precise, no desire remained long enough to grow to a pain, but caressed and passed away. Sometimes, of course, she overdosed herself, but on these occasions, when she found consciousness slipping a little too rapidly from her, she was cunning enough to go and lie down. And living as she did in constant fear of detection, she endowed the simplest words and looks with a double meaning, and she couldn't help hating Dick if he asked her questions or dared to accuse her of being sleepy and heavy about the eyes. Did he intend to insult her? Was that it? If so, she wasn't going to stand it. One day he stood before the oleograph, apparently examining with deep interest the different aspects of the Swiss scenery. In reality his thoughts were far away, but Kate, who did not know this, grew so nervous and angry that it was with difficulty she kept calm. On half a dozen different pretexts she had tried to get him away from the picture, and fearing every moment that he would look behind it or touch it, she caught up a plate from the table and dashed it to the ground. The crash caused Dick to jump around, and she began her tirade, beginning with the question, was she so utterly beneath his notice that he couldn't answer a question? Almost every day a dispute of this sort arose. She was always being poked up by some new fear of discovery, and engendered, if not hatred, a fierce resentment. And to deceive herself as to the true reason, she criticised his conduct and manner of life bitterly and passionately from every point of view. Jealousy was natural to her, and she was more subject than ever to attacks of it. Once or twice it had blazed into flame, but circumstances had quenched it for the time being. Now there was nothing to oppose it, and all things served as fuel. She was conscious of no wrongdoing. She believed, and believed sincerely, that she was acting legitimately in defence of her own interests. She was certain that Dick was deceiving her, and the want of moral courage in the man which forced him to tell lies, lies in which he was sometimes found out, tended to confirm her in this belief. For a few days past she had been preparing for a quarrel, but the time for fight had not yet come, and she chafed under the delay. At last her chance came. He kept her waiting half an hour at the stage door. Where had he been? What had he been doing all this while? were the questions she put to him in many different forms as they walked home. He sought to pacify his wife, assuring her he had been detained by his manager, who wanted to speak with him concerning a new production. He told a long story regarding the arrangement of some of the processions. But Kate would not accept any of these excuses, and convinced he had been after a woman, she stuck to her opinion and the bickering continued for an hour or more, to end as it had begun. These sudden silences were very welcome, for Dick had many things to think out, and nothing more was said until they got up to their room, and then Dick, as usual, forgetful of even the immediate past, began to speak of his manager's intentions regarding a new piece. But he did not get far before he was brought to a sudden standstill by a fresh explosion of wrath. "'What have I done now?' he asked. "'Done? Do you suppose I want to hear about that woman?' "'What woman?' "'Oh, you needn't do the innocent with me.' "'Really, I give you my word.' "'Your word? Oh, a nice thing indeed. "'Well, what do you want me to do?' "'To leave me in peace,' said Kate, breaking the string of her stays. Dick was very tired, and without attempting to argue the point further, undressed and got into bed. In bed the quarrel was resumed. It was continued, and for an hour or more, he lying with his head turned close to the wall, hers dancing over the extreme edge of the pillow. "'Why don't you go away and leave me? I cannot think how you can be so cruel, and to me who gave up everything for you.' 
It was the wail of petulant anger, but as yet she showed no violence, and her temper did not overcome her until her husband, worn out by two hours of unceasing lamentations, begged of her to allow him to go to sleep. Her mood was different in the morning, and it was not until she had paid a couple of visits to the blue Swiss mountains that she became again taciturn. Dick did not as yet suspect his wife of confirmed drunkenness. He merely thought that she had grown lately very ill-tempered, and that a jealous woman was about the most distressing thing in existence, and anxious to avoid another scene, he hurried through his breakfast. She watched him eating in silence, knowing well he was counting the minutes till he could get away. At last she said, "'Will you take me to church to-day?' "'Well, my dear, I'm afraid I've an appointment, but I'll try to come back if I can.' And a few minutes later he slipped away, leaving her to invite the landlady to come up and have a glass with her, if she felt so inclined. But feeling somewhat out of humour for the conversation of that respectable woman, she put on her hat and ran after her husband, determined to watch him. But he was already out of sight, and after roaming aimlessly about for some time she turned into a church and sat through the whole of the service without once attempting to fix her attention on what was going on. Her thoughts were on Dick, but to stand and to kneel was in itself a relief, and when church was over she returned home, after visiting several public houses, slightly boozed. "'Mrs. Clark, has my husband come in?' "'Oh, I haven't heard him, Mrs. Lennox,' was the answer that came up the kitchen stairs. This was unfortunate, for her heart that had been softened towards him tightened into bitterness, and madness was near the thought that at the moment she was patiently waiting dinner for him, he might be in the arms of another woman. She told the landlady, who came upstairs a second time in hope of a sociable glass, that she might bring the soup up. They always had soup on Sundays. If Mr. Lennox didn't choose to come in for his meals, he might go without them. At that moment a ring at the door was heard, and throwing himself in an armchair, Dick said he was tired. Mm, "'I dare say you are. I can easily understand that,' was the curt reply. An expression of pain passed over his face. "'Oh, goodness me, Kate,' he said in a perplexed voice. "'You don't mean to say you are angry still?' No attention was paid to the landlady, who was placing the soup on the table, and she, being pretty well accustomed to their quarrels, said with an air of indifference as she left the room, "'Dinner's served. I shall bring the leg of mutton up when you ring.' No answer was made to her, and the couple sat moodily looking at each other. After a pause, Dick tried to be conciliatory, and in the most affectionate phrases he could select, he besought Kate to make it up. "'I assure you, you're wrong,' he said. I've been after no woman. Oh, do, for goodness sake, make it up. And then approaching her chair, he tried to draw her toward him. But pulling herself away passionately, she exclaimed, Oh, no, no, leave me alone. Leave me alone. Don't touch me. I hate you. This was not encouraging. But at the end of another silence, he attempted to reason with her again. But it was useless and worn and impatient, he begged of her to at least come to dinner. "'If you aren't hungry, I am.' There was no answer. Lying back in her chair, she sulked, deaf to all entreaty. "'Well, if you won't, I will,' he said, seating himself in her place. Her eyes flashed with a dull, lurid light, and walking close to the table, she looked at him steadily, fidgeting as she did so with the knives and glasses. I can't think how you treat me as you do. What have I done to you to deserve it? Nothing. But I shall be revenged, that I will. I can bear it no longer. Oh, bear what? he asked despairingly. Oh, you know well enough. Don't aggravate me. I hate you. Oh, yes, she said, raising her voice. I do hate you. "'Oh, sit down and have some dinner, and don't be so foolish,' he said, trying to be jocular, as he lifted the cover from the soup. "'Eat with you? Never!' she answered theatrically. But the interest he showed in the steaming liquid annoyed her so much 
that overcome by a sudden gust of passion she upset the tureen into his lap dick uttered a scream and in starting back he overturned his chair although not scalding the soup was still hot enough to burn him and he held his thighs dolorously the tablecloth was deluged the hearth-rug steamed and regardless of everything kate rushed past accusing her husband of cruelty of unfaithfulness stopping only to reproach him with a desire to desert her while dick in dripping trousers asked what he had done to deserve having the soup flung over him kate's hair became unloosened and hung down her shoulders like a sheaf of black plumes dick thought of changing his trousers but the intensity of her passion detained him stopping suddenly before the table she poured out a tumbler of sherry and drank it almost at a gulp it was as nauseous to her taste as lukewarm water and she yearned for brandy it would sting her and would awaken the dull ache of her palate and she knew well where the bottle was she could see it in her mind's eye the black neck leaning against the frame of the picture why should she not go and fetch it and insult him with the confession of her sin was it not he who drove her to it so kate thought in her madness and the lack of courage to execute her wishes angered her still further against the fat creature who lay staring at her lying back in the armchair she applied herself again to the sherry and swallowed greedily oh for goodness sake said dick who began to get alarmed don't drink that you'll get drunk well what does it matter if i do it's you who drive me to it if you don't like it go to miss vane oh what you've not finished with that yet haven't i told you twenty times that there's nothing between me and miss vane i haven't spoken to her for the last three days that's a lie shrieked kate you went to meet her this morning i saw you do you take me for a fool but oh i don't know how you can be such a beast if you wanted to desert me why did you ever take me away from hanley but you can go now i don't want the leavings of that creature taken aback by what was nothing more than a random guess dick hesitated and then deciding that he might as well be caught out in two lies as in one he said in a sort of forlorn hope if you saw us you must have seen that she was with jackson and that i didn't do anything more than raise my hat kate made no answer she was too excited to follow out the train of the simplest idea and continued to rave incoherent statements of all kinds the landlady came up to ask when she should bring up the leg of mutton but she went away frightened there was no dinner that day amid screams and violent words the evening died slowly and the room darkened until nothing was seen but the fitful firelight playing on dick's hands but still the vague form of the woman passed through the shadows like a figure of avenging fate would she never grow tired and sit down dick asked himself a thousand times it seemed as if it would never cease and the incessant repetition of the same words and gestures turned in the brain with the mechanical movement of a wheel dimming the sense of reality and producing the obtuse terror of a nightmare but from this state of semi-consciousness he was suddenly awakened by the violent ringing of the bell oh, what do you want can i get you anything kate did not deign to answer him when the landlady appeared she said i want some more sherry i'm dying of thirst you shall not have any more said dick interposing energetically mrs clark i forbid you to bring it up i say she shall replied kate her face twitching with passion i say she shall not then i'll go out and get it oh no i'll see you don't do that said dick getting between her and the door as he did so he turned his back to speak to the landlady and kate taking the opportunity seized a handful of the frizzly hair and almost pulled him to the ground twisting round he took her by the wrist and freed himself but this angered and still further excited her oh you'd better let her have her way the landlady said i won't bring up much and it may put her to sleep dick who at the moment would have given half his life for a little peace nodded his head affirmatively and went back to his chair he did not know what to do 
never had he witnessed so terrible a scene before since three or four days back this quarrel had been working up crescendo and when the landlady brought up the sherry kate seized the decanter and complaining that it was not full resumed her drinking so you see i did get it and i'll get another bottle if i choose you think that i like it well you're mistaken i don't i hate it i only drink it because you told me not because i know that you begrudge it to me you begrudge me every bit that i put into my mouth the very clothes i wear but it was not you who paid for them i earned the money myself and if you think to rob me of what i earn you're mistaken you shan't if you try to do so i shall apply to the magistrate for protection yes and if you dare to lay a hand on me i shall have you locked up yes yes jamie she screamed advancing towards him spilling as she did the glass of wine she held in her hand over her dress i shall have you locked up and i should love to do so because it was you who ruined me who seduced me and i hate you for it she spoke with a fearful volubility and her haranguing echoed in dick's ears with the meaningless sound of a water tap heard splashing on the flagstones of an echoing courtyard sometimes he would get up determined to make one more effort and in his gentlest and most soothing tones would say now look here dear will you listen to me i know you well and i know you're a bit excited if you will believe me but it was no use she didn't seem to hear him indeed it almost seemed as if her ears had become stones her hands were clenched and dragging herself away from him she would resume her tigerish walk sometimes dick wondered at the strength that sustained her and the thrill of joy that he experienced was intense when about two o'clock after eight or ten hours of the terrible punishment he noticed that she seemed to be growing weary that her cries were becoming less articulate several times she had stopped to rest her head sank on her bosom and every effort she made to rouse herself was feebler than the preceding one at length her legs gave way under her and she slipped insensible to the floor dick watched for a time afraid to touch her lest by some horrible mischance she should wake up and recommence the terrible scene that had just been concluded and at least half an hour elapsed before he could muster up courage to undress her and put her to bed chapter twenty five next morning kate was duly repentant and begged dick to forgive her for all she had said and done she told him that she loved him better than anything in the world and she persuaded him that if she had taken a drop too much it was owing to jealousy and not to any liking for the drink itself dick adopted the theory willingly every man is reluctant to believe that his wife is a drunkard and deceived by the credulity with which he had accepted the excuse kate resolved to conquer her jealousy and if she could not conquer it she would endure it never would she seek escape from it through spirit again and had she remained in manchester or had she even been placed in surroundings that would have rendered the existence of a fixed set of principles possible she might have cured herself of her vice but before two months her engagement at the prince's came to an end and dick's at the royal very soon followed they then passed into other companies the first of which dealt with shakespearean revivals dick played don john successfully in much ado about nothing the ghost in hamlet the friar in romeo and juliet kate on her side represented with a fair amount of success a series of second parts such as rosalind in romeo bianca in othello sweet anne page in the merry wives it is true there were times when her behaviour was not all that could be desired sometimes from jealousy sometimes from drink generally from a mixture of the two but on the whole she managed very cleverly and it was not more than whispered and always with a good-natured giggle that mrs lennox was not averse to a glass from the shakespearean they went to join a dramatic company where houses were blown up and ships sank amid thunder and lightning dick played a desperate villain and kate a virtuous parlour-maid 
until one night, having surprised him in the act of kissing the manager's wife, she ran off to the nearest pub and did not return until she was horribly intoxicated and staggered onto the stage, calling him the vilest names, accusing him at the same time of adultery and pointing out the manager's wife as his paramour. There were shrieks and hysterics, and Dick had great difficulty in proving his innocence to the angry impresario. He spoke of his honour and a duel, but as the lady in question was starring, the benefit of the doubt had to be granted her, and on these grounds the matter was hushed up. But after so disgraceful a scandal, it was impossible for the Lennoxes to remain in the company. Dick was very much cut up about it, and without even claiming his week's salary, he and his wife packed up their baskets and boxes and returned to Manchester and there he entered into a quantity of speculations, of the character of which she had not the least idea. All she knew was that she never saw him from one end of the day to the other. He was out of the place at ten o'clock in the morning, and never returned before twelve at night. These hours of idleness and solitude were hard to bear, and Kate begged of Dick to get her an engagement but he was afraid of another shameful scene, and always gave her the same answer, that he had as yet heard of nothing, but as soon as he did he would let her know. She didn't believe him, but she had to submit, for she could never muster up courage to go and look for anything herself, and the long summer days passed wearily in reading the accounts of the new companies and the new pieces produced. This sedentary life, and the effects of the brandy, which she could now no longer do without, soon began to tell upon her health, and the rich olive complexion began to fade to sickly yellow. Even Dick noticed that she was not looking well. He said she required a change of air, and a few days after he burst into the room and told her gaily that he had just arranged a tour to go round the coast of England and play little comic sketches and operettas at the pier theatres. This was good news, and the next few days were fully occupied in trying over music, making up their wardrobes, and telegraphing to London for the different books from which they would make their selections. A young man whom Dick had heard singing in a public house proved a great hit. He wrote his own words, some of which were considered so funny that at Scarborough and Brighton he frequently received a couple of guineas for singing a few songs at private houses after the public entertainment. Afterwards he appeared at the pavilion and for many years supplied the axioms and aphorisms that young Toothpick and Crutch was in the habit of using to garnish the baldness of his native speech. For a time the sea proved very beneficial to Kate's health, but the never-ending surprises and expectations she was exposed to, finished by so straining and sharpening her nerves, that the stupors, the assuagements of drink, became, as it were, a necessary make-weight. Her love for Dick pressed upon and agonised her. It was like a dagger whose steel was being slowly reddened in the flames of brandy, and in this subtilization of the brain the remotest particles of pain detached themselves until life seemed to her nothing but a burning and unbearable frenzy. She didn't know what she wanted of him, but with a longing that was nearly madness she desired to possess him wholly. She yearned to bury her poor aching body, throbbing with the anguish of nerves, in that peaceful hulk of fat so calm, so invulnerable to pain, marching amid and contented in its sensualities as a gainly bull grazing amid the pastures of a succulent meadow. He was never unkind to her. The soft, sleek manner that had won her remained ever the same, but she would have preferred a blow. It would have been something to have felt the strength of his hand upon her. She wanted an emotion. She longed to be brutalised. She knew when she tortured him with reproaches she was alienating from herself any affection he might still bear for her, but she found it impossible to restrain herself. There seemed to be a devil within her that goaded her until all power of will ceased, and against her will she had to obey its behests. A blow might exorcise this spirit. Were he to strike her to the ground, she thought she might still be saved. But alas, he remained as kind and good-natured as ever, 
and to disguise her drunkenness she had to exaggerate her jealousy. The two were now mingled so thoroughly in her head that she could scarcely distinguish one from the other. She knew there were women all around him. She could see them ogling him out of the little boxes at the side of the stage. How they could be such beasts she couldn't conceive. They stood for hours behind the scenes waiting for him, and she was told they had come for engagements. Baskets of food, pork pies and tongue came for him, but these she pitched out of the window, and she soundly boxed the ears of one little wretch whom she found loitering about the stage door. Kate was right sometimes in her suspicions, sometimes wrong, but in every case they accentuated the neurosis occasioned by alcohol from which she was suffering. Still, by some extraordinary cunning, she contrived for some time to regulate her drinking so that it should not interfere with business, and on the rare occasions when Dick had to apologise to the public for her non-appearance, she insisted that it was not her fault, and from a mixture of vanity and a wish to conceal his wife's shame from himself, Dick continued to persuade himself that his wife had no real taste for drink, and never touched it except when these infernal fits of jealousy were upon her. But the words that had come into his mind, except when these infernal fits of jealousy are upon her, called up many vivid memories. One especially confounded him. He had seen her frightened to cross the dressing-room, lest she might fall, glancing from the table to the chair calculating the distance. It was on his lips to ask her if she didn't feel too ill to appear that day, that perhaps it would be better for him to go before the curtain and apologise to the public. But he had not dared to say anything, and to his astonishment she was able to overcome the influence of the drink, if she had taken any, and he had never heard her sing and dance better. How she had managed it he did not know. All the same, he said, drink will get the upper hand of her, and conquer her if she doesn't make up her mind to conquer it. The day will come when she will not be able to go on the stage, or will go on and fall down. Dick shut his eyes to exclude from them the horrible spectacle. She would then be an unmitigated burden on his hands. Not a pleasant prospect, he said to himself. He had now been in the provinces for some years, and had lived down the memory of many disastrous managements. He had managed the tour of the Morton and Cox's Opera Company very successfully, till the crash came. But it will be the success that will be remembered, and not the crash, when I return to London. Many changes must have happened in town, many new faces and many old faces that absence will make new again. If only Kate were not so jealous. If I could cure her of jealousy, I could cure her of drink. And he thought of all the notices she had had for Claret, for Serpolet, for Olivet. He would like to see her play the Duchess. At that moment his thoughts returned to the last time he had seen her, about half an hour ago. The memory was not a pleasant one, and he was glad that he had run out of the house and come down to the pier. And in the silence and solitude of the pier at midday, he asked himself again why he should not return to town and take his chance of getting into a new company or being sent out to manage another provincial tour. In London, he might be able to persuade his wife to go into a home, and he fell to thinking of the men and women who he had heard had been cured of drunkenness. His thoughts melted into dreams, and then... Suddenly passing out of dreams into words, he said, She will never consent to go into a home, and if she did, she would only be thinking all the time that I'd put her there so that I might be after another woman. His thoughts were interrupted by a lancinating pain in his feet, and he withdrew into the shade, and resting the heel of the right boot on the toe of the left, a position that freed him from pain for the time being, he looked around and seeing everywhere a misted sky filled with an inner radiance, he said, oh, "'Today will be the hottest day we've had yet, and there won't be a dozen people in the theatre. Everybody will be too hot to leave their houses.' There was languor in the incoming wave. 
we shan't have five pounds in the theatre he muttered to himself and catching sight of one of the directors he continued and those fellows won't think of the heat but we'll put down the falling off in the audience to our performance never he added after a pause have i seen the pier so empty and he wondered who the woman was coming towards him a tall gaunt woman of about forty-five whose striding gait caused a hooped and pleated skirt of green silk surmounted by a bustle to sway like a lime tree in a breeze wore a bodice open in front with short sleeves the fag end of some other fashion but the long draggled tailed feather boa belonged to the eighties as did the mary stuart bonnet her blackened eyebrows and a thickly painted face attracted dick's attention from afar and when she approached nearer he was struck by the dark brilliant restless eyes a strange and exalted being he said to himself an authoress perhaps for he noticed that she carried some papers in her hand mm, or a poet he added and prompted by his instinct he began to see in her somebody that might be turned to account and before long he was thinking how he might introduce himself to her she's forgotten her parasol i might borrow one for her from the girl at the bar and the project seeming good to him he rose and with a specially large movement of the arm lifted his hat from his head you will excuse me i hope madam addressing you and if i do so it's because i am in an official capacity here but may i offer you a parasol oh it's very kind of you she replied with a smile that lighted up her large mouth dispersing its ugliness she's got a fine set of teeth dick said to himself and he answered that he would borrow a parasol for her in the theatre it's very kind of you she returned smiling largely and becomingly upon him it's true i forgot to bring a parasol with me and the sun is very fierce at this time it will be kind of you and much gratified that his proposal had been so graciously received he hobbled away in the direction of the theatre to return a few moments after with the bar girl's parasol which he had borrowed and which he opened and handed to the lady might i ask she said if you are one of the directors of the theatre no he answered i am an actor an actor in this theatre she replied but they only sing trivial songs and dance in this theatre and you look to me like one of shakespeare's imaginations henry the eighth almost any one of the henry's king john not romeo dick interposed oh, perhaps not romeo romeo was but sixteen or seventeen eighteen at the most but when you were eighteen oh yes dick answered i was thin enough then oh but you must not disparage yourself heroes are not always thin hamlet was fat and scant of breath i can see you as hamlet whereas to cast you for falstaff would be too obvious i've played falstaff dick replied but i never could do much with the part i never saw any one who could the lines are very often too highfalutin for the character and they don't seem to come out no matter who plays it the critics look on it as the best acting part but in truth it's the worst macduff would fit you no lear the lady cried dick thought he would like to have a shot at the king and they were soon talking about a shakespearean theatre devoted to the performance of shakespearean plays a theatre she said that would devote itself to the representation of all the heroes in the world those who spoke noble thoughts and performed noble deeds thought and deed encompassing each other instead of which we have a thousand theatres devoted to the representations of the fashions of the moment so i am forced to come here at midday for at midday there is solitude and sacred silence or else the clashing of waves here at midday i can fancy myself alone with my heroes and who are your heroes may i ask said dick 
oh, many are in shakespeare she answered and many are here in this manuscript the heroes of the ancient world when men were nearer to the gods than they are now for men she added in my belief are not moving towards the godhead but away from it and who are the heroes that you've written about dick asked and fearing she would enter into too long an explanation he asked if the manuscript she held in her hand was a play no a poem she answered i'm studying it for recitation one i'm going to recite after my lecture at the working men's club and the subject of my lecture is the inherent nobility of man and the necessity of man worship women have turned from men and are occupied now with their own aspirations losing sight thereby of the ideal that god gave them my poem is a sort of abstract an epitome a compendium of the lecture itself dick did not understand but the fact that a lady was going in for recitation argued that she was interested in theatricals and with his ears pricked like a hound who has got wind of something he said with a sweet smile that showed a whole row of white teeth being an actor myself i will take the liberty of asking you to allow me to look at your poem and perhaps if you're studying for recitation i may be of use to you of the very greatest use the lady answered and handed him her manuscript one of a set of classical cartoons she added oh, humanity in large lines he replied how quickly you understand she rapped out removed altogether from the tea-table in subject and in metre what have you got to say my hero to me about my rendering of these lines the offspring of neptune and terror daughters of earth and ocean dowered with fair faces of woman capping the bodies of vultures armed with sharp keen talons crushing and rending and slaying blackening and blasting defiling spoiling the meats of all banquets plundering perplexing pursuing cursing the lives of our heroes ever the harpier flourish just as a triumph of evil oh hardly anything and yet if i may venture a criticism would you mind passing your manuscript on to me for a moment may i suggest an emendation that will render the recitation more easy and more effective oh certainly you may then dick continued i would drop the words just as a triumph of evil and run on flourish from childhood ensnaring the noble the brave and the loyal spreading their nets for destruction harpie flourish in ballrooms breathing fierce breath that is poison over the promise of manhood over the faith and the love light that glows in the hearts of our bravest for all of their kind that is weaker all that follows dick added will be recited without emphasis until you come to these two magnificent lines harpie stand by our altars harpie sit by our hearthstones harpie suckle our children harpie ravish our nation etc dick finished with a grand gesture i think you're right yes i understand that a point can be given to these verses that i had not thought of before i hope my poem touched a chord in your heart do you approve of my manner of writing the hexameters oh i think the idea very fine but um but if you will permit me oh, certainly well there are questions of elocution that i would like to speak to you about i've to run away now but we're sure to meet again i'm on the pier every day at noon or you'll find me in my hotel at five i hope you'll come for i should like to avail myself of your instruction oh thank you i hope to have the pleasure of calling upon you to-morrow afternoon good-bye you don't know my name she cried after him oh, heroes are full of forgetfulness and naturally 
but in this tea-table world we can't get on without names and addresses will you take my card dick took the card thanked her and turned suddenly away like a man filled with disquiet the lady said and she watched the burly actor hurrying up the pier is this woman coming to meet him she asked herself as dick hurried away still faster for in the distance the woman coming down the pier seemed to him like his wife and if kate had caught him talking to a woman on the pier all chance of doing any business with his new acquaintance would be at an end but the woman who had just passed him by was not kate and the thought crossed his mind that he might return to his new acquaintance with safety but on the whole it seemed to him better to wait until to-morrow to-morrow he would find out all about her her name he said and taking the card out of his pocket he read mrs forrest mother superior of the yarmouth convent alexandra hotel hastings mother superior of a convent i should never have thought it but if she is a nun why isn't she in a habit classical cartoons and nunneries i think this time i've hit upon a strange specimen one of the strangest i've ever met which is saying a great deal for i've met with a good few in my time it'll be better to tear up her card for if kate should find it and then dismissing mrs forrest from his mind he wondered if he should find kate drunk or sober quite sober he said to himself as soon as he crossed the threshold and in the best of humours his wife greeted him and taking his arm they went down to the pier and gave an entertainment that was appreciated by a fairly large audience hmm, why didn't she ask me to come to her at five to-day he asked himself as he returned home with his wife she may fall through my fingers and he would have gone straight away to mrs forrest if he had been able to rid himself of kate you'll take me out to tea dick she said and to keep her sober he took her to tea for the nonce kate drunk would have suited him better than kate sober and he dared not go down to the pier next morning in search of mrs forrest it being more than likely that kate might take it into her head to sun herself on the pier so he decided to wait the pier was too dangerous if he weren't interrupted by kate the directors might see them together and they might know mrs forrest and tell her that he was a married man no he'd just keep his appointment with her at five but to get rid of kate required a deep plan it was laid and succeeded and at five he arrived at the alexandra hotel is mrs forrest in the hall porter told the page boy to take mr lennox up to mrs forrest's rooms mm, all this smells money dick said to himself in the lift the page boy threw open the door and after walking through a long corridor the boy knocked at a door and dick walked into a red twilight in which he caught sight of a green dress in a distant corner i hope you're not one of those people who require the glare of the sun always i like the sun in its proper place out of doors and while thinking an appropriate answer dick strove to find his way through the numerous pieces of furniture littered over the carpet come and sit on the sofa beside me oh if you'll allow me he answered i will sit in this armchair i shall be able to devote myself more completely to the hearing of your poem it was not polite to refuse to sit beside the lady but dick contrived to convey that her presence would trouble his intellectual enjoyment and the slight displeasure which the refusal had caused vanished out of the painted face this first success almost succeeded in screwing up dick's courage to the point of asking her if he might remove the flower vase that stood on the cabinet behind him but he did not dare and at every moment he seemed to recognise a new scent an odour of burning pastilles drifted from a distant corner into a zone of patchouli in which the lady seemed to have encircled herself and which her every movement seemed to spread in more and more violent flavours till dick began to think he wouldn't be able to hold out till the end of the lady's narrative patchouli always gave him a headache but the word opera restored him to himself and with lips quivering like a cat watching a sparrow 
he heard that the subject of her opera was derived from her own life and telling him that it could not be understood without a relation of the events that had given it birth she drew her legs up on the sofa and leaning her head against the back commenced in a low cooing but not disagreeable voice to tell of her first love adventure i might almost call my departure for bulgaria some ten years ago a spiritual adventure she said the departure for bulgaria seemed full of interest but from dick's point of view the leading up to the departure was unduly prolonged and he found it difficult to listen with any show of interest to mrs forrest's assurances that until she met the bulgarian she had thought that babies were found in parsley beds or under gooseberry bushes and this innocence of mind was so inherent in her that the bulgarian had not succeeded altogether in robbing her of it nor indeed did he ever attempt to do so she continued our friendship was founded purely on the intellect this admission was a disappointment to dick who had looked forward to the story of a novel love adventure which might easily be worked into a comic opera bulgaria offering a suitable background with many pretty smiles he tried to lead the lady into the real story of her past but mrs forrest insisted so well that he was fain to believe that there had been no past in her life suitable to a comic opera her bulgarian adventure had been animated by love of liberty and a noble desire to free an oppressed race from the ignoble rule of the turks massacres she said full of nameless horrors dick would have liked her to name these horrors but before he could ask her to do so she was telling him of the instinct in every woman to mother something the bulgarians had appealed to her sympathies and she had helped to bring about their liberation by her poetry in three years she had learnt the language and had composed two volumes of poems in it i've looked out copies of my bulgarian poems for you and she leaned over the edge of the sofa towards a small table the movement disarranged her skirt and dick's eyes were regaled by the show of a thick shapeless leg doubtless swarthy he said to himself the title of the first volume she said handing him the books is songs of a stranger my friend the bulgarian and she mentioned an unpronounceable name contributed a preface the second volume is entitled new songs by the stranger you will find a translation appended to each dick promised that he would read the poems as soon as he got home and begged mrs forrest to proceed with her interesting story of the war in which she had lost her great friend her spiritual adventure as she called him from bulgaria she had set forth on a long journey visiting many parts of china returning home full of love for eastern civilization and regret that western influence would soon make an end of it but she said when i think of my own life my narrative seems but a faint echo of it all only a fragment of it appears whereas if i could tell the whole of it but dick inclined to the belief that her genius was dramatic rather than narrative and to bring the autobiography to an end he asked her how she had come to be the mother superior of the yarmouth convent if i can only get her to cut the cackle and get to the osses he said to himself but this was not easy to do mrs forrest had to relate her socialistic adventures her engagement to edgar horsley for three years she said i was engaged to him and at the end of this time it seemed to me that we must come to an understanding he was talking of going to jamaica and to go to jamaica with him we would have to be married so i went down to where he was staying in the country a cottage in somersetshire at the end of a very pretty lane oh, good god if she's going to describe the landscape to me said dick to himself but mrs forrest had no eye for the appearance of trees showing against the sky and she was quickly at the cottage door which was opened to her she said by a suspicious-looking woman who said i think i've heard of you 
Mr. Horsley is out, but you can come in and wait. And in about half an hour he came in and introduced me to the woman who had opened the door to me. Isabel is all that I can remember of her name. Isabel, he said, has been living with me for the last ten years, but if you like to come with us to Jamaica you can join us. This seemed to me an inacceptable proposition. "'What you propose to me,' I said, "'is unthinkable, and I left the house "'and have not seen or heard of Mr. Edgar Horsley since. "'I've looked at water, I've looked at poison, "'and I've looked at daggers.' "'Dick asked her why she had meditated suicide, "'and she answered, "'Oh, was not such an end to a three years' engagement "'sufficient to inspire in any woman a thought of suicide?' and I'm very exceptional. A great deal of Mrs. Forrest's life had been unfolded. The only thing that remained in obscurity was how she had come to be the mother superior of the Yarmouth convent, and to make that plain she said it would be necessary to tell the story of her conversion to the Catholic faith. Oh, but that was after the convent. The convent was intended for the reformation of dipsomaniacs, female drunkards, she said. But it was afterwards that I became a Roman Catholic. Dick had no wish to hear what dogma it was that had tempted her, but it amused him as he returned home to think of all the strange things that Mrs. Forrest had told him. One thing especially amused him that her real interest in Catholicism was the confessional. "'How one does get back to oneself in all these things,' he muttered, as he panted up the hot, steep road. "'A convent for the reformation of female drunkards,' he repeated. "'It's very strange. She can't know anything about my wife. "'A strange woman,' he continued, and fell to thinking if all she had told him was the truth, or if it was one of those stories that people imagine about themselves, and imagine so vividly that after a few years they begin to believe that everything they have told has befallen them. He pulled the books from his pocket. They were evidently written in a strange language, but there were people who could learn languages and could do nothing else. Her Bulgarian poetry could not be better than her English, and he knew what that was like. I suppose as soon as she hears I'm married, and she's sure to find out sooner or later, she'll be off on some other back. But is this altogether sure? He had not walked many steps before he remembered that the lecture she was giving at the working men's club was on the chastity of the marriage state. Moreover, she had admitted to him that the Bulgarian adventure was a spiritual one. I should say she was a woman with a big temperament, which must have been worth gratifying when she went away with that Bulgarian. I wouldn't have minded being in his skin. She hasn't forgotten that she was once a beautiful girl. That's the worst of it. She hasn't forgotten and Dick remembered that at parting she was a little demonstrative, saying to him on the staircase, "'But we aren't parting for long. You will be here to-morrow at my door at the same hour.'" Chapter 26 The appointment was for five o'clock, and Kate would have liked to remain on the pier with Dick enjoying the summer evening but he seemed so intent on returning to their lodging that she did not like to oppose his wishes, and she allowed herself to be led all the way up the dusty town to their close, hot rooms that she might try over Fredegonde's music. That he should wish to hear her voice again in this music flattered her, but she rose from the piano, her face aflame, when he began to mention an appointment. "'It's too bad of you, Dick, to bring me home and then remember an appointment.' Dick overflowed with mellifluous excuses which did not seem to allay Kate's anger, and as he hurried down the street it occurred to him that he might have thought of a better reason than Fredegonde for bringing her home. However this might be, his thoughts were now with Montgomery and Mrs. Forrest rather than with Kate and it was not till he drew the latch-key from his pocket that Kate's singing of the waltz returned to him. 
he ascended the stairs singing it i think it will work out all right what will work out all right you're an hour later than you said you'd be oh never mind about the hour he answered and began to weave a story about his meeting with a pal from london as he was leaving the pier the other day he hadn't spoken to her about it before not caring to do so until something definite had happened what has happened kate asked and dick his face aglow related how the pal had spoken of a great revival of interest in comic opera especially in french music and that many city men with plenty of money were on the lookout for somebody who knew how to produce this class of work and was in sympathy with the folly's dramatique tradition kate who believed everything that dick told her listened with a heightened temperature at margate the admirer of herve's music became an american who wished to see gilles perique throne d'ecosse le petit faust l'oeil crevé and marguerite de navarre reproduced as they had been produced under the composer's direction when dick was stage manager at that theatre the american was interested in herve for he not only wrote the music but also the words of his operas herve was therefore the wagner of light comic opera and if the new venture received sufficient support from the public dick would like to add other works by herve la belle poule l'osade percute and having puzzled kate with many titles and an imaginary biography of this musical american he fell to telling her of blanche d'antigny singing all the little tunes he could remember and branching off into an account of le canard à Toibec. this last opera was not by herve but the american liked it and might be persuaded to produce it later on it contained a part he said in which kate would succeed in establishing herself one of london's favourites but his praise of her singing and acting set her wondering if he were gulling her once more or if he still believed in her it might be that her continued sobriety had reawakened his old love for her and she remembered suddenly that she had never really cared for drink and never would have touched drink if dick hadn't driven her mad with jealousy and the fact that her voice had returned to her helped her to believe that dick was sincere when he told her that she would be a better fredegong than blanche d'antigny who created the part originally montgomery endorsed this view one evening he refused to take no for an answer she must sing the score through with him and several times he stopped playing and looking up into her face he told her he had never known a voice to improve so rapidly and so suddenly dick nodded his acquiescence in montgomery's opinion and hoped there would be no more need to tell kate lies once she was settled in a lodging behind the cattle market but in this he was mistaken for in london the need to keep up the fiction of herve's american admirer was more necessary than at margate dick had to relate his different quests every evening he had been after the lyceum but was unable to get an answer from the lessee he hoped to get one next week and when next week came he spoke about the royalty and the adelphi and the haymarket neglecting however to mention the theatre in which he hoped to produce laura's opera the large stage of the lyceum would be excellently well suited he said for a fine production of gilles perique and he besought kate to apply herself to the study of the part of fredegonde his imagination led him into dreams of an english company going over to paris with all herve's works and kate obliterating the blanche d'antigny tradition kate listened delighted discovering in dick's praise of her singing a hope that his love of her had survived the many tribulations it had been through and while listening she vowed she would never touch drink again nor did her happiness vanish till morning till she saw him struggling into his greatcoat and foresaw the long dividing hours but he had said so many kind things overnight that she was behoven to stifle complaint and bore with her loneliness all day long refusing food for without dick's presence food had no pleasure for her however hungry she might be 
she would wait contented hour after hour if she could have him to herself when he returned but sometimes he would bring back a friend with him and the pair would sit up talking of women and their aptitudes in different parts as none of them were known personally to kate the names they mentioned suggested only new causes for jealousy and the thought that dick was living among all these women while she was hidden away in this lodging from night till morning from morning till night maddened her it seemed to her that having been out all day dick might at least reserve his evenings for her and one night she showed the man he had brought back to supper plainly that his absence would so far as she was concerned have been preferable to his company i wouldn't have come back he said only dick insisted and interrupting his regrets that she did not like him she said it isn't that i don't like you but you're used to women who aren't in love with their husbands and i'm in love with mine the friend repeated kate's words to dick who said he hadn't a moment till the cast of the new piece was settled and a few nights later he brought back some music which he said he would like her to try over but it's manuscript dick why don't you bring home the printed score the lie that came to his lips was that the score of trone d'ecosse had never been printed and this seeming to her very unlikely she said she didn't care whether it had or hadn't but was tired of living in islington and would like to see something of the london of which she had heard so much i've been in london all my life dick said and i haven't been to the tower or to st paul's however dear if you'd like to see them we'll visit all these places together as soon as chilperic is produced with this promise he consoled her in a measure and she watched dick depart and then took up a novel and read it till she could read no longer she then went out for a little walk but soon returned finding it wearisome to be always asking the way so forlorn and lost did she seem that even the fat landlady the mother of the ten children who clattered about the head of the kitchen staircase took pity upon her and told her the number of the bus that would bring her to the british museum assuring her that she would find a great deal there to distract her attention it did not matter to her where she went if dick wasn't with her without dick all places were the same to her and the british museum would do as well as any other place she must go somewhere and the british museum would do as well as the tower or st paul's there were things to be seen and she didn't mind what she saw as long as she saw something new she couldn't look any longer at the two pictures on the walls with the stream and against the stream the wax fruit the mahogany sideboard the dingy furniture and the torn curtains and of all she must get out of hearing of the children and the surly landlady who a few minutes ago was less surly and had told her of the british museum and all the wonderful things that were to be seen there but she hadn't the bus fare and didn't like to ask the landlady for a few pence as long as she hadn't any money she was out of temptation and it was by her own wish that dick had left her without money as she walked to and fro she caught sight of his clothes thrown over the back of a chair in the bedroom and he might have left a few pence in one of his pockets she searched the trousers how careless dick was several shillings one two three four five five and sixpence she'd take sixpence as she walked out of the bedroom clinking the coppers the desire to read his letters fell upon her and yielding to it she put her hand into the inside pocket of his coat and drew from it a packet of letters and some papers manuscripts and poems now who she asked can have been sending him these classical cartoons number four she read of heroes the glory of manhood collected along the shores of the terrible river that guards the dominions of pluto she knew nothing of pluto but recognised the handwriting as a woman's and the lines zeus the monarch of heaven clothed in the form of a mortal kneeling caressed and caressing drank from her lips joy and love draughts caused kate to dash the manuscript from her a letter accompanied the poem and read my dear nothing can be done without you 
and if you don't come at once we shall miss getting a theatre this season and without a theatre we are helpless kate did not need to read any more the letter left no doubt that dick was engaged in an intrigue with a woman who had written some play or opera which he was going to produce and the envelope out of which she had taken the letter bore the direction richard lennox esq post restant margate so it was lies all the while at margate she said to herself walking about the room stopping now and again to stare at some object which she did not see there was no american no chilperic no trone dacos no loy crevet no la belle poule no marguerite de navarre lies lies nothing but lies he never intended to produce one of them or that i should play fredigon lies lies and the great part in le canard à Trois-Bec, which would establish my reputation in london lies he never intended to produce one of these operas she cried he shut me up here in this lodging so that i should be out of the way while he carried on with what's her name her brain at that instant seemed to catch fire and snatching up some money from the mantelpiece she rushed out of the house tumbling over the children as she made her way to the front door without hat or jacket the sunlight awoke her and she looked around puzzled and only just escaped being run over by a passing cart in front of her was a public house drink she went in and drank till she recovered her reason and began to lose it again a bottle of gin please she said and put the money on the counter and returned to her lodging almost mad with jealousy and rage and thirst for revenge no she wouldn't drink any more for if she were to drink any more she'd not be able to have it out with dick and this time she would have it out with him and no mistake if he were to kill her it didn't matter but she would have it out with him as she sat by the table waiting hour after hour for him to return her whole mind was expressed by the words i'll have it out with him and she didn't weary of repeating them for it seemed to her that they kept her resolution from dying what she feared most was that his presence might quell her resolution to have it out with him as she was minded she mustn't be drunk nor yet too sober he might bring home a friend with him but that wouldn't stay her hand montgomery too had deceived her dick was rehearsing his opera he had written music for that mrs forrest and this was the end of their friendship many hours went by but they didn't seem long passion gave her patience at last a sound of footsteps caused her to start to her feet it was dick this is going to be an all-night affair he said to himself as soon as he crossed the threshold i hope you didn't wait supper for me his manner was most conciliatory and perhaps it was that conciliatory manner that inflamed her business i suppose i know dem well what your business was i know all about it you and your woman mrs forrest the theatre she's taken for you where you were rehearsing montgomery's opera you cannot deny it she cried mrs forrest is her name and reading in his face certain signs of his culpability her anger increased her teeth were set and her eyes glared dick feared she was going mad and with an instinctive movement he put out his arms to restrain her don't touch me don't touch me she screamed and struck at him with clenched fists and then feeling that her blows were but puny she went for him like a bird of prey all her fingers distended take that and that and that you beast oh, you beast you beast you beast her shrieks rang through the house as she pursued him round the furniture he retreating like a lumbering bull striving to escape from her claws how do you like that she cried as she tore at him with her nails again that'll teach you to go messing about after other women i'll settle you before i've done with you chairs were thrown down the coal scuttle was upset and at last as dick tried to get out of the room kate stumbled against a rosewood cabinet sending one of the green vases with its glass shade crashing to the ground summoning the landlady 
Dick spoke about his wife having had a fit. Mm, fit or no fit, I hope you'll leave my house tomorrow. Meanwhile, Dick answered, will you leave my room? And he shut the door in the face of the indignant householder. Kate, who had now recovered herself a little, poured out a large glass of raw gin, and to her surprise Dick made no attempt to prevent her drinking it. As soon as she drinks herself helpless, the better, he thought, as he went into the bedroom to attend to his wounds. The scratches she had given him before their marriage were nothing to these. One side of his nose was well-nigh ripped open, and there were two big, deep gashes running right across his face, from the cheekbone to his ear. It was very lucky, he thought, she hadn't had his eye out, and it might be as well to go round to the apothecaries and get some Vaseline, some antiseptic treatment, for her nails are poisonous, he added, and his eyes going round the room caught sight of his clothes in disorder. Ah, oh, she's been at my clothes, and he took up the classical cartoons and his letters, and put them away into his pocket, and went into the sitting-room, and tried to explain to his wife that he was going out to see if he could get something from the apothecary to heal the wounds she'd given him. Kate did not answer. "'She's dead drunk,' he said, and it seemed to him that he couldn't do better than to undress her and put her into bed, and when he had done this he lay down upon a sofa, hoping that he would wake first and be able to get out of the house without disturbing her leaving word with the landlady that he would come back as soon as his rehearsal was over and make arrangements to leave her house since she didn't wish them to stay any longer he fell asleep thinking that he might find his landlady in a different mood and might persuade her in the morning to allow them to stay on the vase of course should be paid for there was a kindly look in her pleasant country face when she wasn't angry his torn face might win her pity and not wishing to increase his troubles, she would probably allow them to stay on. If she didn't, he'd have to find another lodging that very afternoon, which would be unfortunate, for his engagements were many. As it was, he'd have to hasten to keep an appointment which he'd made with Mrs. Forrest in the National Gallery. She really will have to make some alterations in her second act, he said, going to the glass. Kate had clawed him with a vengeance, and he'd have to tell Laura how he came by his torn face. And after some consideration, it seemed to him that it would be well to admit that he had received these wounds in a conflict with a wife who was unfortunately given to drink. It was on these thoughts he fell asleep, and overslept himself, he feared. But Kate was still asleep, and without awakening her, he stole downstairs to visit the landlady in her parlour, but hearing his step she bounced out of the room, with a view, no doubt, to repeating the warning she'd given him overnight. But the sight of his torn face brought pity into hers, and she said, "'Oh, Mr. Lennox, I'm so sorry for you!' A little sympathetic conversation followed, and Dick went off to meet Laura, whom he recognised in the woman who leaned over the railings between the pillars, seemingly attracted by the view across Trafalgar Square. She still wore her green silk dress, the one he had first seen her in on the pier at Hastings, and the long, draggled feather boa. "'She doesn't spend money on dress,' he thought, as he lifted his hat, with not quite the same ceremonious gesture as usual, for he didn't wish to exhibit his scars yet. "'So here you are, Dick, and I waiting for you on the steps of this gallery, glorious with all the imaginations of the heroes.' "'She hasn't seen the scratches yet,' he said to himself, and turned from the light instinctively, preferring that she should make the discovery indoors rather than out of doors. His wounds would appear less in the gallery than in the open air." Why didn't she take a little more trouble with her make-up? he asked himself, and then reproved himself for describing it as a make-up. She's not made up, he said to himself. She's painted. And he wondered how it was that she could plaster her dark skin so flagrantly with carmine, and put her eyebrows so high up in the forehead. Yet the face, he said, is a finely moulded one, and compelling when she forgets her cosmetics. 
and while dick regretted that she didn't show more skill with these he heard her telling him that she would prefer to stop and talk with him in the gallery devoted to the italian pictures than elsewhere the sublime conceptions of raphael raise me above myself and then as if afraid that her words would seem vainglorious to dick she said you are always in the same mood never rising above yourself or sinking below yourself finding it difficult to understand the pain that those who live mostly in the spiritual plane experience lest they fall into a lower plane oh not that i regard you dick as a lower plane but your plane is not mine and that is why you are so necessary to me and why perhaps i am so necessary to you or would be if i am not come let us sit here in front of the raphael and talk since we must of comic opera it's a pity we're not talking of the parco who have been in my mind all the morning and she began to recite some verses that she had written but interrupting herself suddenly she cried dick who has been scratching you how did your face get torn like that who's been scratching you and dick answered my wife your wife but you never told me you were married if i had told you i was married i would have had to tell you that my wife is a drunkard and is rapidly drinking herself to death a thing that no man likes to speak about oh my poor friend i didn't mean to reprove you how did all this come about it wouldn't do to admit that kate had discovered laura's letters and poems in his pockets and so he told the story of a former experience with his wife and had barely finished it when laura begged of him to tell her how he had met his wife and when he had told her the story to which she listened solemnly she answered and there was the same gravity in her voice as in her face all this comes my dear dick of lewdness but laura i was faithful to my wife but she was the wife of another man laura replied not that that is an insuperable barrier but you brought i fear lewdness into your conjugal life and lewdness is fatal to happiness whether it be indulged within or outside the bonds of wedlock i'm sorry she said that you had to leave yarmouth before my lecture on the chastity of the marriage state it wouldn't have mattered dick replied for my wife had taken to drink long before we met at hastings an answer that darkened laura's face despite all the paint she wore and encouraged dick to ask her if she had never felt the thorns of passion prick her when she ran away from her convent school she seemed uncertain what answer she should return but only for a moment and recovering herself quickly she maintained that it wasn't passion which is but another name for lewdness but imagination that had prompted this elopement and that if she had gone to bulgaria it was to seek there a nobler life than the one she had left behind it was the immortal that drew me she said even so dick answered the mortal seems necessary for the immortal and to provide him with a habitation a woman must give herself to a man that she replied is one of the penalties entailed by our first parents upon women but one that is entailed upon a condition that you have not respected but which i have striven always to respect myself it would be impossible for me to give myself to a man unless i thought i was going to bear him a child it was on dick's lips to remind laura that a woman can always think she is going to bear a child but he refrained it seeming to him that his purpose would be better served by allowing laura to justify herself as she pleased and he waited for an opportunity to speak to her about the alteration which he deemed altogether necessary in the second act but laura was away on her favourite theme and in the end he had recourse to his watch my dear laura i'm due at rehearsal in ten minutes from now well let's go she cried but my dear this is what i've come to tell you the second act and he explained the difficulty which would have to be removed 
now like a dear good girl will you go home and do this and bring it down to the theatre to-morrow morning at eleven so that we may have an opportunity of going through it together before rehearsal in the meantime kate lay on her bed helpless as ever just as dick had left her and it was not until he had given his preliminary instruction to the ballet girls and montgomery had struck the first notes of his opening chorus that a ray of consciousness pierced through the heavy drunken stupor that pressed upon her brain with vague movements of hands she endeavoured to fasten the front of her dress and with a groan rolled herself out of the light but her efforts to fall back into insensibility were unavailing and like the dawn that slips and swells through the veils of night a pale waste of consciousness forced itself upon her first came the curtains of the bed then the bare blankness of the wall and then the great throbbing pain that lay like a lump of lead just above her forehead her mouth was clammy as if it were filled with glue her limbs weak as if they had been beaten to a pulp by violent blows she was all pain but worse still a black horror of her life crushed and terrified her until she buried her face in the pillow and wept and moaned for mercy but to remain in bed was impossible the pallor of the place was intolerable and sliding her legs over the side she stood scarcely able to keep her feet the room swam as if in a mist she held her head with clasped hands the top of it seemed to be lifting off and it was with much difficulty that she staggered as far as the chest of drawers where she remained for some minutes trying to recover herself thinking of what had happened overnight she'd been drunk she knew that but where was dick where had he gone and what had she said to him all mental effort was agony but she had to think and straining at the threads of memory she strove to follow one to the end but it was no use it soon became hopelessly entangled and with a low cry she moaned oh my poor head my poor head i cannot cannot remember but the question what has become of dick still continued to torture her till raising her face suddenly from her arm she hitched up her falling skirts and seeing at that moment the bottle on the table she went into the sitting-room and poured herself out a little which she mixed with water just a drop she murmured to herself to pull me together it was his fault until he put me in a passion i was all right spreading and definite thoughts began to emerge and for a long time she sat moodily thinking over her wrongs and as her thoughts wavered they grew softer and more argumentative she considered the question from all sides and reasoning with herself was disposed to conclude that it was not all her fault if she did drink it was jealousy that drove her to it why wasn't he faithful to her who had given up everything for him why did he want to be always running after a lot of other women where was he now she'd like to know as this question appeared in the lens of her thought she raised her head and although boozed the memory of mrs forrest's letters filled her mind oh yes that's where he's gone to is it she murmured to herself so he's down with his poetess at the opera comique rehearsing montgomery's opera a determination to follow him slowly formed itself in her mind and she managed to map out the course that she would have to pursue it seemed to her that she was beset with difficulties to begin with she did not know where the theatre was and she could not conceal from herself the fact that she was scarcely in a fit state to take a long walk through the london streets the spirit drunk on an empty stomach had gone to her head she reeled a little when she walked and her own incapacity to act maddened her oh good heavens how her head was splitting what would she not give to be all right just for a couple of hours just long enough to go and tell that beast of a husband of hers what a pig he was and let the whole theatre know how he was treating his wife it was he who drove her to drink yes she would go and do this it was true her head seemed as if it were going to roll off her shoulders but a good sponging would do it good and then a bottle or two of soda would put her quite straight 
so straight that nobody would know she'd touched a drop. It took Kate about half an hour to drench herself in a basin, and regardless of her dress she let her hair lie dripping on her shoulders. The landlady brought her up the soda water, and seeing what a state her lodger was in, she placed it on the table without a word, without even referring to the notice to quit she had given overnight. And steadying her voice as best she could, Kate asked her to call a cab. Handsome or four-wheeler? For four-wheeler, if you please. Yes, that'll suit you best, said the woman as she went downstairs. You'd perhaps fall out of a hansom. If I were your husband, I'd break every bone in your body. But Kate was now much soberer, and weak and sick she leaned back upon the hard cushions of the clattering cab. Her mouth was full of water, and the shifting angles of the streets produced on her an effect similar to seasickness. London rang in her ears. She could hear a piano tinkling. She saw Dick directing the movements of a line of girls. Then her dream was brought to an end by a gulp. Oh, the fearful nausea! And she did not feel better until flooding her dress and ruining the red velvet seat, all she had drunk came up but the vomit brought her great relief, and had it not been for a little dizziness and weakness, she would have felt quite right when she arrived at the stage door. In a terrible state of dirt and untidiness she was, surely, but she noticed nothing, her mind being now fully occupied in thinking what she should say, first to the stage doorkeeper and then to her husband. At the corner of which street she dismissed the cab, and this done, she did not seem to have courage enough for anything. She felt as if she'd like to sit down on a doorstep and cry. The menacing threats, the bitter upbraiding she had intended, all slipped from her like dreams, and she felt utterly wretched. At that moment, in her little walk up the pavement, she found herself opposite a public house. Something whispered in her ear that, after her sickness, one little nip of brandy was necessary and would put her straight in a moment. She hesitated, but someone pushed her from behind and she went in. A four of brandy freshened her up wonderfully, enabling her to think of what she had come to do and to remember how badly she was being treated. A second drink put light into her eyes and wickedness into her head and she felt she could and would face the devil. I'll give it to him. I'll teach him that I'm not to be trodden on, she said to herself as she strutted manfully towards the stage door, walking on her heels so as to avoid any unsteadiness of gait. The man in the little box was old and feeble. He said he would send her name by the first person going down, but Kate was not in a mood to brook delays and profiting by his inability to stop her, she banged through the swinging door and commenced the descent of a long flight of steps. Below her was the stage, and between the wings she could see the girls arranged in a semicircle. Dick, with a big staff in hand, stood in front of the footlights, directing the movements of a procession which was being formed. The piano tinkled merrily on the O.P. side. Uh, Mr. Chapel, will you be good enough to play the Just Put This In Your Pocket chorus over again, cried Dick, stamping his staff heavily upon the boards. Now then, girls, I hear a good deal too much talking going on at the back there. I dare say it's very amusing, but if you try to combine business with pleasure... Now, who did I put in section one? Kate hesitated a moment, arrested by the tones of his voice and she could not avoid thinking of the time when she used to play claret. Besides, all the well-known faces were there. Our lives move as in circles. No matter what strange vicissitudes we pass through, we generally find ourselves gliding once more into the well-known grooves, and Dick, informing the present company, had naturally fallen back upon the old hands who had travelled with him in the country. They were nearly all there. Mortimer, with his ringlets and his long nasal drawl, stood as usual in the wings, making ill-natured remarks. Dubois strutted as before, and tilting his bishop's hat, explained that he would take no further engagement as a singer. If people would not let him act, they would have to do without him. 
with her dyed hair tucked neatly away under her bonnet miss leslie smiled as agreeably as ever beaumont alone seemed to be missing and montgomery in all the importance of a going-to-be-produced author strode along up and down the stage apparently busied in thought the tails of a new market coat still flapping about his thin legs and when he appeared in profile against the scenery he looked as he had always done like the flitting shadow thrown by an enormous magic lantern kate sullenly watched them gripping the rail of the staircase tightly the momentary softening of heart occasioned by the remembrance of old times died away in the bitterness of the thought that she who had counted for so much was now pushed into a corner to live forgotten or disdained why was she not rehearsing there with them she asked herself at once the answer came because your husband hates you because he wants to make love to another woman then like one crazed she clattered down the iron spiral staircase to the stage she didn't even hear mortimer and dubois cry out as she pushed past there's mrs lennox in the middle of the stage however she looked around discountenanced by the silence and the crowd and hoping to calm her dick advised her in whispers to go upstairs to his room but this was the signal for her to break forth go up to your room she screamed never never do you suppose it's to talk to you that i came here no i despise you too much i hate you and i want everyone here to know how you treat me with a dull stare she examined the circle of girls who stood whispering in groups as if she were going to address one in particular and several drew back frightened dick attempted to say something but it seemed that the very sound of his voice was enough go away go away she exclaimed at the top of her voice go away don't touch me go to that woman of yours mrs forrest go to her and be damned you beast you know she's paying for everything here you know that you are oh, for goodness sake remember what you're saying said dick interrupting and trembling as if for his life he cast an anxious glance around to see if the lady in question was within hearing fortunately she was not on the stage the chorus crowded timidly forward looking like a school in their walking dresses the carpenters had ceased to hammer and were peeping down from the flies kate stood balancing herself and staring blindly at those who surrounded her leslie and montgomery in the position of old friends were endeavouring to soothe her whilst mortimer and dubois argued passionately as to when they had seen her drunk for the first time the first insisted that when she had joined them at hanley she was a bit inebriated the latter declared that it had begun with the champagne on her wedding day don't you remember dick was married with a scratched face to judge from present appearances said the comedian forcing his words slowly through his nose he's likely to die with one at this sally three supers retired into the wings holding their sides and dubois furious at being outdone in a joke walked away in high dudgeon calling mortimer an unfeeling brute in the meantime the drunken row was waxing more furious at every moment struggling frantically with her friends kate called attention to the sticking plaster on dick's face and declared that she would do for him you see what i gave him last night and he deserved it oh the beast and i'll give him more if you knew all you wouldn't blame me it was he who seduced me who got me to run away from home and he deserts me for other women but he shan't he shan't he shan't i'll kill him first yes i will and nobody will stop me dick listened quite broken with shame for himself and for her as an excuse for the absence of his wife from the theatre he had told mortimer and hayes that london did not agree with her and that she had to spend most of her time at the seaside all had condoled with him and when they were searching london for a second lady all had agreed that mrs lennox was just the person they wanted for the part what a pity they said she wasn't in town at the present moment dick wished her the other side of jordan for all he knew she might remain screaming at him the whole day and if mrs forrest came back 
well he didn't know what would happen the whole game would then be up the spout perhaps the best thing to do would be to tell montgomery of the danger his peace was in he and kate had always been friends she might listen to him such were dick's reflections as he stood bashfully trying to avoid the eyes of his ballet girls for the life of him he didn't know which way to look in front of him was a wall of people whereon certain faces detached themselves he saw dubois's mumming mug widening with delight until the grin formed a semicircle round the jew nose mortimer looked on with the mock earnestness of a tortured saint in a stained-glass window pity was written on all the girls faces all were sorry for dick especially a tall woman who forgot herself so completely that she threw her arms about a super and sobbed on his shoulder but kate still continued to advance although held by montgomery and miss leslie the long black hair hung in disordered masses her brown eyes were shot with golden lights the green tints in her face became in her excessive pallor dirty and abominable in colour and she seemed more like a demon than a woman as her screams echoed through the empty theatre by jove we ought to put up jane eyre said mortimer if she were to play the mad woman like that we'd be sure to draw full houses i believe you said dubois but at that moment he was interrupted by a violent scream and suddenly disengaging herself from those who held her kate rushed at dick with one hand she grappled him by the throat and before any one could interfere she succeeded in nearly tearing the shirt from his back when at length they were separated she stood staring and panting every fibre of her being strained with passion but she did not again burst forth until some one in a foolish attempt to pacify her ventured to side with her in her denunciation of her husband how should such as you dare to say a word against him i will not hear him abused no i will not i say he is a good man yes yes he is a good man the best man that ever lived she exclaimed stamping her foot on the boards the best man that ever lived i will not hear a word against him no i will not he's my husband he married me yes he did i can show you my certificate and that's more than any one of you can i know you a damn lot of hussies i know you i was one of you myself you think i wasn't <laughs> ah well i can prove it you go and ask montgomery if i didn't play sir Paulette all through the country and claret too i should like to see any of you do that with the exception of lucy who was always a good friend to me but the rest of you i despise as the dirt under my feet so do you think that i would permit you that i came here to listen to my husband being abused and by such as you if he has his faults is accountable to none but me here she had to pause for lack of breath and dick who had been pursuing his shirt stud which had rolled into the footlights now drew himself up and in his stage commanding voice declared the rehearsal to be over a few of the girls lingered but they were beckoned away by the others who saw that the present time was not suitable for the discussion of boots tights and dressing-rooms there was no one left but leslie montgomery dick kate and harding who twisting his moustache watched and listened apparently with the greatest interest oh you've no idea what a nice woman she used to be and is were it not for that cursed drink said montgomery with the tears running down his nose you remember her leslie don't you isn't what i say true i never liked a woman so much in my life oh you were a friend of hers then said harding i should think i was then you never were uh, oh yes yes i understand a little friendship flavoured with love yes yes wears better perhaps than the genuine article uh, what do you think leslie not bad said the prima donna for people with poor appetites a kind of diet suitable for lent i should think ah a title for a short story or better still for an operetta 
what do you think montgomery shall i do you a book entitled lovers in lent or a lover's lent and leslie will no i won't none of your forty days for me i can't understand how you people can go on talking nonsense with a scene so terrible passing under your eyes cried the musician as he pointed to kate who was calling after dick as she staggered in pursuit of him up the stairs towards the stage door well what do you want me to do she'll disgrace him in the street i can't help that i never interfere in a love affair and this is evidently the great passion of a life montgomery cast an indignant glance at the novelist and rushed after his friends but when he arrived at the stage door he saw the uselessness of his interference it was in the narrow street the heat sweltered between the old houses that leaned and lolled upon the huge black traversing beams like aged women on crutches and kate raved against dick in language that was fearful to hear amid the stage carpenters the chorus girls the idlers that a theatre collects standing with one foot in the gutter where vegetable refuse of all kinds rotted her beautiful black hair was now hanging over her shoulders like a mane some one had trodden on her dress and nearly torn it from her waist and in avid curiosity women with dyed hair peeped out of a suspicious-looking tobacco shop over the way stuck under an overhanging window was an orange stall the proprietor stood watching whilst a crowd of vermin-like children ran forward delighted at the prospect of seeing a woman beaten close by in shirt-sleeves the pot-boy flung open the public-house door partly for the purpose of attracting custom and half with the intention of letting a little air into the bar-room oh kate i beg of you not to go in there said dick you've had enough do come home come home she shrieked and with you you beast it was you who seduced me got me away from my husband this occasioned a good deal of amusement in the crowd and several voices asked for information and how did he manage to do that ma'am said one with a bottle of gin what do you think cried another there were moments when dick longed for the earth to open but he nevertheless continued to try to prevent kate from entering the public house i will drink i will drink i will drink and not because i like it but to spite you because i hate you when she came out she appeared to be a little quieted and dick tried very hard to persuade her to get into a cab and drive home but the very sound of his voice the very sight of him seemed to excite her and in a few moments she broke forth into the usual harangue several times the temptation to run away became almost irresistible but with a noble effort of will he forced himself to remain with her hoping to avoid some part of the ridicule that was being so liberally showered upon him he besought of her to keep up drury lane and not descend into the strand you don't want to be seen with me i know you prefer to walk there with mrs forrest you think i shall disgrace you well come along then look at me here look at me there criticise me everywhere i'm so sweet from head to feet and most perfect and complete that's right old woman give us a song she knows the game answered another raising his big hat from his head dick wiped his face and as if divining his extreme despair kate left off singing and dancing and the procession proceeded in quiet past several different wine shops it was not until they came to shorts that she declared she was dying of thirst and must have a drink dick forbade the barman to serve her and brought upon himself the most shocking abuse knowing that he would be sure to meet a crowd of his pals at the gaiety bar he used every endeavour to persuade her to cross the street and get out of the sun don't bother me with your son she exclaimed surlily and then as if struck by the meaning of the word she said but it wasn't a son it was a daughter don't you remember oh kate how can you speak so speak so i say it was a daughter and she died 
and you said it was my fault as you say everything is my fault you beast you venomous beast yes she did die it was a pity i could have loved her at this moment dick felt a heavy hand clapped on his shoulder and turning round he saw a pal of his what dick my boy a drunken chorus lady trying to get her home always up to some charitable action <laughs> no she's my wife oh I, I beg your pardon old chap you know i didn't mean it and the man disappeared into the bar-room yes i'm his wife kate shrieked after him i got that much right out of him at least and i played the serpolette in the cloche look at me here look at me there she sang flirting with her abominable skirt amused by the applause of the rough but i'm going to have a drink here she said suddenly breaking off no you can't my good woman said the stout guardian at the door and why why not that don't matter you go on or i'll have to give you in charge kate was not yet so drunk that the words in charge did not frighten her and she answered humbly enough i'm here with my husband and as you're so impertinent i shall go elsewhere at the next place they came to dick did not protest against her being served but waited confident of the result until she had had her four of gin and came reeling out into his arms shaking herself free she stared at him and when he was fully recognised cursed him for his damned interference she could now scarcely stand straight on her legs and after staggering a few yards further fell helplessly on the pavement calling a cab he bundled her into it and drove away chapter twenty seven oh dick dear what did i do yesterday oh do tell me about yesterday was i very violent and those wounds on your face oh i didn't do that don't tell me that i did dick oh dick are you going to leave me i have to attend to my business kate oh your business your business mrs forrest is your business you've no other business but her now and that's what's driving me to drink oh kate don't begin it again i've a rehearsal yes the rehearsal of her opera and montgomery's music i did think he was my friend yet he's putting up her opera to music and all the while he was setting it you were telling me lies about chilperic saying that i was to play the fredegonde and all the principal parts in the great herve festival but the american but there was no american it was cruel of you dick to shut me up here with nobody to speak to nothing to do but wait for you hour after hour and when you come home to hear nothing from you but lies nothing but lies chill perrick le petit faust loy creve trone d'ecos marguerite de navarre la belle poule and all the music i've learnt hoping that i would be allowed to sing it and yet you expect that a woman who's deceived like that can abstain from drink why you drive me to it dick an angel from heaven wouldn't abstain from drink away you go in the morning to mrs forrest to her opera oh but kate there's nothing between me and mrs forrest she is a very clever woman and i am doing her opera for her how are we to live if you come between me and my business womanizing is your business kate answered suddenly well don't let's argue it dick answered he tied his shoestrings and sought for his hat so you're going she said and when shall i see you again i shall try to get home for dinner what time not before eight oh, i shall not see you before twelve she replied and she experienced a sad sinking of the heart when she heard the door close behind him a sad sinking that she would have to endure till she heard his latch-key and that would not be for many hours perhaps not until midnight she did not know how she would be able to endure all these hours 
to sleep some of them away would be the best thing she could do and with that intention she drew down the blind and threw herself on the bed and lay between sleeping and waking till the afternoon then feeling a little better she rang and asked for a cup of tea it tasted very insipid but she gulped it down as best she could making wry faces and feeling more miserable than ever she had felt before afraid to look back on yesterday afraid to look forward on the morrow she bethought herself of the past of the happy days when montgomery used to come and teach her to sing and her triumphs in the part of clairette she was quite as successful in sir paulette people had liked her in sir paulette and to recall those days more distinctly she opened a box in which she kept her souvenirs a withered flower a broken cigarette holder two or three old buttons that had fallen from his clothes and a lock of hair and it was under these that the prize of prizes lay a string of false pearls she liked to run them through her fingers and to see them upon her neck she still kept the dresses she wore in her two favourite parts the stockings and the shoes and having nothing to do no way of passing the time away she bethought herself of dressing herself in the apparel of her happy days presenting when the servant came up with her dinner a spectacle that almost caused emma to drop the dish of cold mutton oh lord mrs lennox i thought i see a ghost you in that white dress oh what lovely clothes these were the clothes i used to wear when i was on the stage oh but law mum why aren't you on the stage now kate began to tell her story to the servant girl who listened till a bell rang and she said mm, that's mr so-and-so ringing for his wife i must run and see to it you must excuse me mum the cold mutton and the damp potatoes did not tempt her appetite and catching sight of herself in the glass bitter thoughts of the wrong done to her surged up in her mind the tiny nostrils dilated and the upper lip contracted and for ten minutes she stood her hands grasping nervously at the back of her chair the canine teeth showed for the project of revenge was mounting to her head he'll not be back till midnight all oh, this while is with leslie and mrs forrest or oh, some new girl perhaps yet when he returns to me when he's wearied out he expects to find me sober and pleased to see him but he shall never see me sober or pleased to see him again on these words she walked across the room to the fireplace and putting her hand up the chimney brought down a bottle of old tom and sat moodily sipping gin and water till she heard his key in the lock <laughs> he's back earlier than i expected she said dick entered in his usual deliberate elephantine way kate made no sign till he was seated and then she asked what the news was it was clearly out of the question to tell her that he had been round to tea with one of the girls to explain how he had wheedled mrs forrest into all sorts of theatrical follies was likewise not to be thought of as a subject of news and as to making conversation out of the rest of the day's duties he really didn't see how he was to do it miss howard had put out the entire procession by not listening to his instructions miss adair although she was playing the brigand of the ultramarine mountains had threatened to throw up her part if she were not allowed to wear her diamond earrings the day had gone in deciding such questions had passed in drilling those infernal girls and what interest could there be in going through it all over again besides he never knew how or where he might betray himself and kate was so quick in picking up the slightest word and twisting it into extraordinary meanings that he really would prefer to talk about something else i can't understand how you can have been out all day without having heard something it's because you want to keep me shut up here and not let me know anything of your goings-on but i shall go down to the theatre to-morrow and have it out of you my dear i assure you that i was at the rehearsal all day the girls don't know their music yet and it puts me out in my stage arrangements i give you my word that is all i heard or saw to-day i've nothing to conceal from you you're a liar and you know you are blows and shrieks followed 
I shall pull that woman's nose off. I know I shall. I give you my word, dear, that I've been the whole day with Montgomery and Harding, cutting the piece. Oh, cutting the piece? And I should like to know why I'm not in that piece. I suppose it was you who kept me out of it. Oh, you beast. Why did you ever have anything to do with me? It's you who was ruining me. Were it not for you, do you think I should be drinking? Not I. It was all your fault. Dick made no attempt to answer. He was very tired. Kate continued her march up and down the room for some moments in silence, but he could see from the twitching of her face and the swinging of her arms that the storm was bound to burst soon. Presently, she said, "'You go and get me something to drink. I've had nothing all this evening.' "'Oh, Kate, dear, I beg of you.' "'Oh, you won't, won't you? We'll see about that,' she answered, as she looked around the room for the heaviest object she could conveniently throw at him. Seeing how useless it would be to attempt to contradict her in her present mood, Dick rose to his feet and said hurriedly, "'Now there's no use getting into a passion, Kate. I'll go, I'll go.' "'You'd better, I can tell you. Uh, what shall I get, then?' Get me half a pint of gin and be quick about it. I'm dying of thirst. Even Dick, accustomed as he was now to these scenes, could not repress a look in which there was at once mingled pity, astonishment and fear. So absolutely demoniacal did this little woman seem as she raved under the watery light of the lodging-house gas, her dark complexion gone to a dull greenish pallor. By force of contrast, she called to his mind the mild-eyed workwoman he had known in the linen draper's shop in Hanley, and he asked himself if it were possible that she and this raging creature, more like a tiger in her passion than a human being, were one and the same person. He could not choose but wonder. But another scream came, bidding him make haste or it would be the worst for him, and he bent his head and went to fetch the gin. In the meantime, Kate's fury leaped, crackled, and burnt with the fierceness of a house in the throes of conflagration, and in the smoke-cloud of hatred which enveloped her, only fragments of ideas and sensations flashed like falling sparks through her mind. Up and down the room she walked, swinging her arms, only hesitating for some new object whereon to wreak new fury. Suddenly it struck her that Dick had been too long away that he was keeping her waiting on purpose, and grinding her teeth she muttered, "'Oh, the beast! Would he? Would he keep me waiting? And since nine this morning I've been alone!' In an instant her resolve was taken. It came to her sullenly, obtusely, like the instinct of revenge to an animal. She didn't stop to consider what she was doing, but seizing a large stick, the handle of a brush that happened to have been broken, she stationed herself at the top of the landing. A feverish tremor agitated her as she waited in the semi-darkness of the stairs, but at last she heard the door open and Dick came up slowly with his usual heavy tread. She made neither sign nor stir, but allowed him to get past her and then, raising the brush handle, she landed him one across the back. The poor man uttered a long cry, and the crash of broken glass was heard. Oh, "'What did you hit me like that for?' he cried, holding himself with both hands. "'You beast, you! I'll teach you to keep me waiting. Oh, you would, would you? Oh, do you want another? Go into the sitting-room!' Dick obeyed humbly and in silence. His only hope was that the landlady had not been awakened, and he felt uneasily at his pockets, through which he could feel the gin dripping down his legs. "'Well, have you brought the drink I sent you for? Where is it?' Uh, "'Well,' Dick replied, desirous of conciliating at any price, "'it was in my pocket, but when you hit me with that stick you broke it.' "'I broke it?' cried Kate, her eyes glistening with fire. "'Yes, dear, you did.' It wasn't my fault. Wasn't your fault? Oh, you horrid wretch, you put it there on purpose that I should break it. Oh, now, really, Kate, he cried, shocked by the unfairness of the accusation. 
how could i know that you were going to hit me there i don't know and i don't care what's that to me but what i'm sure of is that you always want to spite me that you hate me that you would wish to see me dead so you might marry mrs forrest i can't think how you can say such things i've often told you that mrs forrest and i oh don't bother me i'm not such a fool i know she keeps you and she'll have to pay me a drink tonight go and get another bottle of gin and mind you pay for it with the money she gave you today yes she shall stand me a drink tonight i give you my word i haven't another penny piece upon me it's just the accident but dick did not get time to finish the sentence he was interrupted by a heavy blow across the face and like a panther that has tasted blood she rushed at him again screaming all the while oh you've no money you liar you liar so you would make me believe she doesn't give you money that you've no money of hers in your pocket you'd keep it all for yourself oh but you shan't no you shan't for i will tear it from you and throw it in your face oh that filthy money that filthy money the patience with which he bore with her was truly angelic he might easily have felled her to the ground with one stroke but he contented himself with merely warding off the blows she aimed at him from his great height and strength he was easily able to do this and she struck at him with her little womanish arms as she might against a door take down your hands she screamed exasperated to a last degree oh you'd strike me would you you beast i know you would her rage had now reached its height showing her clenched teeth she foamed at the mouth the bloodshot eyes protruded from their sockets and her voice grew more and more harsh and discordant but although the excited brain gave strength to the muscles and energy to the will unarmed she could do nothing against dick and suddenly becoming conscious of this she rushed to the fireplace and seized the poker with one sweep of the arm she cleared the mantel board and the mirror came in for a tremendous blow as she advanced around the table brandishing her weapon but heedless of the shattered glass she followed in pursuit of dick who continued to defend himself dexterously with a chair and it is difficult to say how long this combat might have lasted if dick's attention had not been interrupted by a view of the landlady's face at the door and so touched was he by the woman's dismay when she looked upon her broken furniture that he forgot to guard himself from the poker kate took advantage of the occasion and whirled the weapon round her head he saw it descending in time and half warded off the blow but it came down with awful force on the forearm and glancing off inflicted a severe scalp wound the landlady screamed murder and dick seeing that matters had come to a crisis closed in upon his wife and undeterred by yells and struggles pinioned her and forced her into a chair oh dear oh dear you're all bleeding sir cried the landlady she's nearly killed you oh, never mind me but what are we to do i think she has gone mad this time oh, that's what i think said the landlady trying to make herself heard above kate's shrieks well then go and fetch a doctor and let's hear what he has to say replied dick as he changed his grip on kate's arm for in a desperate struggle she had nearly succeeded in wrenching herself free the landlady retreated precipitately towards the door well will you go oh yes yes i'll run at once oh you'd better yelled the madwoman after her i'll give it to you let me go let me go will you but dick never seized his hold of her and the blood dripping upon her trickled in large drops into her ears and down on to her neck and bosom you're spitting on me you beast you filthy beast i'll pay you out for this then she perceived that it was blood the intonation of her voice changed and in terror she screamed murder murder he's murdering me is there no one here to save me the minutes seemed like eternities dick felt himself growing faint 
but should he lose his power over her before the doctor arrived the consequences might be fatal to himself so he struggled with her for very life at last the door was opened and a man walked into the room tripping in so doing over a piece of the broken mirror it was the doctor and accustomed as he was to betray surprise at nothing he could not repress a look of horror on catching sight of the scene around him the apartment was almost dismantled chairs lay backless about the floor amid china shepherdesses and toreadors pictures were thrown over the sofa and a huge pile of wax fruit apples and purple grapes was partially reflected in a large piece of mirror that had fallen across the hearthrug come help me to hold her said dick raising his blood-stained face with a quick movement the doctor took possession of kate's arms give me a sheet from the next room i'll soon make her fast the threat of being tied had its effect kate became quieter and after some trouble they succeeded in carrying her into the next room and laying her on the bed there she rolled convulsively beating the pillows with her arms the landlady stationed herself at the door to give notice of any further manifestation of fury while dick explained the circumstances of the case to the doctor after a short consultation he agreed to sign an order declaring that in his opinion mrs lennox was a dangerous lunatic will that be enough said dick to place her in an asylum no you'll have to get the opinion of another doctor the possibility of being able to rid himself of her was to him like the sudden dawning of a new life and dick rushed off bleeding haggard wild-looking as he was to seek for another doctor who would concur in the judgment of the first asking himself if it were possible to see kate in her present position and say conscientiously that she was a person who could be safely trusted with her liberty and to his great joy this view was taken by the second authority consulted and having placed his wife under lock and key dick lay down to rest a happier man than he had been for many a day the position in his mind was of course the means he should adopt to place her in the asylum force was not to be thought of persuasion must be first tried so far he was decided but as to the arguments he should advance to induce her to give up her liberty he knew nothing nor did he attempt to formulate any scheme and when he entered the bedroom next morning he relied more on the hope of finding her repentant and appealing to and working on her feelings of remorse than anything else the whole thing as he put it depended upon the humour he should find her in and he found her with stains of blood still upon her face amid the broken furniture and she asked calmly but with intense emotion dick did he say i was mad well dear i don't know that he said you were mad except when you were the worse for drink but he said oh, that i might become mad she interposed if i don't abstain from drink did he say that well it was something like that kate you know i only just escaped with my life only just escaped with your life dick oh if i had killed you if i would killed you oh if i'd seen you lying dead at my feet and unable to think further she fell upon her knees and reached out her arms to him but he did not take her to his bosom and she sobbed till touched to the heart he strove to console her with kind words never forgetting however to introduce a hint that she was not responsible for her actions then i'm really downright mad said kate raising her tear-stained face from her arms did the doctor say so this was by far too direct a question for dick to answer it were better to equivocate well my dear mad he didn't say that you were always mad but he said you were liable to fits and that if you didn't take care those fits would grow upon you and you would become then he hesitated as he always did before a direct statement but what did he say i must do to get well he advised that you should go to a home where you would not be able to get hold of any liquor and would be looked after you mean a madhouse 
Oh, you wouldn't put me in a madhouse, Dick. I wouldn't put you anywhere you didn't like to go. But he said nothing about a madhouse. What did he say, then? He spoke merely of one of those houses which are under medical supervision, and where anyone can go and live for a time. A kind of hospital, you know. The argument was continued for an hour or more. Kate wept and protested against being locked up as a madwoman, while he, conscious of the stronghold he had over her, reminded her in a thousand ways of the danger she ran of awakening one morning to find herself a murderess. Yet it is difficult to persuade anyone voluntarily to enter a lunatic asylum, no matter how irrefutable the reasons advanced may be. And it was not until Dick on one side skilfully threatened her with separation, and tempted her on the other with the hope of being cured of her vice and living with him happily ever afterwards, that she consented to enter Dr. Blank's private asylum, Craven Street, Bloomsbury. But even then the battle was not won, for when he suggested going off there at once, he very nearly brought another fit of passion down on his head. It was only the extreme lassitude and debility produced from the excesses of last night that saved him. "'Oh, Dick, dear, if you only knew how I love you, I'd give my last drop of blood to save you from harm.' "'I know you would, dear. It's the fault of that confounded drink,' he answered, his heart tense with the hope of being rid of her. Then the packing began. Kate sat disconsolate on the sofa and watched Dick folding up her dresses and petticoats. It seemed to her that everything had ended, and wearily she collected the pearls which had been scattered in last night's skirmishing. Some had been trodden on, others were lost, and only about half the original number could be found, and shaken with nervousness and lassitude, Kate cried and wrung her hands. Dick sat next to her, kind, huge, and indifferent, even as the world itself. Oh, "'But you'll come and see me. You promise me that you'll come, that you'll come very often?' "'Oh, yes, dear. I'll come two or three times a week. But I hope that you'll be well soon, very soon.' Chapter 12 the hope Dick expressed that his wife would soon be well enough to return home was, of course, untrue, his hope being that she would never cross the doors of the house in Bloomsbury whither he was taking her. The empty bed awaiting him was so great a relief that he fell on his knees before it and prayed that the doctors might judge her to be insane, unsafe to be at large. To wake up in the morning alone in his bed and to be free to go forth to his business without question seemed to him like heaven. But the pleasures of heaven last for eternity, and Dick's delight lasted but for two days. Two days after Kate had gone into the asylum, a letter came from one of the doctors saying that Mrs. Lennox was not insane and would have to be discharged. Dick sank into a chair and lay there almost stunned, plunged into despair that was like a thick fog, and it did not lift until the door opened and Kate stood before him again. He raised his head and looked at her stupidly, and interpreting his vacant face, she said, "'Dick, you're sorry to have me back again?' "'Sorry, Kate. Well, if things were different, I shouldn't be sorry.' But you see, the blow you struck me with the poker very nearly did for me. I haven't been the same man since. Well, she said, I must go back to the asylum or the home, whatever you call it, and tell them that I'm mad. Oh, there's no use in doing that, Kate. They wouldn't believe you. Here's the letter I've just received. Read it. Oh, but, Dick, there must be some way out of this dreadful trouble, and yet there doesn't seem to be any. Try to think, dear, try to think. Can you think of anything, dear? I don't think I shall give way again. If I only had something to do, it's because I'm always alone, because I love you, because I'm jealous of that woman. Oh, but, Kate, if I stop here with you all day, we shall starve. I must go to business. 
oh business business oh, if i could go to business too the days when we used to rehearse went merrily enough oh you were the best claret i ever saw dick answered better than paula marie and i ought to know for i rehearsed you both oh i shall never play claret again kate said sadly i've lost my figure and the part requires a waist you might get your waist again dick said and the words seemed to him extraordinarily silly but he had to say something if i could only get to work again she muttered to herself and then turning to dick oh dick if i could get to work again any part would do it doesn't matter how small just to give me something to think about that's all to keep my mind off it if the baby hadn't died i should have had her to look after and that would have done just as well as a part oh, but i've disgraced you in company i don't blame you you couldn't have me in it and i couldn't bring myself to sing in that opera yes you would only break out again kate those jealous fits are terrible you think you could restrain yourself but you couldn't and all that would come of a row between you and mrs forrest would be that i should lose my job i know dick i know kate cried painfully oh, but i promise you that i never will again you may go where you please and do what you please i will never say a word to you again i'm sure you believe all that you say kate but i cannot get you a job i may hear of something and meanwhile meanwhile i shall have to stay here and alone and no way of escaping from the hours oh long dreary hours no way but one oh dick i'm sorry they didn't keep me in the asylum it would have been better for both of us if they had then if i could go back there again if you will take me back i'll try to deceive the doctors you mean kate that you would play the mad woman i doubt if any woman could do it sufficiently well to deceive the doctors there was an italian woman and they talked of the great italian actress for some time and then dick said well kate i must be about my business i'm sorry to leave you no dick you're not oh i am dear in a way uh, but if i hear of anything and he left the house knowing that there was no further hope for himself he was tied to her and might be killed by her in his sleep but that wouldn't matter what did matter was the thought that was always at the back of his mind that she was alone in that islington lodging-house craving for drink striving to resist it falling back into drink and might be coming down raving to the theatre to insult him before the company insult him before the company that had been done she'd done her worst and he was indifferent whether she came again only she must not meet mrs forrest on the whole he felt that his sorrow was with kate herself rather than with himself or with mrs forrest god only knows he said as he rushed down the stairs what will become of her kate was asking herself the same question what was to become of her would it be possible for her to find work to do that would keep her mind away from the drink she seemed for the moment free from all craving but she knew what the craving is how overpowering in the throat it is and how when one has got one mouthful one must go on and on so intense is the delight of alcohol in the throat of the drunkard but there was no craving upon her and it might never come again every morning she awoke in great fear but was glad to find that there was no craving in her throat and when she went out she rejoiced that the public houses offered no attraction to her she became brave and fear turned to contempt and at the bottom of her heart she began to jeer at the demon which had conquered and brought her to ruin and which she had in turn conquered but there was a last mockery she did not dare for she knew that the demon was but biding his time he seemed however to go on biding it and dick finding kate reasonable every evening came home to dinner earlier so that the day should not appear to her intolerably long 
but his business often detained him, and one night, coming home late, he noticed that she looked more sullen than usual, that her eyes drooped as if she'd been drinking. A month of scenes of violence followed. "'Not a single day, as far as I can remember, for a fortnight,' he said one day, on leaving the house and running to catch his bus to the Strand. "'Have we had a quiet evening?' When he returned that night, she ran at him with a knife, and he had only just time to ward off the blow. The house rang with shrieks and cries of all sorts, and the Lennoxes were driven from one lodging-house to another. Trousers, dresses, hats, boots and shoes were all pawned. The comic and the pitiful are but two sides of the same thing and it was at once comic and pitiful to see Dick, with one of the tails of his coat lost in the scrimmage, talking at one o'clock in the morning to a dispassionate policeman, while from the top windows the high treble voice of a woman disturbed the sullen tranquillity of the London night. And yet Dick continued with her, continued to allow himself to be beaten, scratched, torn to pieces almost as he would be by a wild beast. Human nature can habituate itself even to pain, and it was so with him. He knew that his present life was as a Nessus shirt upon his back, and yet he couldn't make up his mind to have done with it. In the first place he pitied his wife, in the second he did not know how to leave her, and it was not until after another row with Kate for having been down to the theatre that he summoned up courage to walk out of the house with a fixed determination never to return again. Kate was too tipsy at the time to pay much attention to the announcement he made to her as he left the room. Besides, Wolf had been cried so often that it had now lost its terror in her ears, and it was not until next day that she began to experience any very certain fear that Dick and she had at last parted for ever. But when, with a clammy, thirsty mouth, she sat rocking herself wearily, and the long idleness of the morning hours became haunted with irritating remembrances of her shameful conduct, of the cruel life she led the man she loved, the black gulf of eternal separation became, as it were, etched upon her mind, and she heard the cold depths reverberating with vain words and foolish prayers. Then her thin hands trembled on her black dress, and waves of shivering passed over her. She thought involuntarily that a little brandy might give her strength, and as soon hated herself for the thought. It was brandy that had brought her to this. She would never touch it again. But Dick had not left her for ever. He would come back to her. She couldn't live without him. It was terrible. She would go to him, and on her knees beg his pardon for all she had done. He would forgive her. He must forgive her. Such were the fugitive thoughts that flashed through Kate's mind as she hurried to and fro, seeking for her bonnet and shawl. She would go down to the theatre and find him. She'd be sure to hear news of him there, she said, as she strove to brush away the mist that obscured her eyes. She could see nothing. Things seemed to change their places, and so terrible were the palpitations of her heart that she was forced to cling to any piece of furniture within reach. But by walking very slowly, she contrived to reach the stage door of the opera comique, feeling very weak and ill. "'Is Mr. Lennox in?' she asked, at the same time trying to look conciliatingly at the hard-faced hall-keeper. "'No, ma'am, he ain't,' was the reply. "'Who attended the rehearsal today, then?' "'There was no rehearsal today, ma'am. At least ways Mr. Lennox dismissed the rehearsal at half-past twelve. "'And why?' "'Oh, that I cannot tell you.' "'Could you tell me where Mr. Lennox would be likely to be found?' "'Indeed I couldn't, ma'am. I believe he's gone into the country.' "'Gone into the country?' echoed Kate. Uh, "'But may I ask, ma'am, if you be Mrs. Lennox?' "'Because if you be, Mr. Lennox left a letter to be given to you in case you called.' Her eyes brightened at the idea of a letter. To know the worst would be better than a horrible uncertainty, and she said eagerly, "'Yes, I'm Mrs. Lennox. Give me the letter.' The hall-keeper handed it to her, and she walked out of the narrow passage into the street, so as to be free from observation. 
With anxious fingers she tore open the envelope and read, My dear Kate, it must be now as clear to you as it is to me that it is quite impossible for us to go on living together. There's no use in our again discussing the whys and the wherefores. We had much better accept the facts of the case in silence and mutually save each other the pain of trying to alter what cannot be altered. I have arranged to allow you two pounds a week. This sum will be paid to you every Saturday by applying to Messrs Jackson and Co. Solicitors, Arundel Street, Strand. Yours very affectionately, Richard Lennox. Kate mechanically repeated the last words as she walked gloomily through the glare of the day. Two pounds a week, she said, and with nothing else. Not a friend, and the thought passed through her mind that she could not have a friend. She had fallen too low, yet from no fault of her own nor Dick's, and it was that that frightened her. A terrible sense of loneliness, of desolation, was created in her heart. For her the world seemed to have ended, and she saw the streets and passers-by with the same vague, irresponsible gaze as a solitary figure would the universal ruin caused by an earthquake. She had no friends, no occupation, no interest of any kind in life. Everything had slipped from her, and she shivered with a sense of nakedness, of moral destitution. Nothing was left to her, and yet she felt she lived. She was conscious. Oh, yes, horribly conscious. And that was the worst. And she asked herself why she could not pass out of sight, out of hearing and feeling of all the crying misery with which she was surrounded. And in a state of emotive somnambulism, she walked through the crowds till she was startled from her dreams by hearing a voice calling after her. Kate! Kate! Mrs. Lennox! It was Montgomery. I'm so glad to have met you. Oh, so glad indeed, for we haven't seen much of each other. I don't know how it was, but somehow it seemed to me that Dick did not want me to go and see you. I never could make out why, for he couldn't have been jealous of me, he added a little bitterly. But perhaps you've not heard that it's all up as regards my piece at the Opera Comique, he continued not noticing Kate's dejection in his excitement. "'No, I haven't heard,' she answered mechanically. "'Oh, it doesn't matter much, though, for I've just been down to the gaiety, and pretty well settled that it's to be done in Manchester at the Prince's. So, you see, I don't let the grass grow under my feet, for my row with Mrs. Forrest only occurred this morning. Oh, but what's the matter, Kate? What has happened?' "'Oh, nothing, nothing. Tell me about Mrs. Forrest first. I want to know. Well, it's the funniest thing you ever heard in your life. Oh, but you won't tell Dick, because he forbade me ever to speak to you about Mrs. Forrest. Not that there's anything but business between them, that I swear to you. But do tell me, Kate, what's the matter? I never saw you look so sad in my life. Have you had any bad news? No, no. "'Tell me about Mrs. Forrest and your piece. I want to hear,' she exclaimed excitedly. "'Well, this is it,' said Montgomery, who saw in a glance that she was not to be contradicted, and that he had better get on with his story. "'In the first place, you know that the old creature has gone in for writing librettos herself, and has finished one about Buddhism, an absurdity. The opening chorus is fifty lines long, but she won't cut one.' but I'll tell you about that after. I was to get one hundred for setting this blessed production to music, and it was to follow my own piece, which was in rehearsal. Well, like a great fool, I was explaining to Dubois the bosh I was writing by the yard for this infernal opera of hers. I couldn't help it. She wouldn't take advice on any point. She's written the Song of the Sun God in Hexameters. I don't know what hexameters are, but I would as soon set Bradshaw. Leaving St Pancras, 9.25, arriving at... Uh, <laughs> with a puff-puff accompaniment on the trombone. <laughs> Go on with the story, cried Kate. Oh, well, I was explaining all this, said Montgomery, suddenly growing serious. 
Well, out she darted from behind the other wing. I never knew she was there. She called me a thief and said she wouldn't have me another five minutes in her theatre. Monty, the Italian composer, was sent for. I was shoved out bag and baggage, and there'll be no more rehearsals till the new music is ready. That's all. Oh, I'm very sorry for you. Very sorry, said Kate very quietly, and she raised her hand to brush away a tear. Oh, I don't care. I'd sooner have the piece done in Manchester. Of course, it's a bore losing a hundred pounds. Oh, but, oh, Kate, do tell me what's the matter. You know you can confide in me. You know I'm your friend. At these kind words, the cold, deadly grief that encircled Kate's heart like a band of steel melted, and she wept profusely. Montgomery drew her arm into his and pleaded and begged to be told the reason of these tears, but she could make no answer, and pressed Dick's letter into his hand with a passionate gesture. He read it at a glance and then hesitated, unable to make up his mind as to what he should do. No words seemed to him adequate wherewith to console her, and she was sobbing so bitterly that it was beginning to attract attention in the streets. They walked on without speaking for a few yards, Kate leaning upon Montgomery, until a hackney coachman, guessing that something was wrong, signed to them with his whip. "'Where are you living, dear?' Kate told him with some difficulty, and having directed the driver, he lapsed again into considering what course he should adopt. To put off the journey was impossible. Dick had promised to meet him there. It was now three o'clock. He had therefore three hours to spend with Kate, with the woman whom he had loved steadfastly throughout a loveless life. He had no word of blame for Dick. He had heard stories that had made his blood run cold. And yet, knowing her faults as he did, he would have opened his arms had it been possible and crying through the fervour of years of waiting, said to her, "'Yes, I will believe in you. Believe in me, and you shall be happy.' There had never been a secret between them. Their souls had been forever as if in communication, and the love, unacknowledged in words, had long been as sunlight and moonlight, lighting the spaces of their dream life. To the woman it had been as a distant star, whose pale light was a presage of quietude in hours of vexation. To the man it seemed as a far Elysium, radiant with sweet longing, large hopes that waxed but never waned, and where the sweet breezes of eternal felicity blew in musical cadence. And yet he was deceived in nothing. He knew now, as he had known before, that although this dream might haunt him for ever, he should never hold it in his arms nor press it to his lips. And in the midst of this surging tide of misery there arose a desire that, glad in its own anguish, bade him increase the bitterness of these last hours by making a confession of his suffering. And exulting savagely in the martyrdom he was preparing for himself, he said, "'You know, Kate, I know you must know. You must have guessed that I care for you.' I may as well tell you the truth now. You're the only woman I ever loved. Oh, yes, she said. I always thought you cared for me. Oh, you have been very kind. Oh, very kind. And I often think of it. Oh, everybody has all my life long been very good to me. It's I alone whom to blame, who am in fault. I have, I know I have been very wicked, and I don't know why. I didn't mean it, I, I know I didn't, for I'm not at heart a wicked woman. I suppose things must have gone against me, that's about all. Montgomery pushed his glasses higher on his nose, and after a long silence he said, I've often thought that had you met me before you knew Dick, things might have been different. We should have got on better, although you might never have loved me so well. Kate raised her eyes, and she said, No one will ever know how I have loved, oh, how I still love that man. Oftentimes I think that had I loved him less, I should have been a better wife. I think he loved me, but it was not the love I dreamed of. Like you, I was always sentimental, 
and Dick never cared for that sort of thing. I think I should have understood you better, said Montgomery, and the conversation came to a pause. A vision of the life of devotion spent at the feet of an ideal lover, that life of sacrifice and tenderness which had been her dream and which she had so utterly failed to attain, again rose up to tantalise her like a glittering mirage, and she couldn't help wondering whether she would have realised this beautiful, this wonderful might have been, if she had chosen this other man. "'But I suppose you'll make it up with Dick,' said Montgomery, somewhat harshly. Kate awoke from her reverie with a start, and answered sorrowfully that she did not know, that she was afraid Dick would never forgive her again. "'I don't remember if I told you I'm going to see him in Manchester. He promised to go up there to make some arrangements about my peace.' "'No, you didn't tell me.' "'Well, I'll speak to him. I'll tell him I've seen you. "'I fancy I shall be able to make it all right,' he added with a feeble smile. "'Oh, how good you are! Oh, how good you are!' cried Kate, clasping her hands. "'If you'll only forgive me once again, I'll promise, I'll swear to him never to—to—' to... <laughs> Here Kate stopped abashed, and burying her face in her hands she wept bitterly. The tenderness, the melancholy serenity of their interview had somehow suddenly come to an end. Each was too much occupied with his or her thoughts to talk much, and the effort to find phrases grew more and more irritating. Both were very sad, and although they sighed when the clock struck the hour of farewell, they felt that to pass from one pain to another was in itself an assuagement. Kate accompanied Montgomery to the station. He seemed to her to be out of temper, and she to him to be further away than ever. The explanation that had taken place between them had, if not broken, at least altered the old bonds of sympathy without creating new ones, and they were discontented even like children who remember for the first time that today is not yesterday. They felt lonely watching the parallel lines of platforms, and when Montgomery waved his hand for the last time, and the train rolled into the luminous arch of sky that lay beyond the glass roofing, Kate turned away, overpowered by grief and cruel recollections. When she got home, the solitude of her room became unbearable, she wanted someone to see, someone to console her. She had a few shillings in her pocket, but she remembered her resolutions and for some time resented the impervious clutch of the temptation. But the sorrow that hung about her, that penetrated like a corrosive acid into the very marrow of her bones, grew momentarily more burning, more unendurable. Twenty times she tried to wrench it out of her heart, the landlady brought her up some tea. She couldn't drink it. It tasted like soap suds in her mouth. And then, knowing well what the results would be, she resolved to go out for a walk. Next day she was ill, and to pull herself together it was necessary to have a drink. It would not do to look too great a sight in the solicitor's office where Dick had told her in his letter to go and get her money. There she found not two, but five pounds awaiting her, and this enabled her to keep up a stage of semi-intoxication until the end of the week. She at last woke up speechless, suffering terrible palpitations of the heart, but she had strength enough to ring her bell, and when the landlady came to her she nearly lost her balance and fell to the ground, so strenuously did Kate lean and cling to her for support. After gasping painfully for some moments, Kate muttered, "'I'm dying! These palpitations and the pain in my side!' The landlady asked if she'd like to see the doctor, and with difficulty obtained her consent that the doctor should be sent for. "'I'll send at once,' she said. "'No, not at once,' Kate cried. "'Pour me out a little brandy and water, and I'll see how I am in the course of the day.' The woman did as was desired, and Kate told her that she felt better, and that if it wasn't for the pains in her side, she'd be all right. The landlady looked a little incredulous, but her lodger had only been with her a fortnight, and so carefully had the brandy been hidden, and the inebriety concealed, 
that although she had her doubts she was not yet satisfied that kate was an habitual drunkard certainly appearances were against mrs lennox but as regards the brandy bottle she had watched it very carefully and was convinced that scarcely more than six pennyworth of liquor went out of it daily the good woman did not know how it was replenished from another bottle that came sometimes from under the mattress and sometimes out of the chimney and the disappearance of the husband was satisfactorily accounted for by the announcement that he had gone to manchester to produce a new piece besides mrs lennox was a very nice person it was a pleasure to attend to her and during the course of the afternoon mrs white called several times at the second floor to inquire after her lodger's health but there was no change for the better looking the picture of wretchedness kate lay back in her chair declaring in low moans that she never felt so ill in her life that the pain in her side was killing her at first mrs white seemed inclined to make light of all this complaining but towards evening she began to grow alarmed and urged that the doctor should be sent for i assure you ma'am she said it's always better to see a doctor the money's never thrown away for even if there's nothing serious the matter it eases one's mind to be told so kate was generally easy to persuade but fearing that her secret drinking would be discovered she declined for a long time to take medical advice at last she was obliged to give way and the die having been cast she commenced to think how she might conceal part of the truth something of the coquetry of the actress returned to her and getting up from her chair she went over to the glass to examine herself and brushing back her hair she said sorrowfully oh, i'm a complete wreck i can't think what's the matter with me and i've lost all my hair oh you've no idea mrs white of the beautiful hair i used to have it used to fall in armfuls over my shoulders now it's no more than a wisp i think you've a great deal yet replied mrs white not wishing to discourage her oh and how yellow i am too to this mrs white mumbled something that was inaudible and kate thought suddenly of her rouge pot and hare's foot her make-up and all her little souvenirs of dick lay securely packed away in an old bandbox mrs white she said might i ask you to get me a jug of hot water when the woman left the room everything was spread hurriedly over the toilet table to see her one would have thought that the call boy had knocked at the door for the second time a thin coating of cold cream was passed over the face and neck then the powder puff changed what was yellow into white and then the hare's foot gave a bloom to the cheeks the pencil was not necessary her eyebrows being by nature dark and well defined then all disappeared again into the bandbox a drain was taken out of the bottle while she listened to steps on the stairs and she had just time to get back to her chair when the doctor entered she felt quite prepared to receive him mrs white who had come up at the same time looked uneasily around and after hesitating about the confines of the room she put the water jug on the rosewood cabinet and said i think i'll leave you alone with the doctor ma'am if you want me you'll ring mr hooper was a short stout man with a large bald forehead and long black hair his small eyes were watchful as a ferret's and his fat chubby hands were constantly laid on his kneecaps i met mrs white's servant in the street he said looking at kate as if he were trying to read through the rouge on her face so i came at once mrs white with whom i was speaking downstairs tells me you're suffering from a pain in your side yes doctor on the right side and i've, I've not been feeling very well lately is your appetite good will you let me feel your pulse no i've scarcely any appetite at all particularly in the morning i can't touch anything for breakfast don't you care to drink anything aren't you thirsty kate would have liked to have told a lie but fearing that she might endanger her life by doing so she answered oh yes i'm constantly very thirsty especially at night time it was irritating to have your life read thus and kate felt angry when she saw this dispassionate man watching the brandy bottle which she had forgotten to put away 
do you ever find it necessary to take any stimulant grasping at the word necessary she replied oh, yes doctor my life isn't a very happy one and i often feel so low so depressed as it were that if i didn't take a little something to keep me up i think i should do away with myself your husband is an actor i believe yes but he's at present up in manchester producing a new piece i'm on the stage too i've been playing a round of leading parts in the provinces but since i've been in london i've been out of an engagement i just asked you because i noticed you used a little powder you know on the face of course i can't judge at present what your complexion is but have you noticed any yellowness about the skin lately the first instinct of a woman who drinks is to conceal her vice and although she was talking to a doctor kate was again conscious of a feeling of resentment against the merciless eyes which saw through all the secrets of her life but cowed as it were by the certitude expressed by the doctor's looks and words she strove to equivocate and answered humbly that she noticed her skin was not looking as clear as it used to dr hooper then questioned her further he asked if she suffered from a sense of uncomfortable tension fullness and weight especially after meals if she felt any pain in her right shoulder and she confessed that he was right in all his surmises Oh, do tell me doctor what's the matter with me i assure you i'd really much sooner know the worst but the doctor did not seem inclined to be communicative and in reply to her question he merely mumbled something to the effect that the liver was out of order i will send you over some medicine this evening he said and if you don't feel better tomorrow send round for me and don't attempt to get up i think he added as he took up his hat to go i shall be able to put you all right but you must follow my instructions you mustn't frighten yourself and take as little of that stimulant as possible kate answered that it was not her custom to take too much and she tried to look surprised at the warning she nevertheless derived a good deal of comfort from the doctor's visit and during the course of the evening succeeded in persuading herself that her fears of the morning were ill-founded and putting the medicine that was sent her away for the present she helped herself from a bottle that was hidden in the upholstery the fact of having a long letter to write to dick explaining her conduct made it quite necessary that she should take something to keep her up and sitting in her lonely room she drank on steadily until midnight when she could only just drag her clothes from her back and throw herself stupidly into bed there she passed a night full of livid hued nightmares from which she awoke shivering and suffering from terrible palpitations of the heart the silence of the house filled her with terrors cold and obtuse as the dreams from which she awakened strength to scream for help she had none and thinking she was going to die she sought for relief and consolation in the bottle that lay hidden under the carpet when the drink took effect upon her she broke out into a profuse perspiration and she managed to get a little sleep but when her breakfast was brought up about eleven o'clock in the morning so ill did she seem that the servant fearing she was going to drop down dead begged to be allowed to fetch the doctor but rejecting all offers of assistance kate lay moaning in an armchair unable even to taste the cup of tea that the maid pressed upon her she consented to take some of the medicines that were ordered her but whatever good they might have produced was discounted by the constant nip drinking she kept up during the afternoon the next day she was very ill indeed and mrs white greatly alarmed insisted on sending for dr hooper he did not seem astonished at the change in his patient calmly and quietly he watched for some moments in silence the bed had curtains of a red and antiquated material and these contrasted with the paleness of the sheets wherein kate lay tossing feverishly most of the make-up had been rubbed away from her face and through patches of red and white the yellow skin started like blisters she was slightly delirious and when the doctor took her hand to feel her pulse she gazed at him with her big staring eyes and spoke volubly and excitedly oh, i'm so glad you've come for i wanted to speak to you about my husband 
i think i told you he'd gone to manchester to produce a new piece i don't know if i led you to suppose that he deserted me but if i did i was wrong to do so for he's done nothing of the kind it's true that we aren't very happy together but i dare say that's my fault i never was i know as good a wife to him as i intended to be but then he made me jealous and sometimes i was mad oh yes i think i must have been mad to have spoken to him in the way i did anyhow it doesn't matter now does it doctor but i don't know what i'm saying still you won't mention that i've told you anything it's as likely as not that he'll forgive me just as he did before and we may yet be as happy as we were at blackpool you won't tell him will you doctor no no i won't said dr hooper quietly and firmly but you mustn't talk as much as you do if you want to see your husband you must get well first oh yes i must get well oh but tell me doctor how long will that take not very long if you will keep quiet and do what i tell you i want you to tell me how the pain in your side is very bad far worse than when i saw you last i feel it now in my right shoulder as well but your side is it sore when you touch it will you let me feel without waiting for a reply he passed his hand under the sheet is it there that it pains you yes oh yes you're hurting me then the doctor walked aside with the landlady who had been watching the examination of the patient with anxious eyes she said do you think it's anything very dangerous is it contagious had i better send her to the hospital no i should scarcely think it worth while doing that she will be well in a week that is to say if she's properly looked after she's suffering from acute congestion of the liver brought on by by drink said mrs white i suspected as much oh you've too much to do mrs white with all your children to give up your time to nursing her i shall send someone round as soon as possible but in the meantime will you see that her diet is regulated to half a cup of beef tea every hour or so if she complains of thirst let her have some milk to drink and you may mix a little brandy with it to-night i shall send round a sleeping draught you're sure doctor there's nothing catching for you know that with all my children in the house you need not be alarmed mrs white uh, but you think doctor it'll be an expensive illness for i know very little about her circumstances i expect she'll be all right in a week or ten days but what i fear for is her future i've had a good deal of experience in such matters and i've never known a case of a woman who cured herself of the vice of intemperance a man sometimes a woman never the landlady sighed and referred to all she had gone through during poor mr white's lifetime the doctor spoke confidingly of a lady who was at present under his charge and apparently overcome with pity for suffering humanity they descended the staircase together on the doorstep the conversation was continued very well then doctor i will take your advice but at the end of a week or so when she's quite recovered i shall tell her that i've let her rooms for as you say a woman rarely cures herself and before the children the example would be dreadful i expect to see her on her feet in about that time then you can do as you please i shall call to-morrow next day the professional nurse took her place by the bedside the sinapism which the doctor ordered was applied to the hepatic region and a small dose of calomel was administered under this treatment she improved rapidly but unfortunately as her health returned her taste for drink increased in a like proportion indeed it was almost impossible to keep her from it and on one occasion she tried very cunningly to outwit the nurse who had fallen asleep in her chair waiting patiently until the woman's snoring had become sufficiently regular to warrant the possibility of a successful attempt being made on the brandy bottle kate slipped noiselessly out of bed the unseen night-light cast a rosy glow over the convex side of the basin without however disturbing the bare darkness of the wall kate knew that all the bottles stood in a line upon the chest of drawers but it was difficult to distinguish one from the other 
and the jingling she made as she fumbled amid them awoke the nurse, who, divining at once what was happening, arose quickly from her chair and, advancing rapidly towards her, said, "'No, ma'am, I really can't allow it. It's against the doctor's orders.' "'I'm not going to die of thirst to please any doctor. I was only going to take a little milk. I suppose there's no harm in that?' "'Not the least, ma'am, and if you'd called me, you should have had it.' It was owing to this fortuitous intervention that when Dr. Hooper called a couple of days after to see his patient, he was able to certify to a remarkable change for the better in her. All the distressing symptoms had disappeared, the pain in her side had died away, the complexion was clearer. He therefore thought himself justified in ordering for her lunch a little fish and some weak brandy and water, and to Kate, who had not eaten any solid food for several days, this first meal took the importance of a very exceptional event. Sitting by her bedside, Dr. Hooper spoke to her. "'Now, Mrs. Lennox,' he said, "'I want to give you a word of warning. "'I've seen you through what I must specify as a serious illness. "'Dangerous, I will not call it, "'although I might do so if I were to look into the future "'and anticipate the development the disease will most certainly take.' unless indeed you will be guided by me and make a vow against all intoxicating liquors. At this direct allusion to her vice, Kate stopped eating, and putting down the fork, looked at the doctor. Now, Mrs. Lennox, you mustn't be angry, he continued in his kind way. I'm speaking to you in my capacity as a medical man, and I must warn you against the continuous nip-drinking, which, of course, I can see you're in the habit of indulging in, and which was the cause of the illness from which you're recovering. I will not harrow your feelings by referring to all the cases that have come under my notice, where shame, disgrace, ruin, and death were the result of that one melancholy failing, drink. Oh, sir! cried Kate, broken-hearted. If you only knew how unhappy I've been, how miserable I am, you wouldn't speak to me so. I've my failing, it is true, but I'm driven to it. I love my husband better than anything in the world, and I see him mixed up always with a lot of girls at the theatre, and it sends me mad. And then I go to drink so as to forget." We've all got our troubles, but it doesn't relieve us of the burden. It only makes us forget it for a short time, and then when consciousness returns to us, we only remember it all the more bitterly. No, Mrs. Lennox, take my advice. In a few days when you're well, go to your husband, demand his forgiveness, and resolve then never to touch spirits again. "'It's very good of you to speak to me in this way,' said Kate tearfully, "'and I will take your advice. "'The very first day that I'm strong enough to walk down to the Strand, "'I will go and see my husband, "'and if he will give me another trial, "'he will not, I swear to you, of course, to repent it. "'Oh,' she continued, "'you don't know how good he's been to me, "'how he has borne with me.' If it hadn't been that you tried my temper by flirting with other women, we might have been happy now. Then, as Kate proceeded to speak of her trials and temptations, she grew more and more excited and hysterical, until the doctor, fearing that she would bring on a relapse, was forced to plead an engagement and wish her good-bye. As he left the room, she cried after him, "'The first day I'm well enough to go out, I'll go and see my husband.' Chapter 29. The next few days passed like dreams. Kate's soul, tense with the longing for reconciliation, floated at ease over the sordid miseries that lay within and without her, and enraptured with expectation, she lived in a beautiful paradise of hope. So certain did she feel of being able to cross out the last few years of her life, that her mind was scarcely clouded by a doubt of the possibility of his declining to forgive her, that he might even refuse to see her. The old days seemed charming to her, and looking back, even she seemed to have been perfect then. There her life appeared to have begun. She never thought of Hanley now, 
Ralph and Mrs. Ede were like dim shadows that had no concern in her existence. The potteries and the hills were as the recollections of childhood, dim and unimportant. The footlights and the applause of audiences were also dying echoes in her ears. Her life, for the moment, was concentrated in a loving memory of a Lancashire seashore and a rose-coloured room, where she used to sit on the knees of the man she adored. The languors and the mental weakness of convalescence were conducive to this state of mental exaltation. She loved him better than anyone else could love him. She would never touch brandy again. He would take her back, and they would live as the lovers did in all the novels she had ever read. These illusions filled Kate's mind like a scarf of white mist hanging around the face of a radiant morning, and as she lay back amid the pillows or sat dreaming by the fireside in the long evenings that were no longer lonely to her, she formed plans and considered how she should plead to Dick in this much-desired interview. During this period, Dozens of letters were written and destroyed, and it was not until the time arrived for her to go to the theatre to see him that she could decide upon what she could write. Then hastily she scribbled a note, but her hand trembled so much that before she had said half what she intended, the paper was covered with blotched and blurred lines. Oh, it won't do to let him think I'm drunk again, she said to herself as she threw aside what she had written and read over one of her previous efforts. It ran as follows. My darling Dick, you will, I am sure, be sorry to hear that I've been very ill. I am now, however, much better. Indeed, I may say, quite recovered. During my illness I've been thinking over our quarrels, and I now see how badly, how wickedly I've behaved to you on many occasions. I do not know, and I scarcely dare to hope that you will ever forgive me, but I trust that you will not refuse to see me for a few minutes. I have not, I assure you, tasted spirits for some weeks, so you needn't fear that I'll kick up a row. I will promise to be very quiet. I will not reproach you, nor get excited, nor raise my voice. I shall be very good, and will not detain you but for a very short time. Oh, you will not. You cannot, oh, my darling, deny me this one little request. To see you again, although only for a few minutes. Your affectionate wife, Kate. Compared with the fervid thoughts of her brain, these words appeared to her weak and poor, but feeling that for the moment at least she could not add to their intensity, she set out on her walk, hoping to find her husband at the theatre. It was about eight o'clock in the evening. A light grey fog hung over the background of the streets, and the line of the housetops was almost lost in the morose shadows that fell from a soot-coloured sky. Here and there a chimney stack or the sharp spire of a church tore the muslin-like curtains of descending mist, and vague as the mist were her thoughts. The streets twisted, wriggling their way through slime and gloom whilst at every turning the broad, flaring windows of the public houses marked the English highway. But Kate paid no attention to the red-lettered temptations. Docile and hopeful as a tired animal thinking of its stable, she walked through the dark crowd that pressed upon her, nor did she even notice when she was jostled, but went on, a heedless nondescript, a something in a black shawl and a quasi-respectable bonnet, a slippery stepping stone between the low women who whispered and the workwoman who hurried home with the tin of evening beer in her hand. Like one held and guided by the power of a dream, she lost consciousness of all that was not of it. Thoughts of how Dick would receive her and forgive her were folded, entangled and broken within narrow limits of time. Half an hour passed like a minute and she found herself at the stage door of the theatre. Drawing the letter from her pocket, she said to the hall-keeper, "'Will you kindly give Mr. Lennox this letter? Has he arrived yet?' "'Yes, but he's busy for the moment. Oh, but,' um, the man added, as he examined Kate's features narrowly, uh, "'you'll excuse me. I made a mistake. Mr. Lennox isn't in the theatre. 
At that moment the swinging door was thrust open and the call boy screamed, Mr Lennox says you're not to let Miss Thomas pass tonight and if there's any letters for him I'm to take them in. Here's one, will you give it to Mr Lennox? said Kate, eagerly thrusting forward her note. Say that I'm waiting for an answer. The stage doorkeeper tried to interpose, but before he could explain himself the boy had rushed away. All letters should be given to me he growled as he turned away to argue with Miss Thomas, who had just arrived. In a few minutes the call-boy came back. "'Will you please step this way?' he said to Kate. "'No, you shan't,' cried the hall-keeper. "'If you try any nonsense with me, I shall send round for a policeman.' Kate started back frightened, thinking these words were addressed to her, but a glance showed her that she was mistaken. "'Oh, how dare you talk to me like that! You're an unsophisticated beast!' cried Miss Thomas. "'Pass under my arm, ma'am,' said the hall-keeper. "'I don't want this one to get through.' And amid a storm of violent words and the strains of distant music, Kate went up a narrow staircase that creaked under the weight of a group of girls in strange dresses. When she got past them, she saw Dick at the door of his room, waiting for her. The table was covered with letters, the walls with bills announcing a great success. He took her hand and placed her in a chair, and at first it seemed doubtful who would break an awkward and irritating silence. At last Dick said, "'I'm sorry to hear, Kate, that you've been ill. You're looking well now.' "'Yes, I'm better now,' she replied drearily. "But." Perhaps if I'd died it would have been as well, for you can never love me again. Oh, you know, my dear, he said, equivocating, that we didn't get on well together. Oh, Dick, I know it. You were very good to me, and I made your life wretched on account of my jealousy. But I couldn't help it, for I loved you better than a woman ever loved a man. I cannot tell you, I cannot find words to express how much I love you. You're everything to me. I lived for your love, and I'm dying of it. Yes, Dick, I'm dying for love of you. I feel it here. It devours me like a fire. And what is so strange is that nothing seems real to me except you. I never think of anything but of things that concern you. Anything that ever belonged to you I treasure up as a relic. You know the chaplet of pearls I used to wear when we played the lover's knot? Well, I have them still, although all else has gone from me. The string was broken once or twice, and some of the pearls were lost. But I threaded them again, and it still goes round my neck. I was looking at them the other day, and it made me very sad, for it made me think of the happy days, oh, the very happy days that we have had together before I took to... <laughs> oh, but I won't speak of that. I've cured myself. Yes, I assure you, Dick, I've cured myself, and it's for that I've come to talk to you. Were I not sure that I would never touch Brandy again, I wouldn't ask you to take me back. But I'd sooner die than do what I've done, for I know that I never will. Can you... Will you, my own darling Dick, give me another trial? The victory hung in the balance, but at that moment a superb girl in all the splendour of long green tights and resplendent with breastplate and spear flung open the door. Look here, Dick, she began, but seeing Kate, she stopped short and stammered out an apology. "'I shall be down on the stage in a minute, dear,' he said, rising from his chair. The door was shut, and they were again alone, but Kate felt that chance had gone against her. The interruption had, with a sudden shock, killed the emotions she had succeeded in awakening, and had supplied Dick with an answer that would lead him, by a way after his own heart, straight out of his difficulty. "'My dear,' he said, rising from his chair, I'm glad you've given up the uh, you-know-what, for between you and me that was the cause of all our trouble. But, candidly speaking, I don't think it would be advisable for us to live together, at least for the present, and I'll tell you why. I know that you love me very much, 
but as you said yourself just now it's your jealousy and the drink together that excites you and leads up to these terrible rows now the best plan would be for us to live apart let us say for six months or so until you've entirely gotten over your little weakness you know and then why we'll be as happy as we used to be at blackpool in the dear old times long ago oh dick don't say that i must wait six months i might be dead before then but you're not speaking the truth to me you were just going to say that i might come back to you when the horrid girl came in i know yes i believe there's something between you now kate remember your promise not to kick up a row i consented to see you because you said you wouldn't be violent here's your letter i'm not going to be violent dick but six months seems such a long time it won't be as long passing as you think and now i must run away they're waiting for me on the stage have you seen the piece would you like to go in front no not to-night dick i feel too sad but won't you kiss me before i go dick bent his face and kissed her but there was a chill in the kiss that went to her heart and she felt that his lips would never touch hers again but she had no protest to make and almost in silence she allowed herself to be shown out of the theatre when she got into the mist she shivered a little and drew her thin shawl tighter about her thin shoulders and with one of the choruses still ringing in her ears she walked in the direction of the strand somehow her sorrow did not seem too great for her to bear the interview had passed neither as badly nor as well as had been expected and thinking of the six months of probation that lay before her but without being in the least able to realize their meaning she walked dreaming through the sloppy fog-smelling streets the lamps were now but like furred patches of yellow laid on a dead grey background and a mud-bespattered crowd rolled in and out of the darkness the roofs overhead were engulfed in the soot-coloured sky that seemed to be descending on the heads of the passengers men passed carrying parcels the white necktie of a theatre-goer was caught sight of from lambeth from islington from pimlico from all the dark corners where it had been lurking in the daytime prostitution at the fading of the light had descended on the town portly matrons very respectable in brown silk dresses and veils stood in the corners of alleys and dingy courts scorned by the younger generation young girls of fifteen and sixteen going by in couples with wisps of dyed hair hanging about their shoulders advertisements of their age the elder taking the responsibility of choosing germans in long ulsters trafficked in guttural intonations policemen on their beats could have looked less concerned the english hung around the public houses enviously watching the arched insteps of the french women tripping by smiles there were plenty but the fog was so thick that even the parisians lost their native levity and wished themselves back in paris at the crossing of wellington street she stumbled against a small man who leaned against a doorway coughing violently they stared at each other in profound astonishment and then kate said in a pained and broken voice oh ralph is it you yes indeed it is but to think of meeting you here in london they had for the second in a sort of way forgotten that they had once been man and wife and after a pause kate said oh but that's just what i was thinking what are you doing in london ralph was about to answer when he was cut short by a fit of coughing his head sank into his chest and his little body was shaken until it seemed as if it were going to break to pieces like a bundle of sticks kate looked at him pityingly and passing unconsciously over the dividing years just as she might have done when they kept shop together in hanley she said oh you know you shouldn't stop out in such weather as this you'll be breathless to-morrow oh no i shan't i've got a new remedy but i've lost my way that's the reason why i'm so late or oh, perhaps i can tell you where are you staying 
Oh, in a hotel in Bedford Street, near Covent Garden. Well, then, this is your way. You've come too far. And passing again into the jostling crowd, they walked on in silence, side by side. A slanting cloud of fog had drifted from the river down into the street, creating a shivering and terrifying darkness. The cabs moved at walking pace, the huge omnibuses stopped belated, and their advertisements could not be read, even when a block occurred close under a gas lamp. The jeweller's windows emitted the most light, but even gold and silver wares seemed to have become tarnished in the sickening atmosphere. Then the smell from fishmongers' shops grew more sour as the assistant piled up the lobsters and flooded the marbles preparatory to closing, and just within the circle of vision, inhaling the greasy fragrance of soup, a woman in a blue bonnet loitered near a grating. Oh, "'This is Bedford Street, I think,' said Kate, "'but it's so dark that it's impossible to see.' "'I suppose you know London well.' replied Ralph, somewhat pointedly. "'Pretty well. I've been here now for some time.' For the last three or four minutes not a word had been spoken. Kate was surprised that Ralph was not angry with her. She wanted to speak to him of old times, but it was hard to break the ice of intervening years. At last, as they stopped before the door of a small family hotel, he said, "'It's now something like four years since we parted, ain't it?' The question startled her, but she answered nervously and hurriedly. Oh, I suppose it is, oh, but I'd better wish you good-bye now. You're safe at home. Oh, no, come in. You look so very tired, a glass of wine will do you good. Besides, what harm? Wasn't I your husband once? Oh, Ralph, how can you? Why, well, there's no reason why I shouldn't hear how you've been getting on. We're just like strangers, so many things have occurred. I've married since. Oh, but perhaps you didn't hear of it. Married? Who did you marry? Well, I married your assistant, Hender. What? Hender, your wife? said Kate, with an intonation of voice that was full of pain. A dagger thrust suddenly through her side as she went up the staircase could not have wounded her more cruelly than the news that the woman who had been her assistant now owned the house that once was hers. The story of the dog in the manger is as old as the world. Through the windows of the little public sitting-room nothing was visible. Everything was shrouded in the yellow curtain of fog. A commercial traveller had drawn off his boots and was warming his slippered feet by the fire. "'Dreadful weather, sir,' said the man. "'I'm afraid it won't do your cough much good. "'Will you come near the fire?' Oh, "'Thank you,' said Ralph. "'Kate mechanically drew forward a chair. "'It would be impossible for them to say a word, "'for the traveller was evidently inclined to be garrulous, "'and both wondered what they should do. "'But at that moment the chambermaid came to announce "'that the gentleman's room was ready. "'He took up his boots and retired.' leaving the two who had once been husband and wife alone. And yet it seemed as difficult as ever to speak of what was uppermost in their minds. Kate helped Ralph off with his greatcoat, and she noticed that he looked thinner and paler. The servant brought up two glasses of grog, and when Kate had taken off her bonnet she said, "'Do you think I'm much altered?' "'Well, since you ask me, Kate, I must say I don't think you're looking very well.' "'You're thinner than you used to be, and you've lost a good deal of your hair.' "'I've only just recovered from a bad illness,' she said, sighing, and as she raised the glass to her lips, the gaslight defined the whole contour of her head. The thick hair that used to encircle her pale prominent temples like rich velvet looked now like a black silk band, frayed and whitened at the seam.' "'But what have you been doing? Have things gone pretty well with you?' said Ralph, whose breath came from him in a thin but continuous whistle. "'What happened when I got my decree of divorce?' "'Oh, nothing particular for a while, but afterwards we were married.' "'Oh,' said Ralph, "'so he married you, did he? Well, I shouldn't have expected it of him. So we're both married, isn't it odd? And meeting, too, in this way.' "'Yes, many things have happened since then. 
i've been on the stage travelling all over england what you on the stage kate said ralph lifting his head from his hand oh lord oh lord how <laughs> oh but i mustn't laugh i won't be able to breathe kate turned to him almost angrily and the ghost of the prima donna awakening in her she said i don't see what there is to laugh at i've played all the leading parts and in all the principal towns in england liverpool manchester and leeds the newcastle chronicle said my sir Paulette was the best they'd seen ralph looked bewildered like a man blinded for a moment by a sudden flash of lightning he could not at once realise that this woman who had been his wife who had washed and scrubbed in his little home in hanley was now one of those luminous women who in clear skirts and pink stockings wander singing beautiful songs amid illimitable forests and unscalable mountains for a moment he regretted he had married miss hender but i don't think i shall ever act again how's that he said with an intonation of disappointment in his voice i don't know said kate i'm not living with my husband now and i haven't the courage to look out for an engagement myself ralph stared at her vaguely look out for an engagement he repeated to himself it seemed to him that he must be dreaming aren't you happy with him doesn't he treat you well said ralph dropping perforce from his dream back into reality oh yes he's always been very good to me i can't say how it was but somehow after a time we didn't get on i dare say it was my fault but how do you get on with miss hender said kate partly from curiosity and half from a wish to change the conversation oh pretty well said ralph with something that sounded in spite of his wheezing like a sigh how does she manage the dressmaking she was always a good workwoman but she never had much taste and i should fancy wouldn't be able to do much if left entirely to herself oh, that's just what occurred it's curious you should have guessed so correctly the business has all gone to the dogs and since mother's death we've turned the house into a lodging house oh and is mother dead cried kate clasping her hands oh, what must she have thought of me ralph did not answer but after a long silence he said it's a pity ain't it that we didn't pull it off better together kate raised her head and looked at him quickly her look was full of gratitude yes she said i behaved very badly towards you but i believe i've been punished for it you told me that he'd married you and treated you very well oh she said bursting into tears don't ask me it's too long a story i'll tell you another time but not now it appeared to kate that her heart was on fire and that she must die of grief was this life she asked herself oh to be at rest and out of the way for ever ralph too seemed deeply affected after a pause he said i don't know how it was or why now i come to think of it i remember that i used to be cross with you oh it was the asthma that made you cross and well it might and she asked him if he still suffered from asthma and he answered oh, at times yes oh but the cigarettes she said used to relieve you do you still smoke them yes and sometimes they relieve me and sometimes they don't a long silence separated them and breaking it suddenly he said there were faults on both sides on every side he added for i don't exempt mother from blame either she was always too hard on you now i should never have minded your going to the theatre and amusing yourself i shouldn't have minded your being an actress and i should have gone to fetch you home every evening kate smiled through her misery and he continued following his idea to the end it wouldn't have interfered with the business if you had been on the contrary it would have brought us a connection and i might have had up those plate glass windows and taken in the fruiterer's shop ralph stopped the roar of london had sunk out of hearing in the yellow depths of the fog and for some minutes nothing was heard but the short ticking of the clock 
it was a melancholy pleasure to dream what might have been had things only taken a different turn and like children making mud pies it amused them to rebuild the little fabric of their lives while one reconstructed his vision of broken glass the other lamented over the ruins of penny journal sentiment then awakening by fits and starts each confided in the other ralph told kate how mrs ede had spoken of her when her flight had been discovered kate tried to explain that she was not as much to blame as might be imagined ralph's curiosity constantly got the better of him and he couldn't but ask her to tell him something about her stage experience one thing led to another and before twelve o'clock it surprised her to think she had told him so much the conversation was carried on in brief and broken phrases the man and woman sat close together shivering over the fire there were no curtains to the windows and the fog had crept through the sashes into the room kate coughed from time to time a sharp hacking cough and ralph's wheezing grew thicker in sound i'm afraid i shall have a bad night this dreadful weather i should like to stop to nurse you but i must be getting home oh you surely won't think of going out such a night as this you'll never find your way home oh yes yes i shall it wouldn't do for me to remain here they who had once been husband and wife looked at each other and both smiled painfully very well i'll see you downstairs oh no you mustn't you'll kill yourself ralph however insisted they stood on the doorstep for a moment together suffocating in a sulphur-hued atmosphere you'll come and see me again to-morrow won't you oh yes yes cried kate to-morrow to-morrow and she disappeared into the darkness End chapter thirty but on the morrow she could not leave her room and at the end of the week the news at the bedford hotel was that mr ede had gone away the day before without leaving any message the porter who informed her of his departure looked her over curiously setting her thinking that he thought mr ede had done well to get clear of the likes of her she had tried to make herself look tidy and thought that she had succeeded but tidy or untidy it was all the same nothing mattered now she was done for no doubt the porter was right ralph had gone away to escape from her which was just as well for what more had they to say to each other hadn't he married hender and passing in front of a shop window she caught sight of herself in a looking-glass <sighs> not up to much she said and passed on into the strand mumbling her misfortunes and causing the passers-by to look after her she had not pinned up her skirt safely a foot of it dragged over the pavement and hearing jeering voices behind her she went into a public house to ask for a pin the barmaid obliged her with one and while arranging her skirt she heard a man say well they that talk of the evil of drinking know very little of what they're talking about drink has saved as many men as it has killed kate's heart warmed to the man for she knew a glass had often saved her from making away with herself but never had she felt more like the river in her life than she did that morning three pennyworth would be enough she couldn't afford more dick was only allowing her two pounds a week and a woman had to look after the thirty-nine shillings very strictly to find the fortieth in her pocket before her next week's money was due she felt better after having her glass her thoughts were no longer on the river lying at the end of wellington street but on the passengers in the strand the swaggering mummers male and female the men with lordly airs and billycock hats the women with yellow hair and unholy looks upon their faces there were groups of men and women round a theatrical agent's place of business all sorts of people coming and going lawyers from the temple journalists on their way to fleet street prostitutes of all kinds and all sorts young and old fat and thin of all nationalities french belgian and german went by in couples in rows their eyes flaming invitations 
children with orange-coloured hair sold matches and were followed down suspicious alleys. A strange, hurried life, full of complexity, had begun in the twilight before the lamplighters went by. Girls and boys scrambled after each other, quarrelling and selling newspapers. The spectacle helped the time away between four o'clock and seven. At seven she turned into some eating house and dined for a shilling, and afterwards there was nothing to do than wander in the Strand. Some of the women who preferred to pick up a living by the sale of their lips, rather than by standing for hours over a stinking wash-tub, were very often kindly human beings, and there was nobody else except these street-walkers with whom she could exchange a few words and invite into a drinking shop for a glass. Over the counter she related her successes as Clairette in Madame Angot and Sir Paulette in Les Cloches de Cornville, and if an incredulous look came into the faces of her guests, she sang to them the little ditties, proving by her knowledge of them that all she told them was true. From the drinking shop they passed out in groups, and these women took Kate to their eating houses, and she listened to their stories, and when at the end of the week she had spent all her money, Sometimes these women lent her shillings and half-crowns, and when she could not return the money she had borrowed, they asked her, "'Why don't you do as we do?' Her pretty face of former days was almost gone by this time, but traces of it still remained. "'If you would only dress yourself a little more becomingly and come along with us, you'd be able to make two ends meet. With what you get from your husband you'd be better off than any of us.' but she could not be persuaded, and as time moved on and drunkenness became more inveterate, the belief that she was not utterly lost, unless she was unfaithful to Dick, took possession of her, and she clung to it with an almost desperate insistency, saying to her friends, "'If I were to do that, I should go down to the river and drown myself.' She used to hear laughter when she said these words, and the replies were that every woman had said the same thing. But we all come to it sooner or later. Oh, not me, not me, she replied, tottering out of the public house. But one night, awakening in the dusk between daylight and dark, she remembered that something had befallen her that had never befallen her before. She was not sure. It may have been that she had dreamed it. All the same, she could not rid herself of the idea that last night in the public house near Charing Cross a man had come in and said he would pay for the drinks, and that afterwards she had gone to one of the hotels in Villiers Street. If she hadn't, why did she think of Villiers Street? She rarely went down that street. Yet she was haunted by a memory, a hateful memory that had kept her awake and had caused her to moan and to cry for hours till at last sleep fell upon her. On waking, her first thought was to inquire from the women, and she walked up and down the strand, seeking them till nightfall. But they could tell her nothing of what had happened after she left them. "'Dry your eyes, Kate,' they said. "'What matter? Your husband deserted you. Aren't you free to live with whom you please?' Kate felt that all they said was true enough, but she prayed that the memory of the hotel bedroom that had risen up in her mind was the memory of a dream, and not of something that had befallen her in her waking senses. It were bad enough that she should have dreamed such a thing, and on returning home she fell on her knees and prayed that what she feared had been had not been, and she rose from her knees, her eyes full of tears, and a sort of leaden despair in her heart that she felt would never pass away. As the days went by, her mind became denser. She fell into obtusities, out of which she found it difficult to rouse herself. Even her violent temper seemed to leave her, and miserable and hopeless, she rolled from one lodging to another, drinking heavily, bringing the drink back with her, and drinking in her bed until her hand was too unsteady to pour out another glass of whisky. She drank whisky, brandy, gin, and if she couldn't get these, any other spirit would serve her purpose, even methylated spirit. Her bed curtains were taken away by the landlady, lest Kate should set them on fire. The landlady lit the gas at nightfall and turned it out before she went to bed. 
only in that way she said to herself can we be sure that that woman won't burn us all to death in our beds once a room is let she continued it's hard to turn a sick woman out especially if there's no excuse and in this case there's none for you see mrs lennox is getting two pounds a week from her husband mr locker mrs rawson's evening friend agreed with her and he spoke of the recompense she would be entitled to from mr lennox in the event of mrs lennox's death for of course every trouble and annoyance should be recompensed she agreed with him but her eyes suddenly softening she said i haven't seen her since this morning when i took her up a cup of tea she may like a bit of dinner we're having some rabbit for supper i'll ask her if she'd like a piece a few minutes later she returned saying she was afraid mrs lennox was dying and that it might be as well to send to the hospital locker answered that perhaps it would be just as well but on second thoughts he suggested that the husband should be communicated with it isn't far to the opera comique mrs rawson answered i'll just put on my hat and jacket and go round there it'll be the best way to escape responsibility locker said on the doorstep but without answering she went up the strand passing over to the other side when she came in sight of the globe theatre where's the stage entrance of the opera comique she asked at the bookstall at the corner of hollywell street and was told that she would find the stage entrance in which street about half way down the street the stage doors of the globe and the opera comique are side by side was cried after her what does he mean by half way down the street she muttered he meant a quarter down and she addressed herself to the doorkeeper who answered surlily that mr lennox was particularly engaged at that moment but at mrs rawson's words i believe his wife is dying he agreed to send up a message as soon as he could get hold of somebody to take it at last somebody's dresser was stopped as he was about to pass through the swing door he agreed to take the message and a few minutes after mrs rawson was conducted up several little staircases and down some passages to find herself eventually in a small room in which there were three people one a pleasant-faced man so affable and kind that mrs rawson thought she could have got on with him very well if she had had a chance by him stood a tall imperious lady who rustled a voluminous skirt a person of importance mrs rawson judged her to be from the deference with which a little thread-paper man listened to her the costumier she learned from scraps of conversation i'm sorry mr lennox said all you tell me is very sad but i'm afraid i can do nothing oh that's what i think myself mrs rawson answered i'm afraid there's nothing to be done but i thought i'd better come and tell you you see when i went up with some beef tea she looked to me like one that hasn't many days to live i may be mistaken of course she should have a nurse mrs forrest said oh i do all i can for her mrs rawson murmured but you see with three children to look after and only one maid the two women began to talk together and the thread-paper man took advantage of the opportunity to whisper to dick that he thought he could manage to do the flower-girl's dresses at five shillings less that will be all right dick replied i will call round in the morning mr shaffle mrs forrest held out her jacket to dick who helped her into it where are you going shall you be coming back again he asked i'm going to nurse your wife dick she said picking up her long feather boa and isn't all that is happening now a vindication that we did well not to yield ourselves to ourselves for had we done so our regrets would be now unanimous and i shouldn't be able to go to her with clear conscience she's been drinking heavily again no doubt mrs forrest said turning to mrs rawson but we mustn't judge or condemn any one so jesus hath said i'll go with you now mrs rawson and you'll perhaps come to-morrow dick to see her if i could help my wife i'd go laura but as i've often told you my will to help her was spent long ago it would be of no use laura's eyes lit up for a moment but if she asked to see me i'll go at these words mrs forrest's eyes softened 
and he began to ask himself how much truth there was in Laura's resolve to go and attend upon his wife in what was no doubt a last agony. Seeing and hearing her put into his head remembrances of an actress, he couldn't remember which. Her demeanour was as lofty as any, and her speech almost rose into blank verse at times, and he began to think that she had missed her vocation in life. It might have been that she was destined by nature for the stage. "'She's more mamma than myself or Kate,' he said to himself, and giving an ear to her outpourings, he recognised in them the rudiments of the grand style, and he admired her transitions. Her voice would drop, and she seemed to find her way back into homely speech. Her soul seemed to pass back and forwards easily, and Dick did not feel sure which was the real woman and which the fictitious. "'She doesn't know herself,' he said, for at that moment she had left the tripod and was sitting in imagination at the bedside in attendance, looking from the patient to the clock, administering the medicine on the exact time. When Mrs. Rawson spoke about the length of the day and night, she answered that she would take her work with her, and bade Dick not to be anxious about the changes he had asked her to make in the second act. "'They shall be made,' she said, "'and without laying myself open to any claim for demurrage.' "'Demurrage!' Dick exclaimed. "'She shall have attendance, but a soul ready to depart "'shouldn't be detained in port longer than is necessary. "'And Mrs. Rawson would like to let her room "'to one who has not received her sailing orders, "'as is the case with your poor wife, Dick. "'That is to say, if I understand Mrs. Rawson's account of her illness.' "'Oh, she's not here for long,' Mrs. Rawson answered. "'Oh, but you mustn't think, ma'am, that I'd lay any under claim for the trouble she's been to me, only what is fair. Fair is fair all the world over, has been my maxim, ever since I started letting apartments. Uh, but perhaps, ma'am, you'll be wanting a room in my house. If you do, there's a drawing-room floor, which would suit you nicely. Oh, but you can't be day-nurse and night-nurse yourself.' Laura answered that that was true, and talking of a nurse from Charing Cross Hospital, they went out of the house together. At the end of the street, Laura stopped suddenly. "'But she must have a doctor,' she said, and waited for Mrs. Rawson to recommend one. And Mrs. Rawson replied that the doctor that attended her and her children was out of town. "'We will ask here,' Laura said, and called to the cabby to stop at the apothecary's and the questions she put to the man behind the counter were so pertinent that Mrs. Rawson began to think that perhaps she had misjudged Mrs. Forrest, who now seemed to her a sensible and practical woman. They jumped again into a cab, and after a short drive returned with the doctor, Laura relating to him in the cab all they knew about his patient. "'From what you tell me, it seems a bad case,' he said, and turning from Laura to Mrs. Rawson, he asked her to describe the patient." "'When I took up the beef tea I found her that bad "'that I felt I'd always have it on my conscience "'if I didn't let her husband know how bad his wife was. "'I'm afraid, Doctor, that she's been drinking for years,' Laura interjected. "'Well, as soon as I see Mrs. Lennox, "'I shall be able to tell you if there is, in my opinion, "'any reasonable hope of saving her. "'I believe you're going to nurse Mrs. Lennox through this illness?' "'he asked Laura.' and she began to tell him how she had always known of this duty. Years before she had ever met Mr. Lennox, it had been revealed to her. Not the exact time, but the fact that she would have to attend upon the wife of some man who would be engaged in the publication of some of her works. You see, her husband is producing my play Incarnation at the Opera Comique, and I've brought some of my work with me. She opened her bag and laid on the table the manuscript entitled Sayings of the Sibyl, and the doctor listened, at first not satisfied that she was altogether the nurse into whose charge he would have liked to have given Mrs. Lennox, but feeling that if he were to press the necessity of a nurse on Mrs. Forrest she might leave, he refrained, thinking that very often people who talked eccentrically were very practical. He had known extravagant speech go with practical nursing, and hoping that Mrs. Forrest would prove another such one, he laid down the manuscript on the table. "'But if you believe that we live hereafter, 
why should you deny pre-existence and without waiting for the doctor to answer laura averred that she had lived at least eight times already witnessing the dread contest of death and dying for the cause of pan and the light king and eros the immortal whose i am she said and once again for the ninth time i live and watch the contest watch with joy which overcomes fear with love that conquers death well i hope we shall be able to conquer death in this instance the doctor answered and with care we may save her for some time and if ah if laura interjected and curtsying to him she led the doctor to the door nothing she began can be worse than the present state of earth life and in all its phases if the human race is to be evolved into a higher degree of perfection no weak half-measures will avail to effect the change there must on the contrary be a radical change in hereditary environment the doctor listened a moment and as if enchanted with the impression she had produced laura went back to the writing-table and settling the folds of her brown silk widely over the floor she began to write ye gods they fail they falter thy hand hath struck them down their woof the parquet altar beware thy mother's frown what such as i in glory compared with such as thee would in the conflict gory that i had died for thee at this point the inspiration seemed to desert her and raising her pen from the paper she bit its end thoughtfully seeking for a transitional phrase whereby she might be able to allude to the light god they were in a six shilling a week bedroom in the neighbourhood of the strand the window looked on to a bit of red tiled roofing a cistern and a clothesline on which a petticoat flapped and in a small iron bedstead facing the light kate lay delirious her stomach enormously distended by dropsy from time to time she waved her arms now wasted to mere bones she had been insensible for three whole days speaking in broken phrases of her past life of mrs ede the potteries the two little girls annie and lizzie dick she declared had been very good to her ralph too had been kind and she was determined that the two men shouldn't quarrel over her they mustn't kill each other she wouldn't allow it they should be friends they would all be friends yet that is to say if mrs ede would permit of it and why should she stand between people and make enemies of them she fell back into stupor and next day her ideas were still more confused in the belief that it was for the part of the bailey that dick and ralph were quarrelling she began to express her regret that there was nothing in the piece for her nor were memories of the baby girl who had died in manchester lacking she prayed ralph to believe that the child was not his but dick's child she prayed and supplicated in laura's arms till laura laid her back on the pillow exhausted oh, give me something to drink i'm dying of thirst the sick woman murmured faintly laura started from her reveries and going over to the fireplace where the beef tea was standing poured out half a cup but owing to great difficulty in breathing it was some time before the patient could drink it after a long silence kate said i've been very ill haven't i i think i must be dying death is not death laura answered when we die for pan the undying representative of the universe cognizable to the senses over kate's mind lay a vague dream through whose gloom two things were just perceptible an idea of death and a desire to see dick but she was almost too weak to seek for words and it was with great effort that she said i don't remember who you are i can think of nothing now but i should like to see my husband once more could you fetch him is he here you've not been happy with him i know my sister but i don't blame you your marriage was not a psychological union and when marriage isn't that woman cannot set her foot on the lowest temple of eros oh, i'm too ill to talk with you kate replied 
but I love my husband well, oh, too well. I keep all my little remembrances of him in that box. Oh, they aren't much, not much, but I should like him to have them when I'm gone so that he may know that I loved him to the last. Perhaps then he may forgive me. Will you let me see them? She looked at the packet of letters, kissed the crumpled calico rose, the button she had pulled off his coat in a drunken fit and preserved for love, and she even slipped on her wrist the last few pearls that remained of the chaplet she wore when they played at sweethearts in the lover's knot. But after the love tokens had been put back in the box, and Kate again asked Mrs. Forrest to bring Dick to her, she began to ramble in her speech and to fancy herself in Hanley. The most diverse scenes were heaped together in the complex confusion of Kate's nightmare. The most opposed ideas were intermingled. At one moment she told the little girls, Annie and Lizzie, of the immorality of the conversations in the dressing rooms of theatres. At another she stopped the rehearsal of an opera bouffe to preach to the mummers, in phrases that were remembrances of the extemporaneous prayers in the Wesleyan church, of the advantages of an earnest working religious life. It was like a costume ball, where chastity grinned from behind a mask that Vice was looking for, while Vice hid his nakedness in some of the robes that chastity had let fall. Thus, up and down, like dice thrown by demon players, were rattled the two lives, the double life that this weak woman had lived, and a point was reached where the two became one, when she began to sing her famous song, Look at me here, look at me there, alternately with the Wesleyan hymns. Sometimes in her delirium she even fitted the words of one on to the tune of the other. Still Laura took no notice, and her pen continued to scratch and scratch, till it occurred to her that although Dick's marriage had not been a psychological one, it might be as well that he should see his wife before she died, and having come to this conclusion suddenly, she put on her bonnet and left the house. The landlady brought in the lamp, placing it on the table, out of sight of the dying woman's eyes. A dreadful paleness had changed even the yellow of her face to an ashen tint. Her lips had disappeared, her eyes were dilated, and she tried to raise herself up in bed. Her withered arms were waved to and fro, and in the red gloom shed from the ill-smelling paraffin lamp, the large, dimly seen folds of the bedclothes were tossed to and fro by the convulsions that agitated the whole body. Another hour passed away, marked by the cavernous breathing of the woman as she crept to the edge of death. At last there came a sigh, deeper and more prolonged, and with it she died. Soon after, before the corpse had grown cold, heavy steps were heard on the staircase, and Dick and Laura entered, one with a quantity of cockatoo-like flutterings, the other steadily, like a big and ponderous animal. At a glance they saw that all was over, and in silence they sat down, their hands resting on the table. The man spoke hesitatingly in awkward phrases of a happy release. The woman listened with a calm serenity that caused Dick to wonder. She would have liked to have said something concerning psychological marriages, but the appearance of the huge body beneath the bedclothes restrained her. He wished to say something nice and kind, but Laura's presence put everything out of his head, and so his ideas became more than ever broken and disjointed, his thoughts wandered, until at last, lifting his eyes from the manuscript on the table, he said, Have you finished the second act, dear? End of chapter 1